Okay, I think we're up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to CVPR and the Embodied AI Workshop. Uh, we're glad to have you all here. And uh, I guess we are about to, we're getting started. Um, okay, one sec. According to Zoom. Your screen. screen. How do I full screen? Momentary technical difficulties. Yeah, what do you have here? Get a presenter for a second. The beauty of a virtual or hybrid conference. This. Oh, that'd be great, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we're stuck with that. Are we recording now? Uh, I think we should be recording, and I think it's <laughs> all right. Dry run. Welcome to CVPR and the Embodied AI Workshop. Uh, we're really all glad to have you here and to talk about something near and dear to our hearts, which is combining vision with action in the world. The deep learning has uh, been enabled us to create amazing systems that learn wonderful functional relationships where we can take this picture of a fuzzy blob and detect that it's a cat. Uh, when we start dealing with problems like robotics, it's a little bit more challenging because there's a dog in the picture, but we don't really want just to have a function that says this is a dog. For a robot to function in the world, we've got to extract a lot of more information about the physical shapes around the, the agent and their possible movements. <clears throat> Embodied artificial intelligence is what we call building agents that solve tax that require some form of interaction with the environment. Uh, and we, there's a variety of things which have been taken from uh, past challenges that we've had at this very workshop uh, and on uh, basically having to interact with the world to generate information or to make things happen. This can involve seeing where you have to move around and try to figure out what's in a space where you can't simply do it from a single viewpoint. Listening, I will be uh, hearing from the sound spaces challenge on uh, uh, trying to find a sound in a space, uh, talking uh, to other agents or having an interaction with them, doing long-term reasoning to figure out what we need to do and then robotics near and dear to my heart acting in the world. This is our third year of the Embodied AI workshop and we're very glad to have you here. This is our first physical one, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, our topics, we will have a set of invited speakers for you talking about motivation for embodied AI, embodied navigation, uh, a rich, challenging and rewarding area which is near and dear to my heart, embodied perception, robotics, and embodied AI for all, which is basically, we'll be talking a little bit about the challenges of deploying in the world and doing so in a way that makes it available to everyone. There's a speaker panel at the end of the workshop. We'll have workshop papers presented in a poster session. Hopefully we're still trying to get, get our room worked out for that. But one of the highlights of this workshop are the challenges, navigation, understanding and interaction challenges will be uh, presented and we'll have panels where the people who present these challenges uh, enable us to talk about it, uh, about what they found. There's an agenda which is on the website uh, and is on a, a, a card that's printed at the door. 
Uh, I'm not going to read through the entire thing, but our morning session will involve challenges followed by invited speakers and then the poster session. And then uh, in the afternoon, we're going to have invited talks followed by challenges and then a uh, speaker panel. The morning session of invited talks will be on robotics and embodied navigation. Carolina Parada, uh, who is actually until very recently was my manager, uh, is going to be speaking about robotics and lifelong learning. And Ruth Desmatagi and Dhruv Batra will be speaking about embodied navigation. The afternoon sessions will have Katarina Fragadaki, Fei Fei Li, and Jatender Malik. Jatender will be speaking about the motivation for embodied AI. Katarina will be speaking about embodied perception, and Fei Fei Li will be speaking about the challenges of bringing embodied navigation into the world. We will have a poster session at noon. Um, it will be going on for a while, so hope to, you know. Unfortunately, it's time to leave with lunch, but this is a, a long day. Uh, and I'm not going to even attempt to read all these to you. They're also on our website. So the challenges uh, will have both presentations followed by panels. The morning navigation challenges will include multi-object navigation with multi-on, vision and language navigation with uh, rearrangement, room by room habitat, uh, semantic slam with uh, more or less with the robotic vision scene understanding challenge, and audio visual navigation with sound spaces. The afternoon challenges will have uh, vision and language interaction with Alfred, uh, rearrangement with AI2 Thor, and vision and dialogue interaction with Teach. We'll have a speaker panel at uh, 4.30 today. And after that, the workshop will conclude. Uh, we'd also like to take a moment to, uh, to remember Juneteenth, uh, which is America's second Independence Day. Uh, I don't know about you, but many of us uh, at ICRA 2018, I think, were impressed with the work that the workshop organizers did to highlight elders uh, past, present, and developing. Um, and this was a, a, their way of nodding towards uh, the history where many of us are in situations that we did not create, but have either privileged us or disadvantaged us. And it's important to respect those traditions. One of those traditions in the United States is uh, to commemorate June 19th, 1965, which is the date uh, that in Texas, at least, the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation was implemented uh, with General Order th uh, 3, which freed all the slaves uh, in Texas. And this has grown into a uh, nationwide celebration, which last year became a national holiday. And uh, is, has been celebrated for, for decades um, as, as Freedom Day in the African American communities, and hopefully this will spread worldwide. Uh, we are aware that some people were somewhat uncomfortable that this workshop is held on this day, which is supposed to be a holiday, and at least one of our speakers declined. So this is the kind of thing that as we go forward uh, and are celebrating the research that we've done together, uh, and go into different spaces all over the world. It's important for us to be aware of the customs of each region that we're in and to, to try to create the appearance of sensitivity to those customs. Um, not that we do these things intentionally, but we didn't, this is an impression we were not intending to create. And we wanted to, to show our respect for this important holiday. Our acknowledgements. Um, we have an organizing committee with uh, 12 people on it, many of whom are here. Uh, and uh, Andrew Zak, Anthony Francis, Cheng Xu Li, Claudia Perez Dapino, Devendra Singh Chaplot, Armin Ross, Joan Chong, Luca Weiss, Matt Dick, uh, Mike Roberts, Alexander Mutt, Max Mayitz, and Zordon Perk. Um, and uh, they have been doing an enormous amount of work behind the scenes to make this happen, and we really appreciate it. I'm not going to attempt to read all of our scientific advisors, uh, nor the many, many challenge organizers that made this possible. There's so much work that goes into making these things happen. You can find all their names and pointers to their challenges at embodiedai.org. And uh, with that, uh, I believe uh, I have I am concluding my presentation and I will hand it over to our challenge speakers and let them get uh, their time.
point. So first up is uh, Multion. Let's say recorded shop at CVPR. In the multi on. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia. I'm a PhD student at SFU. I'm one of the challenge organizers for this year's multi object navigation or multi on challenge. This is the second year that multi on challenge is hosted as part of the embodied AI workshop at CVPR. In the multi-on task, the agent has to navigate to a series of target objects in a particular order. This is basically a generalization of the single object navigation task. And here M on means navigating to M objects. The agent can take one of four actions. It can move forward, turn left, turn right, or generate a found action to indicate that it has reached a goal. At each navigation step, the agent has access to RGB image, depth image, the GPS and compass, and a one hot vector of the goal category. This year, we have two different tracks, cylinders and real objects. The cylinders are identical in shapes with different colors, whereas the real objects are more realistic looking objects with varying shapes and colors. The objects are randomly sampled from a set of eight different objects and inserted into the photorealistic 3D environments. We use the Habitat Matterport 3D or HM3D scenes and the Habitat Simulator as our simulation platform. We have updated the dataset from last year to make the task even more challenging. We have episodes containing five target objects compared to three from last year. In addition to the target objects, we scatter some non-target objects to distract the agent. An episode is considered successful if the agent is able to reach within one meter of the target in contrast to 1.5 meter previously. Also, we have two tracks and we use the HM3D scenes. This is a plot showing the distribution of episodes over geodesic distance, and we can see that Multion 2.0 have longer trajectories than 1.0. This, along with the harder to detect realistic objects and the presence of distractors, make Multion 2.0 more challenging than last year. Overall, the dataset contains 8 million training episodes across 800 scenes, 1,050 validation episodes across 30 scenes and 1,050 episodes across 70 scenes for both test standard and test challenge splits. On top of the standard evaluation metrics used for visual navigation task, we use progress and PPL or progress weighted by path length as additional metrics. The challenge is hosted on Eval AI, which is an open source platform to evaluate and compare AI agents. The participants implement their methods in the form of a Docker image, which is then submitted to the Eval AI. The Docker images are evaluated on our evaluation servers and the results are reported back to the Eval AI. And now let's talk about the submissions that we received this year to the Multion Challenge. We received a valid submission from an external team, and also we developed a baseline model that served as a comparison for the participants. We found uh, some similarities between our baseline model and the one submitted from the other team. And in particular, we found that both the approaches exploited a detection algorithm to detect the object's goal from the RGB image. They both exploited a mapping technique to create an obstacle map of the environment. And they both exploited a planning algorithm to understand the next action to be performed, starting from the goals detected from the detection and the map created from the mapping. If there isn't uh, enough information in both the approaches about the goal object location, an exploration strategy is used to maximize the explored area. Here there is the overview of our method. Uh, as the detection component, we exploited a faster CNN algorithm, and in the case of the cylinder, we combined it with a KNN algorithm. As a mapping module, we exploited a, a simple 
mapping slum algorithm uh, on the DAFT image. And as an exploration policy, we trained our enforcement learning policy that takes in input the uh, obstacle map and as output, it gives an exploration goal that uh, was trained to maximize the environment exploration. And finally, as a, a planning algorithm, we exploited our platform search of planner. Now it's time to announce the winner team of this year that is composed by Fuyan Zan and Yasutaka Furukawa. And their method exploration and semantic mapping for multi object goal navigation obtained a 32% of, of PPL on the cylinder truck and a 24% uh, of PPL on the real object truck. Here there are the leaderboards on the test challenge set for both the cylinder truck and the real truck. The winning team obtained a 73% of progress and a 32% of PPL uh, for the cylinder truck and a 55% of progress and a 24% of PPL on the real of the truck. It's interesting to observe that our approach had a much lower progress uh, metric, but instead on the optimality of the path, so the PPL, the performances obtained by both the uh, approaches were closer. Here there is the method developed by the winning team. They used a semantic segmentation network as a, um, as a detection algorithm. And in particular, they used a deep lab V3 uh, plus a less than 50 uh, network. Then they exploited a projection algorithm to uh, convert the depth image to the obstacle map. And then as an exploration module, they simply pick a random position in the unknown area as a, a short-term exploration goal, and as a navigation module, they exploited a shortest path planner. Furthermore, they also developed a, a heuristic to detect some false positive detected by their uh, deep lab v3 algorithm, and in particular, this uh, false detection module helped a lot the model in uh, obtaining a greater performance compared to the baseline. Here instead, there is a qualitative comparison between our baseline model and the exploration and smoking mapping uh, approach we, on the cylinder truck. Our model only found three objects out of five, and then after the fourth, it had a failure directly linked to the uh, mapping module. Instead, the exploration and semantic mapping uh, approach obtained a progress of 100% with a PPL of 63. It's interesting to notice that uh, our approach also, if it failed two objects, had a PPL pretty close to the other one because our exploration strategy uh, performed better uh, compared to the random exploration strategy exploited in exploration and semantic mapping. Here, there is another qualitative comparison on the natural object track, where our uh, approach always obtained a 60% of progress and a 35% of PPL. And instead, the exploration and semantic mapping obtained a progress of 100% with a PPL of 26%. So our approach had a better PPL with less objects found, always uh, due to the exploration strategy that we exploited. Instead, our approach uh, failed this time in the detection of the real object while the uh, false uh, positive detection uh, system that they used in the exploration and semantic mapping avoided the, uh, uh, the approach in uh, missing some important objects. Here there are all the takeaways that we had from this challenge, and in particular, by looking at the overall agent performances, multi on 2.0 is a harder problem compared to the multi on 1.0. And it's because it's more challenging to identify the realistic looking object than the cylinder objects. And we also isolated some weaknesses of the two approaches. In particular, for our baseline, there was no false positive mitigation that was super helpful in the other uh, approach. And the downsizing of the map can make some areas of the environment inaccessible for the path planner. So uh, it can be a problem. Instead, the exploration of semantic mapping module and as a weakness that the use of random goal points slows the environment exploration and it results uh, in a lower PPL metric. We also would like to thank all the Embodied AI workshop organizers, the Evil AI guys and the Habitat developers for all the work that they did to make this challenge possible. And if you have any question or would you like to contact us or just you want to look at the starter code for this challenge, please visit the site reachable to the QR code. Thank you very much for the attention and bye.
Thank you, uh, Moldion. And uh, just a reminder, we will have a Q&A uh, panel at around 10 a.m. So if you have any questions, save them uh, till then. Next, we have sound spaces. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sagrik Majumdar. In this talk, I'll summarize the Sound Spaces Challenge that I co-organized this year with Changan Chen, Unnat Jain, and Christian Grauman. Moving around in the real world is naturally a multi-sensory experience and an intelligent agent should be able to see, hear, and move. And this motivated us to organize the second uh, challenge on audiovisual embodied AI. Uh, more specifically, this year we targeted audiovisual navigation in 3D simulated platforms. This challenge is based on the well-known sound spaces platform. Let's first get a taste of the simulation. Soundspaces is a habitat-based simulator, and it enables realistic audiovisual simulation for replica and Matterport 3D datasets. In this challenge, we only use the Matterport 3D dataset due to its larger scale. We discretize all environment into grids. In the audio goal navigation task, there is a sounding object randomly placed in an unmapped environment, and the agent receives a one second long audio clip emitted from the source at every step of the episode. The agent is tasked to navigate to the sounding object in the environment with one of the four actions, move forward, turn left, turn right, and stop. And uh, success is defined as when the agent issues a stop action at the source location. In this challenge, we considered the unheard sound setting where the model is trained on multiple sounds and tested on unheard sounds. There are 73, 11, and 18 disjoint sounds in the train validation and test sets respectively. Note that the environments are also split into disjoint sets so that it requires the model to generalize to both unseen environments and unheard sounds. Participating teams are judged on the basis of the test split performance. After calling the stop action, the agent is evaluated using the success weighted by path length metric. In this uh, year's challenge, we use the audio visual navigation model introduced in the sound spaces paper as the baseline. This is a state of the art model on the audio visual navigation task and the code was made public before the challenge. The key idea in this model is to directly predict low level actions given egocentric audiovisual inputs. It's trained in an end to end manner using PPO, a popular RL algorithm for training embodied navigation agents. This year, 12 teams from various universities showed interest in the challenge. Four teams were able to make successful submission on the test set. We speculate that the size of the data set, which is approximately one terabyte, might have made it unfeasible for a few teams to participate. Among all teams, Team Collab Boa Sound Space won the challenge and Freiburg Sound came second. Both teams have outperformed the baseline by a large margin. This is the second Sound Spaces challenge and we are glad to see an increase in interest and participation over last year. In the next challenge, we plan to add a track for the more challenging and realistic semantic audiovisual navigation task. In addition, we plan to make it easier for participants to participate in this by enabling the simulator to render on the fly. Also, we wish to test the top team's methods on a real robot in the future. One of the drawbacks of the current simulator is its discrete nature. To overcome this issue, SoundSpaces 2.0 was recently publicly released, which allows continuous rendering of sound. It is also fully configurable and generalizes to arbitrary scene datasets. 
For more details, please check out the paper on archive. Next, we'll present the methods for the top two teams. Hello, everyone. I'm Jin Yu Chen, a PhD student from Beihang University. I'm going to present our approach used in the Sun Spaces Challenge, which is named Multi Direction Ensemble and Stop Policy for Audio Visual Navigation. In the challenge of sound spaces, the agent needs to navigate to the sound source in an unseen environment. During our experience, we found there were two key points in this task. The first one is how to utilize more environmental information. Before making a decision, we propose the multi-direction ensemble to solve this. The second one is to terminate is when to terminate the navigation. We propose a new stop policy for the agent to make stop decisions. In the baseline AV1 model, only one direction information is used for planning for the next few steps. However, in our life experience, we prefer to turn our head around to collect more information of the environment and determine it, the location of the sound source. For this reason, we propose the multi-direction ensemble me mechanism. Here is how the multi-direction ensemble works. At each planning step of the AV1 agent, the agent turns left four times and uh, preserves those observations. The agent utilizes the, these observations and uh, generates four action maps in different directions. Then rotate and average the four action maps and choose the point with the highest action probability as the next waypoint. Besides, in the AV1 model, when the agent set next waypoint is in the center of the action map, means the agent decides to stop. During the training process, the agent goes through much fewer success points than the failure points. This leads to a sample imbalance problem and the agent is hard to determine when to stop. We use the auxiliary model for the stop policy. We train a simple CNN model to discriminate whether the agent arrives at the destination. The CNN input is a binaural spectrogram at the current position. We train the network with the spectrogram sampled from the training environment. As shown in the figure bottom left, we visualize the element-wise differences of the bi neural spectrogram. The audio character of the sound source is pretty obvious, and the stop policy model can achieve high discriminating precision. As shown in the table, the two proposed methods can boost the state-of-the-art method by a large margin. And thank you for your attention. Hey everyone. It's Hakan Khan Yunus and I'm going today to present our approach which won the second place in this year's Sound Space Challenge. We call our approach Learning Audio Visual Spatial Features for Audio Visual Navigation. This is a joint work with Daniel Hunakam, Tim Pilcherhold and Abina Balada. Our main contributions are integrating more complex audio scenarios to train the agent in more challenging environment and induce it to learn a better representation in order to avoid overfitting to the heard sounds. And our second main contribution is learning a combined representation of the spatial features from the audio and visual observations. We integrated more complex scenarios to the training process like uh, adding a second sound emitting source at the goal location and adding some destructive sounds at different locations as well as applying future-wise augmentation on the binaural spectrogram. Here is an example of what our agent hears in the training episodes. Reverberation is... As we can hear, the goal sound is bird and there is a sound of engine at the goal location. And there are other distractor sounds like a ringing phone and different talking persons, wave sound and a sound of air conditions in different locations.
Moving to our model that we use to train our agent, the agent receives the observations from the environment as depth image and binaural spectrogram. After passing by the randomization pipeline, which randomizes the complex scenarios that I mentioned before, we pass a binaural spectrogram to our novel spatial audio encoder, which aims to learn the spatial information embedded in the spectrogram. Then we concatenate the output of, the, of this encoder with the geometrical equivalency map and pass it to our novel audiovisual encoder, which learns the correlation between the spatial features from the information learned from the spectrogram and the spatial information from the occupancy map. Our reinforcement learning agent, which is PPO, relies on the output of this encoder as well as the depth encoder and the audio encoder to choose the next waypoint for the robot to navigate to. Combining the complex audio scenarios and our novel architecture, we strongly outperform the baselines and achieve the second place. You can also find more details of our approach and its results on static and dynamic audio navigation tasks on our project website. These are the references that I have used to prepare this presentation. Finally, I would like to thank the Sound Space team for organizing this challenge for the second year and I would like to congratulate the winning team. Great, thank you to Sound Spaces. Next we will we'll have uh, Room Across Room, uh, the Habitat, Okay, my screen should be seen there. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Krantz and I am pleased to present the second R cross R Habitat Challenge. Uh, my fellow organizers are Alex, Alexander, uh, Stefan, and Peter. Um, so suppose we have an agent placed in an environment it has never seen before. We give the agent a natural language instruction, like in this example, take a left and go down the hallway, turn into the bedroom on the left, and stop at the foot of the bed. This instruction corresponds to a path through the environment that we want the agent to take navigation actions to follow. We give the agent a discrete action space with actions move forward, turn left, turn right, or stop. And we also let the agent look up or look down. The agent's observation space includes egocentric RGB, a depth observation, and the natural language instruction. For our challenge, we use the Matterport 3D data set um, to establish our environments. This consists of 90 scenes. Uh, we use 3D reconstructions, which allows the agent to have unconstrained navigation in the 3D uh, space. Uh, challenges faced by the agent in these environments, it has to deal with collisions, visual occlusion, and a long time horizon. We implement our task on top of the habitat simulator and on top of the habitat lab. Um, for the instructions and the path definitions of our challenge, we adopt the room across room, our cross our data set. Um, this is the second year of our challenge and we are carrying over all of our definitions from last year. Um, since this challenge is significantly cha challenging and there is much progress still to be made. Some highlights of the R cross R data set are that it contains 16.5 thousand navigation paths, 126 thousand instructions across three languages, English, Hindi, and Telugu. And it also includes time aligned pose traces. So during training, the agent knows um, where the observer was looking when uttering a certain part of the instruction. 
And this compares to other VLN vision and language navigation data sets prior. Um, the R cross R data set is an order of magnitude uh, larger with more paths, and it's multilingual versus monolingual. And it removes the shortest path prior from previous data sets. Um, the shortest path prior is that the start and end points of any path in the data set, um, the path described by the instruction is the shortest path to get from start to end. And in R cross R, this is not the case. It was constructed in such a way that the agent might have to take a um, more unique path to get to the goal. And this requires a more um, fine-grained following of instructions. So the instruction more corresponds to a path rather than just describing a goal location. So in this challenge, the agent is performing continuous navigation. The R cross R data set was defined on a navigation graph. So over this topology of nodes. In this challenge, in R cross R habitat, we um, move the R cross R data set into continuous spaces and force this continuous navigation. For the agent embodiment, we take after um, a low cobot robot. So we model this robot's height, the camera height, um, its radius size, and its, um, its camera dimensions. So the horizontal field of view, uh, the camera, the depth range, and sliding and simulation. We don't allow the uh, agent to slide upon collision. For evaluation, we use the normalized dynamic time warping metric. This metric compares an agent's actual path with the reference path and computes a dynamic time warping cost uh, between them and normalizes that value between zero and one. We also present secondary metrics that are typical in uh, VLN areas, um, including navigation error, success rate, SPL, success weighted by NDTW, and the agent's path length. So it is now time to announce the winners of the 2022 R Cross R Habitat Challenge. In first place, we have the Joy Boy team. I would like to congratulate this team, um, including uh, Dong An, Zun Wang, Yang Wang Li, Yi Wang, Yi Kong Hong, Yan Wang, uh, Liang Wang, and Jing Xiao. Congratulations to the Joy Boy team. Uh, we will hear from them short, shortly on their methods, and I look forward to uh, learning more about their approaches. Um, here are the 2022 leaderboard results. Uh, we have highlighted here uh, the Joy Boy team's top submission. Um, the other submissions here are also from the Joy Boy team as they iterated on their approach. Um, we also had other teams participate in this challenge, and I would like to recognize their efforts. However, they did not end up in um, uh, official submissions to the leaderboard. If we look at the complete leaderboard for our cross our habitat, these are submissions accepted at any point in time. Um, we have this Joy Boy team um, in first place, and we have last year's submissions um, down here. And we can also compare the Joy Boy teams to the previous best prior to starting this challenge. Uh, they increased the overall NDTW by 48% and success rate by 90%. And if we look at progress on our cross our habitat in the challenge over the years, um, this year's submission had a significant increase over last year's and the baseline, 25 points in NDTW and 32 in success rate. So this is really exciting. We can also compare the discrete to continuous gap. So in discrete, the standard VLN with the graph, um, the best submission on the leaderboard right now is environment edit PT. And the best in the continuous environment is our this year's champion. Uh, we have a gap of 9.2 in NDTW and 14.5 in success rate. So there is still room to improve in continuous performance and there is room to approach human performance. So I would like to thank everybody that participated in the challenge, my fellow organizers and the embodied AI um, organizers. And at this point, I would like to hand it over to our challenge winners.
Zoom and Dong when you're ready. One moment while I make them co hosts. Hi, Zero. Can you see the screen? Hey, we can hear you. Hi, thanks, Jacob. Um, let us to do the presentation. Hello, everyone. This is Joy Bonchin and Dong An. We are glad to share our lesson for the RxR Habitat competition. This is a drone work by Institute of Automatic Automation, Shanghai Air Laboratory, since time and the Australian National University. We would like to skip the introduction of the task. Let me highlight some key embodiments. First, the agent cannot slide along the obstacles once the collision happened. Then the action space is discretized to low-level actions, such as turn 30 degrees. Finally, the max steps is restricted to 500. There are three primary challenges in this competition. First, directly grounding the language to low-level actions is inefficient and may need to improve performance. Second, Trajectories and the instructions in RxR is longer. Thus, the agent is required to have accurate perception and monitoring of the navigation process. Thirdly, sliding is not allowed. Thus, the agent can easily get stuck. No level controller needs to be well designed. Our method has three modules. At the beginning of each decision loop, the candidate waypoint predictor first predicts a set of candidate uh, locations. Then a history enhanced planner determines one of the candidates as a sub -goal. Finally, we designed a tryout controller to execute low level actions. It can help the agent escape from deadlocks. The details will be shown below. Our current candidate weapons predictor is based on the CWP in Hong and Wang's recent work. We rotate the agent for 12 times to obtain multiple views. Please note that we only use the depth images to achieve better generalizability. Then the depth images are input into a transformer to predict a set of candidate waypoints. It can result in a local agent set, agent set graph similar to discrete VLN. Our planner is based on HAMP. A history encoder is used to capture history, which can help the agent to perceive the navigation process. Additional depth information is added into the observation encoder for better representation. The planner will output a selected waypoint as a sub -goal. The left part of the talk will be presented by Zhong Wang. Hello, everyone. This is Zhen. Our trial controller is a heuristic controller that could detect Dialogs by comparing the difference between the previous and current frames. And once it dialogs, it will try some predefined directions with a single forward action, as shown in this example. For training our agents, we have two stages. The first stage is the fun training in a map course video simulator. Our training data is room classroom and mark MT5's instruction tracker pairs. And we have five proxy tasks as previous work in HMT. And our observations is RGB images. The feature is tracked from CLIP and the multilingual texture feature is from Alberta. And for the second stage is online fine tuning in a habitat simulator. The training data is from classroom habitat data and the training objective is scattered sampling moving from teacher forcing to student forcing. The observations is RGBD images and we initialize the depth embedding from scratch while others from the pre trained model. And depth features from DTPVO and the mountain level augmentation is to perform stale transfer and inspired by EMV edit online during training. And we also turn on sliding during training and we empirically found that this could help the agent to gain more experiences and generalize better. For experiments, uh, we found that per training with MT5's instruction tracked power and doing stale transfer during training and also different snapshot ensemble helps the agents respectively. 
And um, in table two, we studied the influence of sliding and our chart controller, and we found that our chart controller could help the agent to navigate uh, when sliding is off. And this is the total steps made by our agents in the validation unseen splits. And the mean steps is 271. And this is the leaderboard results. And due to time submission, uh, due to submission time restriction, we only submit model two in table one successfully, and it has already achieved significant improvements. This is a demo of our agent's navigation process. We will meet turning it like, turn in 12 times to collect the panoramic images for better visualization. In conclusion, we propose a modular plan control model for this computation. And by taking recent advances of discrete VLN, our region significantly improves over existing baselines. And we hope our region could be a strong baseline for this benchmark. Our technical report will be released soon. That's all, thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, uh, RxR Habitat. Um, so just as a reminder for anybody who's come in uh, since I last made the announcement, but we will have a Q&A uh, at around 10 a.m., which includes all of the uh, challenge organizers. So stick around if you have any questions. Um, next, we have the robotic uh, vision scene understanding challenge. All right, can everyone hear me? Looks great. Cool, can you hear me? Yes. Cool, awesome. Uh, excellent. All right, um, thank you everyone for um, having me um, here today. Greetings from down under. Uh, I am Dr. David Hall. I'll be talking about the Robotic Vision Scene Understanding Challenge, uh, the second iteration thereof held at CVPR uh, embodied AI workshops. Yeah. Uh, challenge organizers this year are myself, uh, Ben Talbot, and Nico Sunderhoff, all part of uh, Queensland University of Technology and the QUT Center for Robotics. And I would like to thank the QUT Center for Robotics and NVIDIA for sponsoring the prizes of this year's challenge. All right, I'll give you a quick overview of the Robotic Vision Scene and Selling Challenge um, itself and then I will go into the um, results of this year's challenge. So the challenge itself can uh, be comprised of um, two different sorts of tasks. We have a semantic slam task and a scene change detection task. Uh, for semantic slam, the goal is for a um, autonomous agent to explore an environment and do a 3D mapping of various objects of interest within that environment. So tables, chairs, bottles, uh, cups, etc. Uh, the goal is to create a 3D cuboid map, such as the one you can see below. You're then evaluated based on how good your 3D um, object cuboid map is compared to the ground truth cuboid map for the environment. Uh, scene change detection works in a very similar way, but now you have to traverse an environment twice. Um, and between the two traversals, there will be some changes in the environment. There can be lighting variations like you see here, um, but more importantly, in the actual goal of the challenge, you have to identify which objects may have been um, removed from the environment, as well as which objects might have been added to an environment. Um, you are then evaluated on a 3D cuboid map that you create that shows just the added and removed objects between traversals. Now, all of this is done within simulated, in, uh, sorry, I skipped ahead of myself. <laughs> Uh, this um, also provides, this challenge also provides three different um, control methods. Uh, each corresponding with an increasing level of autonomous realism and difficulty, where participants can participate at any level. So um, at the simplest level, there is the passive mode with ground truth localization. So this is much more like a passive perception problem, where instead of autonomously navigating the environment, the agent simply goes to a set of predefined nodes, um, avoiding all of the issues of trying to navigate um, and explore the environment. So this is the simplest level. The next level up is to provide active control of the robot. 
Um, this now opens up options for being able to move the distance um, and move it um, specified angles. And the task is more challenging as the autonomous agent now needs to navigate and explore, avoid obstacles, not crash, all that sort of stuff. But we still provide um, ground truth pose information for localization purposes. Um, and at the most difficult level, which is active dead reckoning, this is a slightly old video, um, at active dead reckoning, you now have to estimate your pose based upon noisy odometry information. Uh, all of these different control mechanisms are available to us thanks to our benchmark framework, which is how um, autonomous agents are controlled within the simulated environments that we have. Now, talking about simulated environments, the challenge itself is done within our benchmark environments for active robotics, uh, otherwise known as BEAR. BEAR comprises of um, five different types of scene, house, mini room, apartment, company, and office, uh, two of which are given to the um, challenge participants as development environments, and three of them are withheld as challenge environments. Uh, for each of the environment types, we also have five variations of um, each environment. This is where the objects are added or removed between scenes. Um, and as an extra bonus, the variations three and five for each um, environment type are nighttime versions of these environments. Uh, this also brings us to the main difference between uh, CVPR 2021 and CVPR 2022 challenge. Uh, while both of them are hosted within Isaac Sim and controlled via the benchmark framework, last year's challenge was in Unreal, and this year's challenge is in Isaac Sim Omniverse. This has updated our environments to provide more realistic um, lighting, reflections, and generally just the environments are a bit less flat and simplistic than they were the previous um, year. Uh, this has also added extra challenge, particularly for nighttime environments with more realistic lighting. Okay, so that is the um, basics of what the challenge setup is. I'll go quickly into the challenge results this year. Um, we had 23 registered participants this year um, and participants across uh, four of the different uh, possible challenge modes, ranked in difficulty on the right there. Um, based upon their overall performance and which challenges they participated in, we get a final ranking of uh, five teams that actually submitted results to the leaderboard which are Team SP, MSC Lab, Bosch, ITL, and WIN. Uh, so very much thank you to all the teams that participated and all of those that uh, had results on the leaderboard. I'll do a quick summary um, of the top three teams um, and who were awarded with uh, prizes this year. Um, but for more information, there will be <coughs> further data on our website in the coming days. All right, so first off, third place. Um, big congratulations to Bosch Research um, for their submission. Now this team only participated in the uh, Semantic Slam passive control um, challenge, but this is also the one that had the most interest and the most um, fierce competition. <coughs> and this team did come uh, second overall in that challenge. Um, the um, nice visualization of their results you can see here. And essentially their approach worked by fusing um, panoptic segmentation and instant segmentation methods together to create um, a, a nicely fused panoptic segmentation uh, image, then expanding that out to a panoptic point cloud for various keyframes, which then got voxelized and combined into a global panoptic uh, voxelized point cloud, which could then be have the uh, object instances extracted from in order to create their final submissions. So very well done to the team, very great accomplishment. All right, second place is Team MSC Lab from the Career Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, this team uh, participated in all of the um, uh, challenge levels that anyone participated within and did quite well in all of them. Um, and so they're gonna be right, awarded with a NVIDIA A6000 GPU, some Jets Nanos and 500 US dollars. Uh, so <clears throat> the basic building block for both their uh, scene change detection, uh, passive and active control mechanisms, as well as the semantic slam, was a good object mapping, mapping mechanism, which fused the uh, uh, 3D object detectors and 2D instant segmentation, and gradually merged um, object boxes that they had created based upon IOU thresholds. Scene change detection was then done by a similar method of seeing IOU boxes between traversal one and traversal two maps, and their active navigation was done utilizing um, 
uh, Frontier Exploration with an A-star algorithm. So very impressive results. Thank you very much, Team NSC Lab. And finally, we get to first place, <coughs> Team SP from Cyan Paul at Tata Consultancy Services Research. Uh, big congratulations to this team. They participated in all of the difficulty levels that um, were listed before and came first in all but one of them. So a big congratulations to them. Thus, they get our biggest prize. Um, their technique was founded on a very strong uh, semantic mapping pipeline, which I would say the most significant part of it was their final database refining process, which was able to infuse a lot of common sense um, uh, techniques to be able to improve their mapping. So things like large objects, such as tables and chairs, were going to be placed on the floor, making sure that objects that had been accidentally uh, segmented into multiple parts were fused together as one object, being able to disambiguate um, objects of different uh, objects that have been given multiple uh, class labels. <coughs> um, and overall being able to achieve the best results across all of the pipelines. Uh, like the previous team, they also use the same sort of approach for um, active navigation, that being the uh, the ex, uh, frontier-based exploration policy with uh, ASTA algorithm, um, and also using scene, uh, IOU thresholds for scene change detection. So very big congratulations and very big thank you to Team SP. All right, uh, that was a very quick fire look at the approaches. I very much uh, encourage anyone to, who's interested to look at the final results from uh, those teams that will be on our website. Um, in conclusion, it was very exciting to see the level of participation in this year of the challenge. Um, much higher uh, participation in the 2021 version of the challenge. The environments are uh, continuing to look better. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who worked behind the scenes on making the environments uh, improved and the Benchbot system work within those environments. Uh, there's still lots of room for improvement in our scene understanding challenge uh, with uh, participants highlighting the need for more optimal active exploration. Um, and challenges with mapping the smaller objects within our scenes. Uh, on our end, Benchbot is, going, is an ongoing project and is available for this and other robotics challenges. So if you're interested, go to benchbot.org. Um, and our evaluation server for the scene understanding challenge <coughs> will be reopened in the future to enable future research uh, in between the challenges um, themselves, the official challenges. Uh, thank you everyone for your time, various contact information, links, etc. Uh, on this page here. Uh, big thank you to uh, Ben Talbot in particular, who did most of the uh, hard work and experience most of the heartache in getting this version of the challenge up and running. Uh, and big thanks again to the QT Center for Robotics and NVIDIA for sponsoring the challenge and a huge thank you to the workshop organizers for giving us the opportunity to yet again have, host our um, our robotic vision scene understanding challenge as part of such a prestigious workshop. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, okay, so we'll take a round five minute break just to get everything set up for the Q&A panel. So if you need to use the restroom or anything, uh, just come back then. Um, otherwise, thank you for, uh, for coming to the, the challenge portion or the challenge talk portion. Um, great, yes, thanks. Sorry, and also if you have a poster that you are presenting, we've finally been told by, from CVPR uh, that it's been the poster presentation or poster boards have been moved to halls D and E and setup starts at 1030. We'll give more information as, as we hear from CVPR. Thanks. And so in particular, if you're in sound spaces or the uh, multi-on projects, please come up. Uh, we'll have the panel up here. Cool. So.
Can you guys hear me? Yep. You're muted, so I can't hear you responding. Was that a thumbs up, Anthony? Okay, so you can see me and hear me. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna try to do a quick uh, presentation here to test, test it out. My question. My question. My question. My question. So we'll do that. Again.
Okay, we will now be starting our Q&A panel for the navigation challenges. Um, um, this will be led by uh, Mike, one of our uh, organizers here. Um, so yeah, please take it away. Oh, and if anybody has any questions, please just line up at this uh, center microphone. Um, it would be great to hear from you. Okay. Um, can anyone hear me? Okay. Is this a good level and everything? Okay, great. Uh, so, first things first, congratulations on all these exciting challenges uh, and all the fantastic work that went into it, and for everyone that uh, um, submitted um, uh, efforts to succeed in the challenges. Um, Okay, there. The first question, and this is a good sort of general purpose one um, for the panel, uh, comes from anonymous bot, in, and uh, is somewhat provocative. Okay, here's the question: Requiring explicit mapping and object detection models is a bit unsatisfying if we are hoping to get highly generic learning strategies. Are explicit maps really necessary? What, what, what do we think of explicit maps? What's the right representation for the maps? What's the right level of that abstraction? Uh, and and how, how should our how should our models deal with um, mapping and kind of spatial methods in general? So actually, our challenge. Our baseline and the other solution that both for the And currently, we are trying to measure uh, our statistics on a man to man basis to try to learn some kind of model representation type of security using the representation. So, hopefully, in the future, we have some model that would be. We know we have in my opinion for the moment, at least for the initial challenge, we have a long term planning environment. We found that we did not even need to apply it with a last runner and it gave better performance compared to end to end approaches. So, what is your challenge? And but hopefully in the future we will be able to go to our land to end approach to our not and to learn by data to the So in our sense we have a four page light right. In our sense we have a four page. In our sense we have a four page of approach so we have a language approach to the general general approach. So yeah, like as you said, I think it's more about the long term planning too. So, with long term planning, we could probably have access to the general statistics in the kind of data that we can get in the general statistics and so on. So, yeah, like uh, there's a first, there's a top two phase which the waypoint planning uh, mechanism and uh, the background everything that you have to actually put in the map because there's no other solution. So, yeah, but uh, for the other side of things, there would be like the general environment.
Um, okay, and then uh, I think so. There, there were so many of these um, challenges that were built on top of uh, habitat and the, the uh, data sets that are compatible with habitat. It's very exciting. Um, what what do we think are the what do we think are kind of the bottlenecks with with habitat? What, what were what were like what was a big kind of like missing piece that you would love to um, like bolt on to habitat or you know like habitat like 5.0 in five years? What, what do you really hope is in, in habitat 5.0? Make sure you speak into the mic because not everyone can. Okay, I'm on. Uh, I'm going to put the speaker. Okay, okay. I think we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> a little, a little closer to the mic. Oh, now it's better? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, for sure, one thing that I found during the procedure using Amazon is that when you train to perform great voice models, at least from a simple stimulus to a normal setup without a huge amount of computer activity. It requires a lot of time, a lot of days. And so, to a single experiment in an end-to-end approach, you have to wait a lot of time for the kind of model compatible with this. Thank you. Sorry. And also, at least for the more young challenge, I would expect, for example, to extend the challenge without the limit of, I don't know, 30 topics, because 30 topics are very close to make about possible possibilities for the topics. So we want to try to use, I don't know, real objects inside environments and also to tell the activities for this, for example, going to find the chair inside the village of home or so we also some semantic annotations for the single data that's lying on the project of the use of the bigger model plan for the for the last I don't know what to say about it. Please speak in the mic. Yeah, in our case the main bottleneck was that the fact that we had to show the audio like a small SD data on the program that was picking up. So yeah, like it would be good to I think okay, the concept two point of paper is already out and the yeah the objective there is to do like uh, simulation on it in the form of it. So having that integrated in the habitat would be really good for the um, I I Super spreader event already. Let's get really up close to these mics. Just kidding. Um, okay. Uh, and do we think, okay, so one one sort of recent development in the, the vision graphics community that I'm sure we're all excited about all the fantastic nerve methods for, for just doing wonderful high quality reconstruction. Do we think that it's worth it to sort of revisit the data collection aspects of? Um, uh, that, that are sort of the feed into habitat in kind of the you know post nerf era and and uh, try to um, you know recollect data or, or re reconstruct the, the the 
seen data sets um, with higher quality, more photorealistic reconstruction methods, or are we happy with the kind of uh, you know uh, quick, uh, easy to render um, triangle edges that we have? Um, and uh, do we think yeah, it, it, it is the photorealism that we see in in these sort of uh, common data sets? Is that a limitation? Are we happy with that as a, as a sort of like the test then environment, or do we, do we think it's worth it to sort of go for greater photorealism in the scene itself? So, um, how uh, for the uh, 
through the cross route that one. Um, the, uh, the, the, our, we're given these natural language instructions uh, to, you know, go somewhere within the house. It's, it's sort of, it's like um, a relatively confined to scale. How, how far away are we from um, being able to sort of like, uh, Give, give instructions to an agent to get, you know, like across the country. <laughs> like, you know, from from, uh, from our house, you know, to the airport to catch a flight and then end up in the new city and then go to the hotel. It, it, like, uh, is, do we, is, is that like a high train? Will that happen in our lifetimes? Or do we just need to sort of like scale every, like our sort of existing solutions on the fire, like in order of magnitude to make that work. That's a fun question. Yeah, that's considering at what scale are the instructions given and what exactly are they applying to? Um, so in the case of R cross R, um, we are considering the in-home personal robotics application of following natural language instructions. Um, and in that case, we do have a more confined space and a more um, consistent evaluation paradigm of that agent. Um, if we wanted to try to get an agent to follow instructions on how to get across the country, we would need different levels of abstraction and potentially hierarchy so that we could have um, different stages involved in planning for an agent to execute that. Um, and so that would be an interesting direction to pursue. And I think that would be somewhat orthogonal to the um, in-home robotics application that we're studying here. Um, okay, uh, so this um, next question is for um, the RSVB John. Um, the semantic slam, the active semantic slam uh, Benchmark challenge is exciting uh, because I, I, or it's exciting for me because um, I like the goal of sort of like just having an agent sort of build the match and have, having that be sort of like the end goal. Um, in, in the current formulation, the math is very sort of logical, um, but is it worthwhile to sort of think about the agent building the very high quality, the high quality, uh, you know, photorealistic and like acoustically realistic map uh, itself. So, so the, the, like reconstructing our, our data sets of the future sort of becomes the task for the agent. Is that, is that worth it uh, as a task for the community to consider? Or do we, do we have our hands full with the sort of uh, logical, more logical task and we should really like get that right before moving on? So if I'm understanding, Standing correctly, your question is, uh, is essentially our cube world representation of things enough or do we need to move more into a photorealistic reconstruction of environments such? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Is it, is it, is it worth it to, to be thinking about building even fancier maps? Like, it, it's, it's, it always comes back to what are you using the map for? If you're using the map for um, being able to interact with the objects in your environment, of course, you're going to want a more photorealistic, sorry, a more um, geometrically realistic um, version of um, your environment. So you know exactly where, where are the fine corners that I can you know, slightly scoot my robot around? Where, where are the objects, you know, dimensions that I need to be able to pick up? In terms of photorealism, do they need to be reconstructing a photorealistic version of their environment? Again, that depends on whether or not they're needing to, are they trying to portray this information to a human in some way? And is there some benefit from that? Or um, is it going to help um, tell, help them to say whether or not they've um, seen this specific object instance before? And yeah, so it all comes down to like, what, what is the problem that they're trying to solve with the map? Having, having the map as the uh, end goal is good for a, a fair few things, but for, for me, I'm always thinking about what's that, what is the action the robot is going to be taking <clears throat> with this um, with this um, uh, with this map as its as its guidance point? So, 
so yeah, so um, unfortunately, it's the very unsatisfying answer of it depends. And at the moment, I would say that um, from from the from current results thus far, we are not necessarily good enough at doing just cube world to be going uh, too in depth is into a a highly highly semantically rich um, uh, uh, photorealistic representation of the environment. Not to say that it's not useful or not um, possible now, but it's just one of those things of you know, what what is it for essentially? And trying to be specific to that. Okay, great. Um, I uh, okay. This, this next question is from an anonymous boss. Um, an anonymous bot says, "I'm convinced that Sim to Real can solve real-world navigation more or less, but accurately modeling real-world interactions is, of course, incredibly difficult." Do you think meaningful generalization in the same real interactions is possible in the near term? If so, is it just a big engineering problem to make the simulator match reality as closely as possible, or are there shortcuts? Ooh, um, actually, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we can we can take that last one offline. Um, and thanks so much for the panelists for participating in this thought provoking discussion. Um, and uh, we, can, we can all follow up on these uh, questions that we can get to on Slack. Um, okay. This one is, I, I should have given you like the, the two minute warning on this today. Oh, no worries. It's, uh, it's important to stay on time. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right, everyone. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, uh, our first invited speaker, uh, Carolina Carrara, uh, who will be presenting about robotics for Google, on behalf of Google AI. Uh, okay, let's see if we can uh, get the presentation going. What? Uh, it's going to be 25 minutes for the talk and five minutes for questions. So, uh, Caroline, are you presenting? I think you're muted. Yes. Are you, are you guys able to hear me okay? I am not muted now. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I might have to turn off the camera just because I see some delay. Um, so, that might make it better for you to hear me. Where's the and then. Did your presentation um, disappear? Yes. So oh, there. Okay, we've got it now. All right, take it away, Carolina. Did you mute yourself, Beth? We can see your presentation, but can't hear you. Okay. Um, so you're can you guys, can you guys hear me now? It seems like when I share screen, you stop hearing me. Let's try one more time. And, okay. Uh, Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll try this way. I just share the entire screen. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Please tell me if there's issues with the with the audio, and we'll figure out in a different way. Uh, I'm Carolina. I'm one of the leads at Google Robotics, and uh, today I just want to share with you some of the challenges that we've been encountering uh, for lifelong robot learning in social environments. 
Um, and I want to start by giving you some context. This is us in the background. We're a group of research scientists, software engineers, lab technicians, designers, uh, mostly based in Mountain View. Um, and what brings us together is our mission, which is to make robots useful in the real world through machine learning. And one of our key focus areas is to build a robot generalist that can help humans in social environments, uh, which is a long-term goal and, of course, very challenging, hence the topic of, uh, of this talk. Now, the way we uh, make sure we're making progress is that we ground our research through these robotic benchmark challenges. And they're essentially, a better challenge is essentially a problem that we decide we ought to be able to solve towards this goal with a very clear success definition. And there's usually a sim environment and a real world environment where we can iterate until we successfully complete the task. And some researchers in the team are very um, focused on one challenge. Others are more interested in applying a particular approach across multiple challenges. So here's some of the challenges We have some fixed arms. Some challenges are more focused on navigation, like inspection. Your audience. Force with their quadrupeds. One thing I wanted to mention briefly is you'll see this robot a lot. It's a mobile manipulator from Everyday Robots. And um, they are a company within Google X, which is part of Alphabet. And they make these robots, so we have lots of them. And we also have a lot of research collaborations with them. And their mission is to bring the extraordinary capabilities of robotics to everyday life. Uh, and, and so they'll show up a lot in our benchmarks. So back to the topic that uh, uh, for this talk, which is challenges for lifelong robot learning in social environments, what I'll do is that I'll go over two types of challenges. The, the first ones are the most common ones for any kind of safe and efficient robot learning, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, like sim to real sample efficiency, safe learning. Instead of going on them by, by one by one, I'm actually going to share some of the some of the tasks that we're tackling, how these challenges um, come up often in this in this context, and then some of the approaches that we're using to address them um, or to to make them to reduce them. And then later in the talk, I'll talk more about learning in social environments and give you some, some insights we have there. All right, so let me start with the top. Uh, so let me start with manipulation. This shows up, of course, in many of our challenges. We have trash sorting, t-shirt folding, instruction following, very manipulation focused. Um, this is actually one of our earliest tasks that we started in the team, we started back in 2016. Our goal here was to essentially be able to pick up any object from that bin. And when I mean any object, I mean any object that, um, that can can fit in that bin, it's physically possible to pick it up, especially those we've never seen before. And so our approach from the start was uh, to use machine learning. And we know that machine learning scales really well with data and compute. So from the very beginning, we decided to build a framework that would allow us to collect large amounts of data from many robots in the real world and then leverage all that data by a single model that could be potentially distributed, compute, distributed in terms of compute, but that would leverage all that data to learn how to interact with the real world. And from that work came our QT up work, which is scalable deep reinforcement learning for vision based robotic manipulation. You can see it here on the right uh, in action. It's essentially a reinforcement learn model that takes us input an RGB image that is captured by a camera that is on the shoulder of the arm. And then the output is directly the actions of the arm, which would be in this case, the position of the arm, as well as the actions of the gripper. Um, and then, um, and the, this is reinforcement learn, so it needs a reward function. And in this case, the reward was really sparse. It was just one if he successfully picked up the object in the real world or zero if he did not. And we trained this uh, with, it required large amounts of data to train this uh, effectively. It required actually about uh, a million different episodes collected in real with an arm farm of about 14 robots and it took about three months. So it was very expensive. It also required large diversity in the training set. Of course, you can see it on the top left is over a thousand objects that were <clears throat> that were sort of um, shuffled during training. And then at test time, we of course evaluated with a completely different set of objects to test generalization. And doing this, we get about 96% graph success in unseen objects. Um, this was compared to state of the art at the time, which was supervised, which was about 78%. Uh, so this was really cool. But it also took a lot of time and a lot of data 
And so if we want to be able to build a robot generalist, we need to be more efficient. So how can we do this better? Uh, so one of the obvious ways to improve efficiency is to do some learning and simulation. Um, and um, I'm sure like maybe everyone in this workshop has done that. If you train a model in simulation and then deploy it, see your shot in the real world, most likely it's not going to work out of the box at uh, the same performance. And this is because of the same to real gap. And this is just because as you all know, simulation doesn't re reproduce the real environment uh, very accurately in terms of dynamics and also visual realism. What we found is that for this particular problem, vis uh, the symmetry gap was more on the vision space. So this approach for RL CycleGAN is one of our approaches to tackle this. And it's essentially a generative model, which is task aware, and it learns a mapping between simulated images and real images. So you just need a little bit of data of the same task in simulation and in real, and then it learns this mapping. Uh, in fact, uh, the image that is on the right is actually an image that was learned through the RL cycle again. And you can notice that it's not perfect because at the very top, for example, you see some blurring with the arm. That's the image on the right. And so what we do is that at training time, while we're training the RL algorithm in SIM, we just pass all the images through the RL cycle again to get more realistic looking ones. And then doing that, we can uh, deploy zero shot with about 70% success rate. And then if we do some adaptation in the real world with about a day of data, we can get up to 91% success rate. And this was compared to three months of data uh, or a million episodes. And that was 97% success rate. So this is definitely uh, more efficient in the way that we train today. Uh, I also mentioned that we do adaptation in the real world. We do that with this approach called never stop learning that shows at the bottom. And the idea here is that if you have a model that is already trained and you deploy it on a system and the system has any differences compared to your training setup, it's not going to perform very well. So to do that, we tested it on all of these different scenarios here. Um, if you look at, for example, the rightmost image, what we did there is that we took the physical setup that was trained on and we offset the gripper by 10 centimeters, um, which is significant, a significant change. And you can see the performance reduces to 43% if you just deploy your model. But what we found is that you continue learning, uh, tra training the model uh, while doing data collection, you can learn from your mistakes. So we essentially redeploy the model every 10 minutes and use the data that we're collecting to update the model. And with this, we can recover with 800 episodes, around 98% success. Uh, so back to the original performance, pretty much. Another issue that we found is that obviously you have to, we definitely have to do some adaptation in real, and we definitely have to evaluate in real. All of our benchmarks are evaluated in the real world. So we, it's important to make the data collection and evaluation in the real world very efficient. And we found that our robots were very slow when doing manipulation because we were using blocking control. That is shown in the left here. And the idea here is that you are making a decision, executing that decision, waiting until the robot stops moving, making the next decision, moving, et cetera. So it looks very blocky, like you see there. And in this work called thinking while moving, the idea is that you want to be able to know what your what's the next step before you're finished completing the current step. And if you just do this without making any changes, uh, to the to the algorithm or the state representation, it won't work because it breaks the Markovian assumption, which says that the next action depends only on the current state. So if the current state is changing, you're breaking that assumption. And in this work, what we show is that if you make a very simple change, which is add, add, add the current action to the next state, you can actually keep that Markovian assumption and things work again. And with this, we can get about 49% success uh, improvement, sorry, 49% faster trajectories, which means two times uh, the speed up for data collection. So we do that as well as the, by default. So that was all for a single task, which was pick an object from a bin. Um, so again, if we want to build a generalist model, we want to have hundreds of tasks that we can do, or maybe thousands of tasks. So we need to be more efficient. So this work called uh, MTOpt is all about how can we amortize learning over multiple skills and tasks. And in this work, what we do is that we essentially show that we can amortize learning by having a single model to do all of the tasks. And they, they do some uh, data sharing, parameter sharing, and also we leverage simpler tasks to learn more difficult tasks. And so the, the way it works here is that we have, say, a couple dozen tasks. The task can be things like pick up a specific object, put in a specific part of the, of the plate there, realign or rearrange the objects, and then um, the, the algorithm is essentially shown on the left, and the idea is that each one of the arms is going to pick up the current policy queue, 
and it's going to also select a one hot vector representing the current task that you're performing. And the input is an RGB image in your one hot vector. The output is, again, the actions of the arm. And then um, it's essentially going to run that episode. And as soon as the episode completes, we have automatic success detectors, which are shown at the top left. And those detectors are going to determine whether the task was completed or not. And based on that, we send the reward to the algorithm, and it keeps going. So with this, we show that we can actually uh, basically get about 10x improvement in data efficiency for this for these tasks. One thing I want to mention is that not all we do is reinforcement learn. We do a lot of work with imitation learning using data uh, teleoperated by humans. So we actually have a whole team that focuses on teleoperation tools. Here you can see one of our team members that is using that VR set to use that handheld controller to send remotes in this sim environment, and the robot is actually moving in the real world. So we use this setup all the time to get lots of uh, trajectories by, from humans that we can learn from. So this is one example where we're using uh, behavioral cloning for multitask learning. In this case, uh, we're trying to generalize to unseen language commands. So instead of representing many tasks by one hot vectors, we represent it by natural language strings. So the task might be things like place a banana in purple bowl or place bottle of right. And in this particular approach called BCZ, we use about 100 different uh, tasks during training. And then we try to generalize to a couple dozen tasks during evaluation. And the way that we do that here is that we actually have a two-stage approach. We have a first set part of the model, which is represented by that sphere there, which essentially maps the natural language string into an embedding space. And then this embedding space uses some auxiliary supervision because we use pre-trained language embeddings. And that ensures that that uh, embedding space is essentially structured such that things, tasks that are semantically similar are going to be close to each other, and that helps with generalization. And then you have a second module that takes the, the embedding vector and the, and the RGB input and then outputs the actions of the robot, which are, again, the positions of the arm and the, and the gripper actions. And with this, we show that we can generalize to a, a, a couple dozen tasks that we're not seeing during training. Cool. I haven't talked about safety yet, but that's mainly because I think that's better that's better um, discussed in the context of locomotion. So I want to discuss safe learning in locomotion. Of course, one way to do safe learning is to do it in simulation. This is fast, safe, scalable. But as I talked about earlier, you have the sim to real gap. And in the case of locomotion, it's exacerbated by the sim to real gap in terms of dynamics. Um, so one thing that we've been exploring in the team is how to learn in the real world directly or how to better adapt in the real world. Of course, if you're learning in the real world, there's no sim to real gap. There's also no extra modeling effort, especially important when you have really complex environments like these ones. And also, you can learn in these very diverse environments, which are also the kind that are interesting for locomotion. They're possible to represent in simulation, but they're also significant amount of work. <clears throat> of course, the, the, the downside is that it's less than efficient to train in the real world. Uh, you need some human supervision, especially when you're like putting policies on the robot that are not fully learned yet. Uh, you might hit tables and 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 walls, et cetera. But most importantly, the issue of safety is the biggest problem, right? This example here is actually not a rare incident when you're training in real directly. Um, so this is essentially the system the team has built to, towards learning, safe learning in the real world. And I'll go over it a little bit. Uh, this essentially represents your standard reinforcement learning system, right? You just your policy sends an action directly to the robot. And this action is not going to be optimal if you're still learning uh, or safe. So one thing that we found is that you, you definitely need some additional shielding while learning in the real world. So uh, we need this safety critic. However, we can get this. If we can, uh, then this can help us then determine if the action is safe and then send it to the, send it to the robot, to the environment. Um, we also found that it was important to distinguish when an action is not safe but recoverable. And in this case, we actually send, uh, we actually get the action from a safety policy. And the goal of the safety policy is purely to get the robot back to a safe state. And then the other thing that will happen for sure is that sometimes the robot will get into an unsafe state. And in that case, you need a reset policy that would allow you to continue training, to get the robot back into some nominal state so that you can continue training. And using all of these components, we essentially are able to build a system that is 
um, safe, efficient, and also autonomous. It can actually run on its own without a lot of human, human intervention. And this actually took a, a long time to build. There's all of these different papers that have come out of this. This has been over the last three years. I won't have time to go into detail on each one, but I'll start by covering a little bit on the safety critic. The idea of, the, of learning the safety critic is that you want to define uh, in the state action space a safe set. And this safe set is essentially um, an area of the state action pair where the probability of going to catastrophic failure is very, very small. And it's usually easy to tell when the robot state is in a safe state or when it's not, right, when it's already falling. And what is difficult is to know when you're in that boundary, when you're close to, if you take this action, you're actually going to uh, go into a failure. And moreover, if you are trying to recover, it's also difficult to know uh, that actually depends on the policy that you're running on the, on the robot. So um, what we do is that we actually learn the safe policy and we also learn a safety, the safety critic together in simulation. Um, and we borrow the idea from reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you have this Q function that essentially says, given a state action pair, I'm going to estimate the probability of long-term reward. And similarly, we define Q safe or the safety critic, which is says, given the state action pair, what is the probability of long-term safety? Meaning I'm, go I'm not going to go into catastrophic failure. And then we train this together, as I said, in simulation. And then given that you have a, a, the Q value, you can es essentially threshold there to decide whether you're in a safe state, you're unsafe, or there's actually, I don't know that you can see it, but uh, right, whether there's some section of the, some parameters within two thresholds that, that define that critical safety area between safe and unsafe, the boundary. Um, so this is how we define, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, five minute warning. Sorry, there was a comment? Five minute warning. Oh, five minute warning. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so basically, given the safety credit, we can then uh, use a safe decide whether we go into a safety policy. I won't have time to go into this piece, as I said, but you can see, for example, even in this little GIF, how we can learn this balancing on two feet task. And as soon as the robot feels unsafe, it essentially goes into this white stance that allows it to get back to the safety state and then continue learning. And that allows it so that there is not a lot of human intervention. Similarly, when it does fall and it will, we have uh, this reset policy. This reset policy is also learned in simulation with some adaptation in the real world that it enables the robot to get up from essentially any position. Cool. So the last five minutes, I want to talk about challenges in the social environments. This is something that is more recent for our team. So we have more problem, more challenges than answers for you. Uh, so, but I just wanted to share some of them. The first one is bridging this gap between human task and robot task. So as you see, we have ways to learn all kinds of very short horizon, very concrete tasks, like right? pick and place, align, et cetera. But when humans are talk, are actually when, if you want robots to be useful to humans, they need to be able to ask natural language, you know, question. They need to be able to ask for tasks using natural language, like, hey, robot, could you give me a hand with this? Or maybe they'll say, I spilled my drink, can you help? Or can you bring me a snack and a drink? Right? And that's, ex a, and that's very different than the tasks that the robot has learned to do, which are very short horizon and very specific. So this work called SayCan is, exact, is exactly about bridging this gap. So here you have two problems. The first one is understand what the user means. So if I say I spill my drink, can you help? You're not explicitly telling the robot exactly what to do, but presumably you want it to bring you something to clean the mess or to put away what, what uh, the, the can that just spilled. And moreover, even if you understand the task, you need to translate that into actions that the robot can take and has learned to take. So our first approach for this was maybe we can use these very large language models that are trained on the web. They probably know about completing tasks um, and they seem to be very advanced in terms of uh, semantic understanding. So we try using that. So if I say I spill my drink, can you help? GPT-3 says essentially you could try using a vacuum cleaner. Lambda says, do you want me to find a cleaner? And Flan says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to spill it. And even though this feedback is semantically correct, uh, it's something you might express, expect for someone is not very useful for the robot because it's not grounded in the current environment. It doesn't know uh, or understand the capabilities of the robot. So here we need to do some grounding and that's exactly what this work does. It still leverages the large language models 
for the semantic task completion part. So if I say I spill my drink, can you help? You get all of these options from the language model that are useful. And then the robot can use its context, its understanding of the environment, and it can also uh, use its experience, like it knows how to pick up a sponge. It has seen a sponge in the environment. So it's going to select in this case, oh, I can bring you a sponge. Um, and exactly how it does that is that, well, you need to have some sort of affordance function that tells you what is feasible to do in the environment. And that using that affordance function, we score the options from the language model. So here's an example. If you're using reinforcement learning policies, um, you have this Q-value function that is essentially tell you what's the probability that you'll get a long-term reward by completing this task given the current environment, right? So you can see as the robot moves in that image on the left, uh, the different bars in the middle are shifting up and down. And one thing you'll notice is as soon as you get to this Coke can, there's a couple of red bars that shoot up. Those red bars are essentially the Q-value function, the, the value functions associated with pick up and place a Coke can. So they're telling you what the likelihood is to complete this task given the current input. And that's exactly what we use for us our affordance functions. So to summarize is here on the left, if you have a task, you actually prompt the language model to give you, to tell you what are the options to do next. Given those options, we use the value functions from all the policies that are unloaded on the robot to essentially score that those options. And then with that, we select the best next action to take, execute on it, and then use it to feed back into the language model to prompt it again. And doing this, we can do lots of long horizon tasks, about 100 that are over 10 steps with 70% planning rate and 60% execution rate. And you can see an example for a very long horizon one there in that image at the bottom, which took about 17 steps. So that's one. Uh, the other challenge that we found is evaluating human robot interaction at scale. And we started uh, seeing this when evaluating social navigation. So the idea, I mean, I know many people in this group are working on social navigation. The idea here is if you're, work, if you're working in a human centric environment, you not only want to go from A to B in a safe way without hitting anything or anyone, you also want to do it using while following social norms, while being comfortable to the humans in that environment. So I'm showing here some images of what would be considered safe navigation in quotes, but it's not very comfortable for the humans in that environment. You see the robot gets close to humans or it may block a person from going into the room or out of a room. And in the bottom, I have some examples that are more social where you essentially um, anticipate what the human is about to do and get out of the way earlier or give way, et cetera. So what we've done in this work is just try to define a protocol for validating social navigation policies by essentially defining some social scenarios, uh, capturing some data of the robot being uh, navigating in, uh, in, around humans in these in this social scenarios, and then using some uh, social metrics, which were defined uh, in, co in collaboration with an HRI researcher to capture socialness beyond just distance from human and robot. Um, and using that, we've been iterating to, on different policies. But I don't have time to go into those policies in this talk today. All right. Um, the last thing I want to mention is lifelong learning in social environments. This is, of course, very challenging and something we haven't really scratched the surface yet. But I did want to share with you some of the findings from a recent workshop that we did in human-robot interaction at Google. Um, it was just very recent. It was June earlier this month, and it had researchers from all of these different institutions um, specializing in human-robot interaction. And what I wanted to share was a little bit on our brainstorming session. So we created two brainstorming sessions, or basically split the group into two groups, and then each group had actually a graphic artist that was capturing the discussion. So this is what this slide is. I did not make this slide. Um, and the question was, what are some challenges and potential solutions for robots lifelong learning while living and working alongside humans in the real world? And this is what it looked like. Uh, so you can check this out. I'll share the slides too, so you can, you can take some time for it. But essentially things that come up are like privacy, of course, information leakage problems, sensitive data. That is an obvious one that came up first. The second one was adaptation for behavioral shifts, not only adapting to different people in the household or in the environment, wherever the robot may be running, but also adapting to uh, over time and adapting over like how people change their uh, expectations of the robot, like in the mornings versus in the evenings, right? Um, and then the other thing that came up a lot was 
basically humans want to maintain some semblance of control. They want to know when the robot is learning and when it's not. And proactive learning can be seen as controversial. Um, so we need to think about this as researchers working on lifelong learning. Um, so there was lots of discussions around should the robot have some roles with a specific scope? Uh, what do we do for accidental learning? Um, the next slide actually shows even more examples of this. This is the second group, just same question, different group of folks. In this case, we oh, had- I'm afraid we're at time. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually, this is like my one to last slide. All I wanted to mention here was a couple other challenges that come up, like causality. So how do you discover what the robot learned? And also setting human expectations. As the robot is learning, and it's important that the human understands at all times what the robot is capable of doing and what is not. And this is just a summary slide that says that our approach to, um, to lifelong learning is, is essentially designed for generalization with a scalable data-driven learning, task agnostic learning. We do lots of pre-training and simulation and learn from past experience, but we embrace in, in enabling and automating safe and efficient learning in the real world. And there's a lot of problems on, uh, on the social interactive robots, and we're just starting to scratch the surface uh, and our findings right now is to leverage pre-trained semantic representations, um, but we haven't really, um, like we have more, more challenges than solutions on the social navigation uh, interactions, for example. That was it, that's all, that's all the slides I have. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we don't have uh, time for uh, questions. So uh, we'll, but however, there's gonna be a speaker panel at 4.30 this afternoon. Uh, so next up, we have, uh, I believe it is Ruzbek. And I'm going to let you do this now. Yes. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. It, uh, it's great to, to see people in, in 3D and uh, also saying hi to 2D people. Uh, so my talk today is about like a, a massive scale active and adaptive training for embodied AI agents. So there are, uh, there, uh, there are like three recent paradigms in embodied AI uh, for, for training the agents. One is massive scale training. The other uh, is active training, how to interact with people. And also the third one is adaptive training when uh, where there's no supervision and we want to adapt at test time to, to our environment or to, to our task. So first I will, I will focus on massive scale training. Uh, uh, usually in robotics or embodied AI, we use like one scene or dozens of scenes to train our agents, but now we want to uh, massively scale up. So um, recently we have seen a, uh, a lot of success in uh, natural language understanding and computer vision using uh, large scale data sets, but we want to see if we can repeat the same success story, but uh, in embodied AI. Okay, so I'm going uh, to talk about AI to Thor simulator first and, uh, and uh, the task that, that we, uh, we do in this environment, and then I will uh, talk about how, how we can scale up. So AI to Thor is a simulator for indoor environments, and um, uh, it has three components, iThor, RoboThor, and uh, ManipulateThor. So the idea behind iThor was to uh, design 
Okay, it's playing. Okay, so uh, to model uh, object state changes and also accurately uh, model physics of the world, for example, like uh, turning on and turning off the lights, opening, closing laptops, and, and so on. And so it uh, follows the physics of the world, um, I mean, as, as much as we could. The other component of uh, uh, AI2Thor is RoboThor. The idea behind RoboThor was to uh, design identical scenes in simulation and in reality so we can study sim to real transfer in a, in a control environment. So for example, here you see uh, a scene in simulation and then uh, it switches to, to the physical apartment and uh, we try to match the, the, uh, these two scenes as, as, much as, as much as we could. Also, we uh, have a manipulator uh, the idea uh, uh, for manipulator was to uh, in, uh, manipulate objects using robotics arms. Okay, so we have done a number of tasks using AI to Thor, navigation, interactive question answering, instruction following, and, and, and so on and so forth. I, I'm going to explain a few of them uh, uh, just briefly. So the first task uh, is Navigation. So the goal here in this picture is to find find TV. Uh, the the middle uh, panel shows shows the top down view of the environment, and uh, the agent should go uh, should go from a start location to, to an end location using only uh, egocentric observations. So here uh, is the expected location for uh, uh, for uh, for the agent uh, at the at the end of this this episode. We also have uh, object manipulation. So the idea is to move an object from a start location to the goal location. For example, here we want to move this uh, this pot from from the stove uh, to the area next next to the sink. So this is a difficult task because uh, on the left you see an unsuccessful episode because um, the the robot should be very careful not to touch any any other objects in the environment. For example, here the the arm touched the coffee maker and toaster, so that's an unsuccessful episode. A successful episode uh, looks like this: it goes uh, towards this uh, salt shaker, picks it up without colliding with anything, uh, and then uh, move it toward, towards a specified target location, which is a stove in, in this case. Uh, there is another task that, that uh, we did in a 2 thor called rearrangement. The goal is to, on the left, you see the, uh, the goal state. On the right, you see the current state of the room. So the goal is to uh, make the current state similar to the goal state. For example, here, the toaster is on, on, the, on the island, so it should go back uh, on uh, basically in, in this area that uh, uh, at the, the countertop at, at the back. And uh, the task can be specified in many different ways. It can be uh, specified using language. It can be, uh, you can provide the image of the, the, the goal, uh, goal state. And it's a difficult task because success requires uh, recognizing states like what objects are open, uh, closed, or we need to infer the, the differences, like uh, what's the difference between the current state and next state. We need to have a scene memory. Uh, it requires navigation, exploration, object manipulation, we uh, need to understand the physics of the work. For example, if I place this object at the, at the edge of the table, it will not be stable and it will fall down. We need to understand the pre and post conditions of, of the actions. For example, I cannot interact with, with an object if, if, I'm, if I'm far, far from. Okay, so there are two common techniques uh, used in, in computer vision and in AI in general to, to be, uh, generalize better to unseen environments. So one is data augmentation and the other one uh, is larger scale uh, data sets. So let's see how we can implement uh, these in, in embod, uh, for embodied AI. So I'm going to first talk about data augmentation. So one type of data augmentation that we do in AI to Thor is material randomization. So we can uh, change change the material of uh, the objects to create like new new appearance appearance uh, for for the scene. The other type of data augmentation is uh, randomization of lighting. We can change the intensity and the color of the of the lighting to to create uh, new appearances for 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 the scene. Also, we have object uh, location randomization, so we can move around. Uh, we can shuffle around objects to create new configurations. And um, 
it fol uh, following like certain common common sense rules. These types of data, data augmentations are more powerful than um, typical augmentation that, that we use in computer vision, for example, like cropping, color, jittering, and so on, because these augmentations follow the physics of the world. The other uh, technique is basically using larger scale data sets, uh, increasing the number of samples. So our idea was to uh, procedurally generate hazards to, to create a larger scale uh, data for, for embodied AI. So we can sample like different, different layouts, different walls, different furnitures, different textures to, to create new, new houses. And as a result of that, you can, you can see uh, these, uh, so these are the houses generated using this procedure, uh, using this procedure, like different uh, uh, number of rooms, different layouts, different textures and uh, 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 furniture and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so to put, uh, um, so we sampled the 10, 10,000 of these houses to, to train and evaluate our, our models. So to put this number in context, for example, I Gibson from Stanford has like 15 scenes uh, habitat. We typically use like 90, uh, 90 scenes for uh, training our models. It has about like 200 scenes. Uh, habitat matter for 3D has about 1,000 scenes. And here's, uh, there's a plot that, show, that, that uh, provides these comparisons. So in terms of, uh, this is the number of scenes. So the y-axis is, is log scale. And also we get annotation for free because we know uh, where the objects are, where they are located and, and, and so on. And more importantly, it's the scenes are interactive. For example, uh, some of some of these frameworks are uh, uh, design uh, are basically obtained from 3D scans of rooms, so you cannot really easily modify modify those rooms. But here uh, we can interact with the scenes. The physics uh, is enabled and, and and so on. Okay, now we train our model on this on this uh, our models on on this large data set, and we tried it for for different tasks. So the first task that that we tried was object navigation, and um, in two, uh, two uh, different settings for Ithor, which are basically like single rooms and uh, the other uh, a, a variation of that we call Ar architecture. These are like big, big houses. And uh, here you see the, um, so EMB clip is one of uh, one high, per high performance navigation model. Zero shot means we just, uh, we train on our data on, on Fractor and and without any training on the benchmark data, we, we test that on the, on, on, on the benchmark test data. And fine tuning means that we use benchmark training to, to uh, further fi fine tune that model. And uh, there are two metrics like success, success rate and SPL is success rated by, by path length. And as you see here, we see uh, huge improvements com compared, compared to the baselines. So these are um, uh, basically kind of considered in domain uh, uh, because they sh uh, share some similarity with, with Proctor. So we decided to um, uh, run them on uh, other other framework that are, that are different. One was Robothor and the other one was Habitat. Habitat, as you see here, is uh, photorealistic. It's very different from uh, the uh, Proctor synthetic scenes. And it's still, uh, we get huge improvements and we, we are on top of leaderboard as, uh, as of this morning, I think. Um, and also, uh, so these, uh, yeah, you see, uh, you see the differences. Like on the left is a scene from Proctor, it's a synthetic scene. On the right, it's a scene, scene from, from Habitat. So uh, that, that, was, that was very interesting that you, uh, training on this larger scale data uh, can help us tr uh, transfer to, to, um, uh, to other appearance distributions. We also tried that for two other tasks like rearrangement and manipulation that I just talked about. Again, the same, same, uh, same, type, of, uh, same type of improvement and that was, that was quite encouraging. And the most most important thing so is that uh, so we use this simple architecture. So it's basically just RGB as input. It goes through a clip encoder, and we have this GRU, and we sample sample actions from that. It's a super simple architecture. So it's no depth, no auxiliary losses, no mapping, no uh, basically no hand defined uh, task or, or or losses. And that was that was that was quite uh, quite encouraging, and that was a big deal for us. Okay, so uh, now let's switch gears to, to active um, uh, 
active environment. So we also, so now I talked about how to, how to learn with envir uh, environments and, and uh, uh, how to learn, um, just gonna learn to interact with environments and objects. Uh, now let's see if we can uh, learn to interact with, um, uh, with experts or, or people. So this is the state of embodied AI today. Uh, so these are screenshots from three different leaderboards, rearrangement and like different object map uh, competitions. And as you see here, the, the performance is quite low, like 7% for, uh, for the rearrangement, like about like 60, 50% on, uh, for navigation. And we don't really want agents that, like, that work uh, half, half the time. Okay, so our idea was to use uh, uh, experts' help to to improve our performance. So on the left here, you um, sorry. So you see uh, the agent is trying to look for this spray bottle, which is hidden behind this uh, this armchair, and I uh, get uh, gets confused and pings pings a user, and a user provides help uh, in terms of like some uh, actions. This this green line here, and the agent sees the the the. Uh, uh, the model and 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 find it. So there are two two problems here. So first is uh, basically when learn when to ask questions, and also how to use uh, the provided help from from the uh, from the expert. So we had this very simple simple model on top. There, uh, it's a frozen embodied AI model. So it has a visual encoder. It has a recurrent recurrent unit. And it produces an action at the bottom. Uh, it's our uh, we call it like ask for help model. That it has a success prediction model. Uh, that uh, the idea is that it, uh, given the current state of the scene, it predicts if the uh, the 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 task will be will if the episode will be successful or not. And then at the end, it decides uh, if the agent um, should take the action or it should rely on on experts experts action. At the beginning here, uh, we also have like different uh, reward configurations. So that helps us later in inference that we can we can uh, tune um, tune that. For example, for, uh, if the user doesn't want to uh, respond to questions, uh, we can use a specific type of rewards if the user is available to uh, to respond uh, uh, basically to help the agent. Uh, we can use the different type of type of reward. So basically, it acts as a knob during inference. To to help us uh, 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 to adapt to, to to the preferences of the user. So these are uh, some results. This is uh, for object goal navigation that I uh, that I just talked about. The x-axis is expert uh, proportion, means that like what percentage of the actions were taken by uh, by the expert, and y-axis is is the success rate. The the red horizontal line is uh, is the baseline. As as you see here, this this blue line is is our method. With like about like 10, 15 percent help, the performance improves to to 90 percent, and that was uh, that was quite encouraging. That with this little help, we can we can uh, gain uh, this much improvement. We also tried like different types of experts, like human experts and also automatic experts. And as you see here, there is not much difference between human experts and, and automatic experts, which are more powerful than, or less noisy than, than human experts. The same same uh, story for room, re room rearrangement uh, with 39% health, we go about like 94, uh, 95 per, uh, to 94, 95% uh, help. And 39% uh, is, is a quite a bit of help, but, uh, but the performance, uh, the success rate for, for uh, rearrangement is about seven percent, so that that's kind of kind of expected. Okay. Okay. This is uh, this is a video on on the left. You see the top down view of the environment. On the right, it's a it's a uh, view of the agent. Green means here agent is relying on on its own action. Red means it it uses uh, expert help. So in the interest of time, I, um, I go ahead a little bit. Okay, so the agent is confused. It goes, goes around the room. It cannot, it cannot find, find the object. And um, at some point, the, uh, the expert uh, takes, a, takes over the control. And uh, so the target here is, is an alarm clock. So it becomes 
red here and um yeah now the the expert is driving the agent and the, the alarm clock is on on top of this this uh drawer that that's why it could, uh, the agent could not could not find it and a little bit of expert help uh was um uh, helped it help it a lot okay and uh so the last part of the talk is about like adaptive adaptive training. So we want to adapt to the test environment without without any supervision. So I will talk about embodied object uh, embodied adaptive object detection in uh, uh, specifically. So we have had a, a lot of models uh, object detection models in the past couple of decades, uh, ranging from uh, constellation models, part based models, CNNs, transformers, and 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 all that. Uh, but there are two common assumptions. So one is um, the models are frozen. So we train the model on our training set. We freeze the model, and um, we, uh, the model is not updated anymore. That that's just just a frozen model, and uh, the test set is locked. So so we have a predefined test set. So we cannot really interact with the test set. So that's uh, another common assumption among among these these models. Uh, so here is how, how we do object detection today. So we download a set of independent images from, from the internet. We annotate them with the object of interest, for example, this, this sofa. And, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and then train our, our object detector on, 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 this, um, on, on, on these annotations to, to get um, uh, to, to, uh, to train our, our models, but the word is not really a set of independent images downloaded from the internet. The word is continuous. So we want to see if we can use this continuity to, to improve our, our agents, to improve object detection. So our idea is to continue training at test time using, uh, using feedback. Uh, and uh, there are two, two problems. First, how to adapt the model at test time. So we, want, we need an adapt, adaptation mechanism at test time. And the other is uh, how to deal with lack of supervision. At test time, there is no uh, there is no supervision available. So uh, how can how can we how can we adapt without without any supervision? So here is the task: the, we want to detect objects uh, in the first frame given a sequence of frames, and uh, the ideal output is some something like this: that uh, microwave drawer and, and and so on. So we want to we want to detect those. So here here is the idea. So uh, it, uh, this is a detector uh, neural network. It's pra it pra um, is parameterized uh, by theta, and it produces a set of set of boxes. Some of some of these boxes are correct. Some of the, them are not correct. And um, so we we can compute the loss function based on the ground truth that that we get from 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 training. And there is another um, another model here. We call uh, another component of the model. We call it supervisor. It's parameterized by phi. The task of this uh, this component is to generate gradients for um, for the uh, for the detector. So these gradients are applied to the detector. They can change the weights of the detector. So as a result of that, the detector produces a new set of boxes, and hopefully this time the the loss uh, the loss goes down. And we can use uh, this loss the new loss function to adapt our, our uh, basically to, to change our supervisor. So next time it produces better gradients. So that, that, was, that was training, but at test time, there's, there's no supervision available. So, but, but we, have this, uh, we have this gradient and we can use that gradient to, to update our, uh, our detector at test time. So basically we answered those, those two questions that um, how to adapt the model at test time and how to deal with lack of supervision. So this is uh, the architecture of the model. So here, uh, this one is a simple single frame detector. The, the image goes into a neural network. It produces a, a, set, of, a set of boxes. And uh, this is a multi-frame setting that we feed in the detect, uh, detections to, to a transformer to, to combine, um, uh, uh, to reason across, across the sequence. This is uh, our adaptive learning framework. Uh, these uh, arrows are adaptive gradients that, that I just talked about. And we also have interactive adaptive gradients that we also learn a policy to, to move in the environment. So here is, here is the result uh, that, that we obtain using, using this method. So interactron is, is our method. Deter is, is a um, state-of-the-art object detector. So the improvement, uh, so we have two different metrics, AP and, and AP50. Uh, so AP is a like, more strict version of, 
uh, these are like object detection, uh, standard object detection metrics. So we uh, obtained about 19% improvement over the over the single frame baseline and about like 12% improvement in terms of AP. And um, to put this, uh, these numbers in context is basically uh, object detection community uh, achieved this level of improvement in three years. But here with just just simple interactions with the environment, we can uh, we can gain this much this much improvement. Okay, so here here are some some results. Uh, so the second column is is Intractron our, our model. This, these are the, the sequence of uh, sequence of frames. As you see, it's it's very hard to detect the sofa in this um, uh, uh, in the setting because it's very close to the sofa. But as the agent moves backwards, so it, it can it can see the it can see the, the entire sofa and gets uh, becomes more confident about about its predictions. Okay, so uh, so I talked about three pra uh, paradigms in training and body AI, AI agents. First, it was like massive scale training. We show very promising results across like multiple benchmarks in navigation and, and manu object manipulation. Uh, uh, after that, uh, I talked about active uh, uh, active training. So when uh, we need to learn uh, to interact with with, a, with an expert. And finally, uh, I talked about adaptive training. So we want to adapt to to a test environment without without any supervision okay and this is the the amazing team uh, behind uh, all uh, behind these works that they that they talked about okay thank you Hi, thanks for the great talk. For the interactive part, uh, I wonder if you are able to see about the communication efficiency of the interaction model. That's an after touch. Which, which interaction model? The... Yeah, the, the, the model that's an after touch. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, no, we uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have an explicit uh, loss or, or reward for for efficiency efficiency of the, the communication. It's I mean we have we have a reward that that's basically penalizes the agent for for asking question, but uh, and uh, we hope that that takes care of the that takes care of this efficiency. But we don't have any anything ex explicit to to en enforce that. Yeah, because you know. Uh... Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so that that uh, I, I think. Uh, let me see if I can bring bring that. Okay, Luca, I need I need your help. So. <laughs> Yeah, this, this plot on uh, top top left kind kind of shows the the efficiency that we are talking about. Like for example, like five 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 percent help means like only like five percent of the actions are are taken taken by the expert and uh that's uh, that is still improves improves uh the performance uh, a lot thank you yeah thanks yeah that, that's that's actually a very very good point uh unfortunately no we, we didn't analyze analyze that but uh, i mean we just reported like ag aggregate numbers but i believe there should be there should be some some um uh yeah some some inter interesting things like for example like large objects might be easy probably they might not interaction uh or but small objects because you just if, if you are far from them you cannot detect them easily if you move Closer, you you will have a better view of those and get get more confident. But uh, we don't have any uh, any detailed analysis of, of that. Uh, 
uh, no, th this was we, we assumed that the scene is static, like just the agent can can only navigate without without any any like manipulation of, of objects. But but these are these are very great and great points. Uh, one quick question from the slides. Uh, so I have a question about why then doors and any materials before the walls are realistic. So top floor, uh, if they have these modern houses with three to four rooms, tend to share a common interior design uh, and texture. Why, why, why random? Why they are not they are not like real really like random random. So it follows like certain certain patterns. For example, for we we have a specific um, um, what's the right word like vocabulary for, for for floor for example or for for walls and uh, so it's not like a uniform sampling of of uh, like texture. So we know like. Which which textures are, are more suitable for walls? Uh, walls which textures are more suitable for floor? So we, we choose uh, from 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 those sets. It's not uh, it's not a random random selection. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, please feel free to ask questions on the Slack, and we'll try to get anything we didn't get during this. Thank you so much. Um, try to get anything we didn't get in this time uh, for uh, during the, the panel. Uh, next up is uh, Drew Batra. I think I, I hope I got your link. Uh, I hope I read the slides you updated for correct one from last week's morning. Oh, wait, no, it's a problem with content. Uh, oh, no. it's, uh, oh, I see. I see. Um, the, so one second, everyone. Just doing some uh, slide transfer real quick. Uh, give us a, a three minute break uh, and then we'll come to uh, Drew's talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, so the poster session will be held, I think, in halls D and E. Um, basically, after the uh, the final speaker, uh, Matt, which, who's one of the organizers, will uh, take anybody who is presenting a poster and walk them over to uh, the the hall. Um, yeah, thanks for bearing with us with this. CVPR was a bit slow telling us where these will actually be presented. Um, so thanks. After this, uh, at uh, one thirty, we will have uh, another series of three present presentations that are listed on our website or on the front of the door. So they'll be at the time to take them down. Burning a hole in our pocket. I have a quick question about cross door. So, for starters, that was a delightful talk. Uh, okay, so my question is how far do you think we can get if this purely procedural and kind of remix content? Is it, do, do we have enough sort of basis content and enough sort of objects 
and uh, house layouts, and we only just have to like remix them and remix them, and that will serve our sort of data needs um, for the foreseeable future. Or is it still worth investing in uh, basis content that will can then later be remixed? And, and, and what what is what's what's the exchange rate between sort of one remix scene and the brand new scene coming straight to the Oh, like in terms of sort of tax. What's the sort of marginal benefit I get from a remix scene versus <laughs> like the marginal benefit I get from a brand new scene? What's the like? Well, yeah, so so that 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 that, uh, that question. So the the, the improvement as as the increase in number of houses, for example, hundred houses to five hundred houses, and thousand houses, and as we see like improvement. So it means that like new streams are more important. Actually, uh, the amount will max out the number. So you just have more ten thousand and uh, here. So it's fine to go to like two other houses. So the efficiency mechanism. Just I was meaning remix capital or like procedurally generated. Procedurally generated houses, but it might, so it might not like overlap with the previous, 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 uh, previous, previous, previous. Mm -hmm. So that the, uh, that the, uh, basically, uh, maybe you still need to see, uh, in terms of projects and, and things. So we, we have a little bit of projects in the world. So, we, uh, for example, like an idea of like, might have like 3,000 objects or 4,000 objects. I think that might be sufficient to, to create like enough, enough houses. So you can have uh, probably a time to find a little to go to go beyond that. And uh, so, yeah, that, uh, we are still at, at the beginning of this uh, larger scale. I'm trying to thing, just open the streets. <laughs> Apologies for the mic on. Apologies for the delay. Uh, let's get started. Okay, so thank you for coming and thank you for having me. Uh, I am happy to go after Ruzbe because I think I'm going to build on a lot of the same themes. Uh, I want the message from my talk today is that the scaling hypothesis has come knocking for embodied AI and that the Roger Bannister effect is at play. And I will explain what I mean by both of those, those terms. Uh, I, had a, I had a version of this slide with a picture on it, but I deemed perhaps too, too unnecessary. So if you want to come see it later, it was too risky to show. I can show it later. Uh, all right, so the scaling hypothesis is the idea that once we find a suitable general purpose architecture, like self-attention or convolutions, we can train ever larger models and ever more sophisticated behavior that emerge naturally. Uh, 
the bombastic uh, rhetoric that we hear around this is that scaling is all we need. Uh, I don't quite agree with that rhetoric, uh, but I do agree with a weaker version of the statement that increasing model capacity compute experience um, does result in more intelligent behavior. This is about as close to ML fundamentals 101. Like if, if, if there is any aspect of machine learning theory that has survived contact with modern experiments, it is this, right? So this, the weaker form, I think we can, we can agree on. Um, the Roger Bannister effect is an interesting uh, effect. Um, so I don't know how many people know about this, uh, but in 1954, uh, Roger Bannister ran the first sub four minute mile. Uh, so a four minute mile is impressive. Uh, it, it was a long standing barrier. Uh, we didn't, you know, people didn't necessarily think that it was possible. Uh, if you want to have context, uh, four minute mile corresponds to 15 miles an hour. If you get on an American treadmill, uh, they won't go to 15. So um, treadmills in the hotels, for example, don't go to the pace at which this person is running for 400 meter rounds. Um, so this was an impress impressive phenomena. Uh, what is actually less understood and what is perhaps more impressive is that today, this is routinely broken by high school athletes. Every year, uh, this happens. The, the, the mile numbers have continued to come down over the years. Um, and today what happens is that you have to have, you know, two high school boys breaking the four minute mile barrier in the same race and then that's newsworthy. Simply breaking the four minute mile barrier is not newsworthy. Um, and I think there's a, there's a, there's an actual effect. Uh, the, that effect can be characterized as a person or a team or an endeavor one demonstrates that X is possible. Uh, it may have been perceived as a barrier before, uh, that that's where the limits lie. Uh, but, you know, there's this one person who shows that X is possible, they have to develop all sorts of techniques and practices and like, uh, along the way that are necessarily suboptimal because they didn't know what they were doing. They were, there was no playbook to go on, you know why? Uh, but what that does, what that proof of concept does is the community now knows X is possible. We know how to get there. There is a, there is a playbook uh, and you can easily spot the inefficiencies uh, on that playbook. Uh, and improve uh, on that. Um, and over time, X is replicated multiple times, the techniques evolve, and X becomes routine. Uh, it becomes routine to do the thing that was perceived as a barrier, and then the barrier shifts to uh, Y being uh, the other barrier. Uh, now, it's actually debatable whether in the case of the four minute mile, really that's what happened, or everybody's times got faster and in incomparable to the past because uh, you know the track uh, feels just got better. That aside, I think I would claim that the Roger Bannister effect plays out in research. Uh, I think this, this happens that uh, you may believe something is a barrier, but once you see a proof of concept, it becomes pretty easy to, to say, yeah, that we can, we should be able to do better here. Um, and so I'll give you an example and I'll build it on top of that. The example comes from my own work, but this is you know, by no means uh, limited to my work. Other, uh, this is how this phenomenon plays out in other people's work as well. A couple of years ago uh, in 2020, uh, we wrote this paper at iClear, uh, which was uh, decentralized distributed PPO, near perfect point pole navigators. We were studying the point nav task. We have an agent, it's given a relative goal coordinate, uh, egocentric RGBD. And we said, essentially, we're going to treat this like an image captioning problem, uh, where images in, uh, oops, images in, tokens out. Yeah, those tokens happen to be actions, but who cares? Um, and there's a sort of radical empiricism uh, that, we, that we pursued, which is no task-specific modules, no, no slam, no mapping. We, we have no idea of what any of that is. Uh, no spatial memory, no knowledge of projective geometry or 3D. Um, no additional learning signals, no expert demonstrations, no pre-training of representations, no look ahead search trees, um, no curriculum, no buffer, replay buffers, no reset to partial states, just nothing, just on policy vanilla PPO. Um, and what we did was we scaled learning. So distributed across multiple GPUs, um, just synchronizing gradients. Um, we, we showed this had, uh, interesting scaling behavior. So you could scale it to 256 GPUs, get 200 X speed up over what you would do on a single GPU. 
Uh, and our key sort of result was this plot where we said, okay, on the x-axis is amount of experience that we're going to be training for. It goes to 2.5 billion steps of experience at that point. Typical experiments were in, in millions or hundreds of millions. Uh, this corresponds to 40 years of uh, robot time. Uh, if you were to run those robot experiments yourself, which you couldn't. Uh, oh, I see what's happening. Uh, Somebody is requesting that live transcript be enabled for the meeting. Do you want to enable this thing? Uh, All right, enable. Uh, this corresponded to six uh, GPU months. Uh, so there's 180 days of GPU training time done in three days of all clock time distributed over a cluster of 64 GPUs. And the impressive thing was on new environments, we essentially uh, saturated the data set. There's 99.9% .9 performance on held out uh, environments. Um, this was, we thought it was, this was interesting enough that you know you could actually run a visual Turing test, which one is an agent, which one is shortest path. So you, know, you could look at, you know, you're trying to get to the red square, you start in the blue square, there is one path traced out, uh, there's another path traced out, and you can reasonably start playing which one had access to ground truth and which one is operating just based on egocentric uh, vision without building any maps. Any guesses? For people who have seen this before, left one's a learned agent, it just like likes bumping into corners. Uh, that's a learned behavior. Um, but today, this is a fairly routine phenomenon. Uh, there is a growing community uh, that continues to, to push these numbers up uh, in terms of the challenges here uh, and, and all those things. But I, I want people to realize that this experiment, which I thought was pretty impressive, is now routinely replicated. Like it's not that hard. Uh, infrastructurally, it is still hard and not every institution may have the, the resources to be able to replicate it. But in terms of the tooling and the thought of replicating, it's not that hard. Like, People replicate this all the time. Um, and so what I want to talk to you about today is where does this train go? Uh, where is this scaling headed? So I want to tell you about scaling 3D data, uh, scaling experience, and scaling representations. Um, and hopefully, all of these will become routine as well. Um, so scaling 3D data. Uh, last year, we put out this data set called the Habitat Matterport 3D, or the HM3D data set. It is 1,000 3D reconstruction uh, scans of uh, commercial and residential spaces. Um, compared to other data sets that came before, it is significantly larger uh, and higher quality uh, of the reconstruction. Um, it's collected from predominantly uh, US and Western nations, but there is a somewhat of a spe spectrum of, uh, of the geographical diversity as well. Um, and there was one obvious missing piece, which is a question that has come up today enough, that there were no object annotations. So you could use it for point nav, couldn't use it for something like object nav. Uh, so for the last year or so, we've been engaged in annotating semantics. Uh, so on the left, you see a dollhouse view of the 3D reconstruction. Every single triangle has been annotated. Every wall, every floor, every ceiling, every object, every clutter, everything has been annotated uh, with uh, dense 3D annotations, and therefore, uh, on the right, you can generate egocentric, fully pixel ground truth uh, semantic segmentations and instance segmentations. Um, there are 120 scenes that have been released so far. Uh, those 120 scenes uh, reflect 12,000 hours of human effort of annotation. Um, you know, these are other examples of the kinds of scenes and the uh, density of the annotations in the data set. Uh, there are about 600 or so categories in this uh, first. 120 version, 114 categories per scene on average. Um, and this is what we use to launch the Habitat uh, challenge uh, that uh, Santosh, I think, has spoke about or will speak about. Um, and so this is, we use this to, uh, to study the task of object nav. So you spawn an agent, ask it to go find a cabinet. Um, the agent doesn't have access to the object position, obviously, there's no map. Uh, and so the agent has to go around searching for an object. This is much more of a search task and semantic understanding task because you have to know where you might find this object. Um, the deadline for this is actually in August. It's been extended. Uh, this is the leaderboard as of, as of this morning. Uh, it's sorted by success. Uh, Luca, you will. <laughs> 
uh, Luca's approach uh, has higher SPL. I do want to point that out. Uh, we we have a play on words going. Uh, he called his approach good seed, so we're called bad seed. Uh, we we have a, a healthy competition going, uh, and so I, I encourage you to try and beat this. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that was about 120 annotated scans. More are underway. We do plan to release more. Uh, and I think this, we should, my expectation is that as we have more annotated data, all numbers should go up. Uh, there are multiple teams sitting with high uh, performing success rates, and that's awesome. Okay, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, scaling experience. Uh, so this is uh, work uh, led by uh, Ram Ramakya, who's in the audience, and together with Eric Andusander and Abhishek Das. Um, here, our goal was to scale imitation learning. Um, we built an interface where a human user um, connected, sitting on mechanical turf can just go on a browser, control a virtual robot in a, in a simulated environment, and we are, of course, recording those actions. And so we can get uh, human demonstrations for the task of object map. We can also get them for other sophisticated tasks like picking, picking and placing objects. Um, we scaled this to get 92,000 human demonstrations uh, from workers at, at, on the capital Um uh, In contrast, um, typical demonstration data sets are typically an order or two, sorry, typically an order or two smaller. Um, so this, this scale uh, should help. There, there's actually two tasks in that data set that we've collected for object now, which is just finding an object and apologies, picking in place, which is go pick it up and place it somewhere. Uh, I think one of the interesting things that I like about this data set is it gives us uh, human ground truth. Uh, so we actually know in 500 steps, which is the task that we're basically posing for the, for the agents, can humans solve this task? Um, and so success rate is high, turns out SPL, human efficiency of the paths that they take is fairly low. Uh, so we actually have approaches that are in some sense outperforming humans uh, on, uh, well, not quite, 39 is still, but we're getting there uh, in terms of SPL. Uh, there's actually no reason to believe that machines, uh, that humans provide any sort of upper bound on efficiency for, uh, for machines. Uh, the machines could pick up on priors on the environments and do better. Uh, but it's it's good to have that that number. Um, and the interesting thing for us is just simple imitation learning on model-free approaches, no maps, uh, no semantic under you know semantic mapping or anything. Uh, it just simply scaling imitation learning, vanilla behavior cloning, not even inverse RL, uh, leads to emergence of efficient object search behavior. Um, so this is an agent. It's been asked to find a cabinet, uh, and what you'll see is an example of a peeking behavior. So this agent will step into a room, look around, and step right back out because that's not where the object is located. So there's a room in front. Uh, this agent steps up, looks left, looks right, and is done to the room. There's no more exploration in this room, uh, and so it heads back out. And this is not a behavior that emerges on its own from reinforcement learning. You'd have to you know, design a specific reward function that encourages this behavior. Uh, this emerges because humans exhibit this behavior. Um, here's another one where uh, an agent has been told uh, to, uh, you know, place the Lego block on the wood colored block. Uh, this is the start of the episode. So the agent first looks down, looks around, uh, gets a view of its environment uh, and goes on. Um, we're making no claims as to whether this is useful for downstream, well, whether this is necessary for downstream performance or simply imitating human behavior, but we are actually able to uh, find the emergence of this behavior. So that's interesting. Um, here's another one where uh, the task is place the toy squirrel on the wooden block. Uh, the agent looks down, picks up an object, enters into a room, and will back out once it realizes there's nothing in the room. Uh, even the simple backtracking behavior to using the back movement uh, is not easy to emerge in on its own. Um, uh, it's much more common to see turning around and, and moving forward. Uh, on both the tasks, there are promising scaling uh, behaviors. Uh, so on the x-axis is uh, the episode, uh, you know, human demonstration size. Uh, we've scaled them out to you know eighty thousand. Uh, the performance seems not saturated. I'm not saying it's a linear plot, but it doesn't seem saturated at all. So essentially, we could go out, get more data. Once Luca gets his act together, we'll be able to outperform his approach by just going out and capital. Um, 
finally scaling representations. Uh, so this is work that we're heading into now. Uh, this is work led by Karnesh Yadav, who's a AI resident uh, at, uh, at Meta, um, where we're taking the approach of pre-training representations. So this is something that you know a number of uh, works uh, are looking at as well. We're not the first ones or the only ones to look at it. But the idea being that we can take um, images captured from 3D scans, uh, pre-train visual encoders, and then fine-tune them on tasks like image tag. Uh, and object tag. Um, the recipe is fairly simple uh, to the point that you know this is obviously a recipe that the first idea that someone would try and of course our reviews say exactly that that there's no novelty in this approach uh, and there isn't the idea is that you take a task agnostic uh, data set of images you apply a standard algorithm like dino um, and then you do offline visual representation learning treating this just like a 2d understanding problem and then you do task specific fine tuning on image map and object map uh, with the option being of freezing representations or fine tuning representations uh, fine tuning helps um, we use this data set uh, from Sasha Sachs and collaborators uh, at Berkeley um, called the Omni Data Data Omni Data Starter Data Set, uh, which contains rendered two D images from three D environments, um, and uh, and this is uh, fourteen point five million images, um, uh, 240, uh, 2400 scenes. Uh, so it comes from a number of uh, sources. Uh, like uh, HM3D, Replica, Task on the Hypersync, Blender, uh, MVG. The benefit of having an offline data set is, in my mind, reproducibility. You know exactly what data set of images this was trained on as opposed to online. Uh, we can point to that data set, we can point to the representations. Um, and the interesting thing for us is uh, on the x axis here is uh, steps of fine tuning. So the pre training has been done. There are two curves in red is uh, offline uh, visual representation learning. So OVRL, that's our approach. On the right is learning from scratch. So initialize your, uh, your models from scratch. Uh, the dashed lines are test, the solid lines are train. X axis is number of steps of experience. It's again going out to 1.5 billion steps of experience. Notice this is what I was talking about. This just becoming routine. That's not even the point of the, of the plot. Um, the point of the, the, it's trained, this is trained on Gibson, this is image now success. Uh, the message to take away here is that the benefits of pre training do not go away with long term, long scale uh, fine tuning. So it's not just that you get there faster and then both methods converge to the same thing. It's that, you know, learning from scratch simply does not converge to the same point, uh, even after long uh, term uh, fine tuning. Um, here, what you notice is that there is a big train versus test gap. So the training numbers for both approaches are significantly higher than the testing numbers. Um, this is because there's being trained on just 72 Gibson training scenes. Um, if you train on 800 uh, HM3D uh, training scenes for ImageNav, the first thing that you notice is train versus test gaps are much smaller. Um, so there's, there's relatively little overfitting. But the gap between uh, visual pre-training and uh, learning from scratch hasn't gone away. In fact, it's only gotten bigger. Um, and so what that tells us is that, you know, those representations uh, haven't been written over, they haven't been forgotten, and that is actually making a difference uh, to the performance. Um, and finally, this is some work that we uh, are about to put out, uh, zero shot object uh, nav. Uh, and this is the key idea here is, uh, how do I make my object nav agent go to new objects? Uh, and the answer, which is a variant of the ideas that other people have also looked at, is train an image nav agent and use clip to align image to text. Um, this is, you know, the implication is that this gives you a zero shot open world object nav agent. Um, so the idea being that, you know, you encode your images for image nav with a clip visual encoder, and at test time, you just swap it out for a clip uh, object uh, encoder. Um, I'm happy to talk about details offline, but essentially it means that you can say things like this, find a kitchen sink uh, where there is no kitchen sink in the object nav category, uh, explicit category, but we can, we can uh, you know, train and convert an image nav agent into an object nav agent by just doing clip encoding. Um, and this agent will uh, go to the kitchen sink as opposed to the bathroom sink. Which, if you just had sync annotations, those would be both annotated the same. 
and we can do things like find a kinch, uh, find a sink and a stone uh, that works fine too. Uh, and we have some examples uh, that we put out where you know depending on what you say, find a bathroom sink, find a kitchen sink, find a sink and stone, find a sink and toilet. It goes to different places. Uh, so clearly the language is is playing a strong role. Okay, so those are all the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, in summary, you know, I think scaling 3D annotated data, um, you know, procedural generation is awesome. Um, annotated 3D scans are still going to be with us for a while. Uh, so scaling that is pretty, I imagine, uh, boost uh, all approaches. Uh, scaling experiences uh, is, a, is a good way of uh, overcoming um, you know, seeing intelligent search behavior and scaling representations, I think, is going to become much more important going forward. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'm happy to take a question with this on the background that we are organizing a rearrangement challenge at Europe's, and I encourage folks to check that out. Thank you. So one of the questions I did since no one else stepped up, uh, my question would be uh, when you start talking about these ultra control uh, set problems of like finding a CPU and then probably not sure what that means, so I want to make sure. Uh, you mentioned that you weren't sure how we could make what the downstream has. How would we think about a, a set of the future? Can you say that bit again about uh, which part I wasn't sure? You mentioned that saying uh, that there was a version of the paper that was taking around for a certain task, and uh, we had this open set of tasks that we could do. How would you uh, assess? How would you evaluate whether or not the paper is useful? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So, emergent behaviors we can characterize. So in my mind, there are two things. An agent does something interesting, and an agent is more accurate at a task. If those two happen together, I can at least talk about correlations. In order to do causal, sort of make causal claims, I would have to somehow be able to do interventions that I intervene, change something about that behavior or clamp down whenever that behavior happens, and then I see the drop in performance, and that would establish a causal link. So that's why I'm hesitant to make that causal link. How I'd evaluate on open-ended tasks like go to a kitchen sink and go sink and stuff, and that that I think is much more of a operationalizable problem. Like you just need more annotations, and if you had the kind of annotations for kitchen sink and sink and stuff, you'd be able to uh, you'd be able to evaluate. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think we're going to switch at this point to the poster session and. Someone has some instructions on where we're supposed to go, uh, which is which hall we're going to next. Uh, yes. Oh, well, it's very loud. So, uh, everybody with the poster and everybody interested in the poster session, uh, please follow Matt. Matt's at the back. Can you raise your hand? Cool. He's waving it. Uh, so, please follow him to halls D and E um, for the poster session. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Great. Very fun. <laughs> the success number is very impressive. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, when I'm doing better in success, it's always like, oh, yeah, then success is the most important. Yeah, otherwise, it does feel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, hey, Annie. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs>
Hello everyone, my name is Jaffe and I'm from the Institute for Info Com Research at ASTAR in Singapore. Today I'll be presenting on our work, ABCDE, an agent-based cognitive development environment. I'll be presenting this work on behalf of all my co-authors. This is the overall outline of today's presentation. So the motivation uh, behind this work is that, you know, as we know that typically a five-year-old child probably have experienced up to half a million to 50 million different training examples, and which is not too far away from the size of existing AI data sets, such as ImageNet or the YouTube 8 million data set. And throughout that lifetime of uh, growing up, they actually pick up new concepts, uh, conceptual knowledge, such as able to recognize objects, recognize shapes, recognize colors, and even recognize 3D objects. And for language-wise, they'll be able to understand preposition or you know, having some form of development in their sensorial motor activity. So comparing that with current AI system, the current AI system actually focuses a lot of its training in a similar way that as how animal training works. However, conceptual knowledge can be conveyed in a more simplified and abstract way. So in contrary, children are taught and not trained, and educational instructions are designed to convey this idea with clarity and illustrativeness. And as what Professor Yoshi Benji once said, uh, the current state of AI have not yet even reached the intelligence of a two-year-old. So with that in mind, we decided to build a simulator that's able to mimic the naturalistic setting of how a child developed. So with that, you know, there are quite a wide range of work done in Embody AI simulators. Uh, however, a lot of these simulators focus a lot more on robotic tasks. We have simulators such as Habitat Scene, which provides more of a photorealism environment with its Metapod dataset, or AI Tutor with its low-level action control. So where do we position ourselves? We aim to mimic the naturalistic setting for cognitive development in children, which no other environment actually focus on. And we want to focus on the high-level concept learning through a learner and teacher interaction. So we propose the ABCDE simulator. It's a single scene simulator that allows for an unlimited amount of different room configuration through our dynamic scene generation. And furthermore, we provide a wide range of visual data attributes that range from RGB, depth, all the way to surface normal. And we also provide the user with four stationary cameras to provide a full visual coverage of the environment during data collection. And unlike existing Embody AI simulator that focus a lot on robotic system, we actually use a human avatar and a child avatar to mimic the naturalistic movement of a, a, of a child and her parents. And with that, we also use uh, the public domain and the Google Scan object data set to provide up to 300 different 3D object assets, which is primarily toys for kids to play. And we have break them down into two different categories, static object categories and interactable object categories. We also have a language generation uh, module that actually generates the natural language ground truth based on the interaction that occur in the simulation. For direct access, we provide the user with a graphic user interface to control the agent directly, or they can use our Python package to wrap around with their RL APIs. And to help with reinforcement learning policy training, we also have active learning and teacher mode within the simulator. We hope to actually use the simulator for some of these potential tasks, curriculum learning, continuous learning, or even human in the loop learning. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you. This is the reference. Hello, everyone. I'm Ankit Goel, a PhD student at Princeton University. I'll be presenting our paper titled I4, Iterative Flow Minimization for Robotic Object Rearrangement. Let me first describe the problem of rearrangement. The input to the scene, 
a two RGBD images, one from the current scene and one from the target scene. Note that the objects in the scene are unknown to the agent. The objective of the agent is to really Let me pose a question. In order to do rearrangement, what an agent must see? Let's look at an example. From this example, it is clear that the agent needs to figure out how this particular object is going in the target scene. Similarly, it needs to figure out how this particular object is moving from one pose to other. In other words, the agent needs to figure out how the pose of the objects are changing between the two scenes. Great, now the question arises, how can we estimate this pose change? Note that the objects are unseen. Hence, we cannot use the traditional pose estimators because in order to estimate the pose, they need to know the objects beforehand. How about using an object invariant representation like optical flow? Optical flow is per pixel 2D motion between a pair of frames. Actually, it can work, and we can solve rigid body pose transformation of each of the objects if we know the flow and segmentation of the object. But there are still questions left. How can we estimate this flow well? Note that unlike in videos, the flow values are very large. Hence, unfortunately, a traditional flow estimator won't work. How about using a suitable neural flow estimator which is trained with the correct data? Well, actually, it works really well. In fact, it transfers from sim to real in a zero-shot manner. We design a rearrangement system which places flow at the center. In fact, the objective of our system is to take action so as to minimize the flow at each iteration. Hence the name iterative flow minimization. Let's look at the complete pipeline. Given the RGBD of the current and goal scene, we estimate two things. One, segmentation of the current scene, and two, optical flow of the current and goal scene. For segmentation, we use an off-the-shelf unseen object segmentation method. Next, for the flow part, we first build a synthetic data set of, of, for rearrangement using the NVIDIA of the C render. There are about 50, 50k samples for training. For the model to estimate optical flow, we use the neural flow estimator called RAF. RAF was chosen because it compares each pixel to every other pixel in the image. And in theory, it could learn large flow value. And we find that this is empirically true. After estimating the flow and segmentation, we use a multi-view we use multi-view constraints and ransack to solve for the rigid body transformation for each object. These transformations are then sent to a planning module, which take act which takes action based on simple rules. Following, we show an example comparing our model and prior model. In the top is our system I4, and at, and at the bottom is prior state-of-the-art system called Nerd. We can see that our system does a better job at rearranging. We also do blind user studies. We find that I4 is consistently rated to perform good, while prior methods are consistent, are rated to perform not very well. While comparing them one-on-one, -on -one, we find that 92% of the time, user prefer I4 over now. For more details, please check out our project page and visit our Hi, I'm JY and I'll be presenting our work, Simple and Effective Synthesis of Indoor 3D Scenes. Generating 3D scenes from static images has been a long sought after goal in computer vision. Several recent papers have shown viability in this direction, including the Path Dreamer paper, as well as related work in the novel view synthesis space from papers such as SynSyn and PixelSynth. In our paper, we propose a simple, single-stage, end-to-end trainable model 
that synthesizes 3D indoor scenes from one or more static images. Provided with a single input of RGB and depth, our model can reliably generate RGB and depth up to seven meters away in most cases. It is also simple and general enough to work on perspective view images. Without any changes to our core model, it can be trained on perspective images such as from the RE10K dataset and outperforms prior work on these settings. Seeds is a model that achieves state-of-the-art performance while being significantly simpler. It is a single-stage end-to-end GAN and does not depend on semantic segmentation, spate normalization, VQVAE, or differentiable point cloud rendering, unlike previous works. Given an RGBD context image, we project it and store it as a 3D point cloud. This goes into an encoder, which is a ResNet 101 in our case. It is passed into two separate decoders, which produce RGB and DEF, and this entire model is trained end-to-end -end with a GAN loss and an L1 reconstruction loss. Provided with a single input of RGB and DEF, this is first accumulated into a 3D point cloud. We can then predict outputs for any given location away from the context image. And shown here is an example in a point in the navigation sequence 1.4 meters away. Our model first reprojects the RGB points into a 2D image at a new location, creating what we call a guidance RGB and DEF input. This model then infills the guidance RGB and DEF to create dense RGB and DEF predictions at the new location. We observe that in general, our model produces very crisp and high resolution outputs, which are also very plausible for scene completions. The bottom row shows our comparison with PathDreamer, and our model is generally much higher resolution and higher quality. This is despite not using semantic segmentation or multi-stage training that PathDreamer employs. We can also similarly continue to roll out predictions, accumulating predicted points in the point cloud and repeating the process. At 5.7 meters away, predictions from our model continue to remain high resolution and plausible. And at 7.5 meters away, the scene is also generally plausible despite containing a few artifacts. On perspective images from the RE10K dataset, our model can also infill large regions of empty input and outperform prior models such as pixel synth. As seen in the second column from the right, our model generally produces more plausible and interesting completions compared to pixel synth. This strong performance is also reflected in the quantitative metrics, such as the Frechet Inception Distance, or FID. When evaluated on the room-to-room -room indoor navigation dataset, our model significantly outperforms PathDreamer, especially at longer horizons. On Real Estate 10K, our model also outperforms pixel synth, especially on indoor scenes, which is the focus of our work. We also run anonymized human evaluations to ascertain the efficacy of seeds. We present 1,000 randomly generated images from the same input image for our model, as well as PathDreamer and PixelSynth. On Metapod 3D, our model is much preferred with 61.3% of annotators preferring our generated outputs. Similarly, on Real Estate 10K, our model is also significantly preferred with 82.6% preferring our model. During inference time, seeds can also generate continuous video sequences simply by interpolating between coordinates. Shown here are generation results for several examples all synthesized from a single input context. On Real Estate 10K, our model can also perform rotation, translation, and camera trajectory movement. In addition to generation quality, we also evaluate the downstream performance of our model by using it as data augmentation for vision and language navigation, or VLN. We spatially perturb the panoramas contained in the room-to-room -room VLN dataset and infill them with our model. This produces much higher quality augmented panoramas compared to other methods such as standard data augmentation or using Habitat Simulator. With our data augmentation technique, we are able to improve a very strong baseline model by 1.5%, which achieves state-of-the-art success rate in the well unseen environment. We also show that standard image space augmentations, such as those used by SimClear, are ineffective. These results achieve state-of-the-art compared to prior published work on the room-to-room -room leaderboard. It also presents one of the first steps towards training agents in 3D environments generated completely from static images. We would like to thank our co-authors who are listed on this slide. For more information and details, please check out our preprint on archive as well as our demo video. Thank you for your attention. The project we got today for you is generating grounded navigation instruction from landmarks. So the downstream task we are targeting is vision language navigation, moving in a 3D environment from point A to point B on a predefined navigation graph following verbal or textual uh, instruction. The task is very useful in developing conversational navigation tools and instruction following robots that can accomplish various goals like fetching stuff. Um, training for this task, however, requires a lot of data, in particular 
collecting human written instructions at scale is extremely costly. So we want to generate synthetic instructions instead. Uh, click please. Um, this would allow us to scale up at very little cost and we want to create instructions as close to human level quality as possible. Um, so the high level idea is given a sequence of visual views on the navigation path, a generator is learned to produce instructions. Click please. Um, however, directly learning this mapping leads to two main issues in the previous work. First of all, hallucination, mentioning unobserved items or items with wrong features. Secondly, which is related, confusing the model with an information dump of necessary plus unnecessary visuals. Um, in fact, you don't look at everything in the environment while navigating. Next slide, please. So we propose a two-stage approach that resolves both of the, these issues in one go. Um, now with the raw visual input, we introduce an intermediary step, landmarks. These are visual segments that are particularly useful for making navigation decisions, uh, stuff like a table or chair or a particular you know, view. Uh, we do this to filter down the input for the most relevant information for instruction generation. As such, the navigation agent is much less likely to get confused by a mixed information soup and misled into hallucinating. And our findings back this up. Next slide, please. Um, now let's look at, at each stage. In the first stage, we want to train an object detector that maps from raw visual input to landmarks. However, we don't have landmark annotations and because crowdsourcing is extremely expensive, we had to take advantage of two things we already have available in the data we work with. First of all, it's human written instructions. And we also have recorded perspective views on the human agent on the path while navigating. These are a subset of uh, uh, full panorama views. Click please. In step one, we parse instructions to extract object denoting phrases. And in step two, Leveraging Mural, a multilingual extension of the Lang text image model, uh, we use object denoting phrases to sort of fish out the landmark views from human perspective views. Basically, the landmark are a subset, subset of the perspective views, and they do not include anything that the navigator doesn't look at. Now over to my co-author, Cecily. Hi, uh, so now that we've, uh, so next slide, sorry. Uh, so now that we've predicted the best landmarks along given route, we approach the surface realization of a fluent human-like tactical navigation instruction. To achieve this, we found it worked best to interleave the visual landmarks. Uh, these are featureized into mural large embeddings, along with English textual descriptions of their orientation and the actions to traverse between them. So ultimately, this is one templated input representation. So all that's left is to append a prompt designating which language to generate. Uh, as well, we found it helped to include outbound landmarks, indicating the direction of the next panorama. Uh, so now we pass this input into our multimodal, multilingual T5 model. And as you can see, it produces both highly valid and natural sounding navigation instructions. Next slide. So here we've shown the navigation success rate of human workers following our generated instructions. That's uh, in blue alongside the sort of previous state of the art and human instructions. Uh, the previous state of the art was around 42%, but by training on better data, uh, including our model uh, improvements as well as our landmarks, uh, we've improved over the state of the art by around 28% absolute success rate. So we're quite pleased to see the performance from using our marquee generated instructions is already quite close to using human written ones. Uh, next slide. So in summary, we've made solid strides in generating high quality navigation instructions uh, with the ability to dramatically scale up synthetic data generation. And our work has opened up research opportunities to further close the gap on a general class of language in and language out problems. Hello everyone, I'm Shen Qi from the University of Sydney. And today I'm going to share our work toward generalizable audio representations for audio visual navigation. In audio visual navigation, an agent is to move to and stop at a constantly sound making object, such as telephone, based on its audio and visual perceptions. There are a lot of exciting works that improve audio visual navigation in terms of path planning, geometry mapping, and complex scenarios. 
but many of these words cannot generalize too well on navigating towards unfamiliar sounds that are not learned during training. To tackle this problem, we propose audio feature similarity optimization method to alleviate the effects of sound types and focus on learning spatial relationships. So here's the intuition. We can see in these two scenarios, the agents hear very different sounds from a telephone and a speaker. But the similarity of their feature in the latent space should be identical because they imply the same positions of the audio goal. So we aim to maximize the feature similarity between this pair of audios because they're actually the same for the navigation task. On the other hand, in these scenarios, the agent receives audio signals that look very similar, as they're both from a telephone. But still, our method minimizes the similarity between their audio features because they imply very different relative audio goal positions. To make it easier for our optimization process, we simply define a pair of audio expressions to be similar if they are simulated from the same scene, source position, and receiver position. And we directly simulate the second sound in the pair instead of searching for all pairs from the observation. All other pairs will be considered as negative pairs. However, such a formulation could potentially introduce false negative pairs where identical or similar audio observations in the trajectories may be treated as negative samples. To deal with this issue, we also designed a batch sampling strategy where we randomly sample audios from the full batch and compute their similarity. And we hope that this will reduce the number of false negative pairs. And now we have all the positive and negative pairs we need, then we optimize the network with a contrastive learning method. Specifically, we use the info and zero loss, which maximizes the feature similarity between the positive pairs and minimizes the feature similarity between the negative pairs. So putting things all together, we have the following schematic diagram that shows how our method can be deployed to audio visual navigation frameworks. In addition, we also apply two sound augmentation strategies to enrich the training sound distribution. So we reverse the audio with a probability P and mix up to potentially reverse order as the new source of sound. We deploy our methods to two audio vision navigation models and test them on two datasets, Replica and Metaverse 3D. The results show that our methods substantially improve the performance of the baseline models on both datasets with around 12% increase in SPL. By deploying our method to the AVWN framework, we achieve a promising result on the SunSpaces audio vision navigation challenge. To conclude, we propose the method that regularizes the audio encoder to distill goal-driven patterns for audio vision navigation. And our methods can be easily deployed to any audio vision navigation frameworks to improve the generalization on learning audio representations. And that's all. We thank the organizers of the Embodied AI Workshop and the Sound Spaces Challenge. We hope our work help you in your own research. Previous work showed with a very large data set of static scenes, agents can be taught to navigate to a goal coordinate in novel environments using only vision and ego motion measurements using deep reinforcement learning. But static environments are still a far cry from real homes, which can contain interactive objects or moving humans and pets. The difficulty of assembling realistic interactive scenes make them much scarcer than static ones that can be scanned from the real world. To prevent the agent from memorizing and overfitting to a small amount of trained scenes, we introduce several dynamic obstacles modeled as pedestrians that include the environment and must be avoided. Unlike image augmentation methods, this also forces the agent to learn different paths even for the same episode. We find training with this method significantly increases test time success rates in both static and dynamic novel environments. We compare and combine this method against image augmentation methods. We find these methods to be competitive, but combining them with each other only reduces performance, while combining them with dynamic obstacle augmentation does not and even leads to the best success rates. We show that this method is better for sim to sim transfer, and demonstrate its effectiveness by using it to achieve first place in the I Gibson Challenge. Hi everyone, I'll be talking about a CPR 2022 paper, Habitat Web, Learning Embodied Objects or Strategies from Human Demonstrations at Scale. This work was done with my collaborators at Georgia Tech and MetaFair. In this work, we present a large-scale study of imitating human demonstrations on tasks that require an agent to search for objects in new environments. For our work, we consider two tasks. First is Object Now, where an agent is tasked with searching for and stopping at an instance of a goal category. For example, a cushion in an unseen environment. 
Second, we propose a pick and place task in which the code is specified as a line fits instruction. For example, place the toy airplane on the wood block. This is a slightly harder task than object map. The agent has to navigate in an unseen environment, find the toy airplane, pick it up, find the wood block, place the toy airplane on the wood block. We find that large scale imitation of human demonstrations leads to agents learning efficient object search behaviors. Like human demonstration for training imitation learning agents, we built Habitat Web. Habitat Web is a scalable web infrastructure that connects Habitat Simulator to Mechanical Turk users, which allows us to collect human demonstrations for embodied tasks at scale. Mechanical Turk users are provided an instruction in language with access to agent controls and first person RGP views in their web browser. Using Habitat Web, we collect total 92k human demonstrations for both object nav and pick and place tasks combined. We built the infrastructure in a way that allows us to collect demonstrations for any task being studied with Habitat. Compared to prior works, the largest existing datasets have 3 to 7k human demonstrations. In simulation, our dataset is an order of magnitude larger than existing datasets. Use standard CNN plus RNN policy architectures for both object nav and pick and place tasks. To learn policies from these demonstrations, we use behavior cloning. Next, we compare performance of large scale imitation learning with large scale reinforcement learning. We find that IL agents trained with 70k human demonstrations outperform RL agents trained on 240k agent gathered demonstrations on object nav. This effectively establishes an exchange rate that a single human demonstration is worth four agent gathered demonstrations. This comparison is even starker on the pick and place task. IL agents get close to 18% success, while RL agents fail to get beyond 0% success on the task. We also established the first human baseline for these tasks. The success rates suggest that the task is largely doable for humans, but there's still a huge gap between human and machine performance. Next, on object map, we find RL fine tuning of an IL pre-trained policy improves the state of the art further by 8.8% on MP3D object map dataset and 6.6% on HM3D object map dataset. On both the tasks, the success rate versus dataset size plot shows promising scaling behavior, suggesting that simply collecting more demonstrations is likely to advance state of the art further. I'll take a look at some qualitative examples of different efficient object search behaviors that these IL agents exhibit, which are not known to be exhibited by RL agents in the literature. First, we take a look at the peaking behavior on the object nav task. The agent peeks into the part of the living room, looking both on left and right areas of the room before deciding to leave the room to search for object elsewhere. Next, you can see agent demonstrating panoramic turn behavior. Here, the agent turns in place to get the panoramic view of the room before deciding to leave the room. These agents demonstrate multiple sophisticated object search behaviors in a single pick and place episode. Current example of panoramic turn behavior shows agent looking down, taking panoramic turn, and then looking into a room when searching for the object. This is an example of backtracking behavior. Here, the agent sees the object, picks it up, navigates to a bathroom, backtracks using the move backward action and to search for the receptacle elsewhere. The only time when backtracking is known to emerge in RL agents is in the point nav task. In addition, these agents also exhibit other behaviors like checking corners for small objects, beelining to the goal when spotted, and exhaustively searching for the object in an environment. Key takeaways from our work are the large scale limitation of human demonstrations leads to agents learning efficient object search strategies and that these agents outperform RL trained agents on both object and pick and place tasks. Habitat Web can be used to collect demonstrations for any task being studied within Habitat. For more details, please visit the project page. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Artyom. I'm going to present Igloo Grid Wall, a novel reinforcement learning environment for learning embodied dialogue agents. Recently, a ground dialogue collaboration in Minecraft has been proposed. There are two players to the rendering. Hi, I'm Artyom. I'm going to present Igloo Grid Wall, a novel reinforcement learning environment for learning embodied dialogue agents. Recently, a ground dialogue collaboration in Minecraft has been proposed. There are two players that need to collaborate through dialogue to reproduce a structure of blocks, 
The first player is the architect who has an access to the target structure and who needs to provide an instruction for the second player, the builder. The goal of the builder is to follow an instruction to reproduce the structure. Igloo follows a similar setting. The environment initialized with some non-zero initial structure and the contextualized dialog where the last instruction needs to be followed. Also, all prior instructions are meant to be executed and the result is placed into the initial world. The agent should follow an instruction being embodied in the environment. Once the agent is done, the environment compares the result instruction with the target one and evaluate the agent performance. Alternative to that, the agent can ask a clarifying question in case the instruction is ambiguous. Our environment is written in pure Python. It features headless rendering with hardware acceleration. Notably, it's fast. It gives 17 steps per second without rendering in 4,500 steps per second with rendering enabled. The action space implements navigation, placement, braking, and block color selection. The, the observation space consists of 64 by 64 RGB images, inventory state, compass direction, and an instruction to follow with context. In addition, we also provide the buildings of snapshot and the agent position for debugging. To train dialog agent, we collected a dataset in addition to the collaborative dialog dataset. This dataset stats are shown on the slide. We adapt Minecraft collaborative dialog dataset and extract uh, roughly 500 tasks uh, for the RL environment. Also, we collect the structure and dialog dataset specifically to our task. The dataset contains around 600 tasks for the agent. As a baseline for Iglo, we split the instruction following model into two parts. The first one is an instruction target predictor. We find it ahead on top of the pre-trained language model. This head predicts target structure from the instruction embedding. The second part is an instruction execution model. It takes an environment observation to predict an action in direction of the provided target structure. This model is trained using a pure reinforcement learning objective with a handcrafted curriculum. This model is trained in complete isolation from the dataset dialogs. Let's see how we train reinforcement learning agents. First, the dataset task sampler samples a pair of initial and target blocks worlds. Second, the target world state is passed to a subtask generator. This model yields a subtask sequentially block by block. It's implemented using a simple heuristic rule. Each task is then passed to a subtask solver, which is a policy train using a reinforcement learning objective. Once the task is solved, the environment queries a subtask generator for the new subtask. Once the episode is over, the environment queries new task from the task generator. We train the RL model using a high throughput async PPO implementation. After 12 hours of training or 1 billion environment steps, the agent achieved an average success rate of 25%. To better understand how the agent solved tasks, we labeled all structure with embodied skills that are needed to solve that structure. For example, flying structure means that there are blocks that are not connected to the ground by, by touching other blocks. We calculate the F1 score between the target structure and the built one and average metrics per structure skills. But this, uh, despite the agent can build diverse structures, there is still a big room for improvement. Here is an example of baseline agent building structure. The agent exhibits non-trivial behavior by building many supporting blocks uh, along the building process. We compare the Igloo grid world environment with related RL or embodied environments. We show that the main interest of Igloo comes from a certain combination of features, such as the nature of blocks building task and the kind of an agent embodiment. In particular, this combination of feature ops opens a door for many research directions. The task is represented by simple object 3D array of hints and encom encompasses a non-trivial process of language and behavioral collaboration. Such a simple and formal object defining task facilitates progress in reinforcement learning, for example, hierarchical RL or for generalization in RL for skill learning, embodied AI, open-ended learning, and lifelong long learning. See paper for discussion. Thanks for listening. I'm also happy to share that Igloo is also a competition host hosted at New Rips 2022. The competition will be held at AI Crowd platform. If you're interested, please stay for, uh, for the updates.
learning value functions from undirected state-only experience. Offline reinforcement learning focuses on learning intelligent behavior from pre-recorded experience in the form of state, action, next state, and reward quadruples. However, in many realistic application scenarios, action information may not be naturally available, for example, when learning from video demonstrations, or may not even be well-defined, for example, when learning from the experience of an agent with a different embodiment. Motivated by such scenarios, the central questions we aim to tackle in this work are can intelligent behavior be derived from undirected observation streams, and if so, how? We start off by characterizing the outcome of queue learning in settings where we don't have access to ground truth intervening actions in the offline dataset being used for queue learning. We first consider the case of ignoring the actions altogether. Without action labels, one could simply assign all transitions the same label, in which case queue learning becomes TD0 policy evaluation, and the learnt value function may be suboptimal. Next, we study if labeling state, next state, or reward triples with actions from a different action space could aid learning. We show that if the new action space is a refinement of the base action space, Q-learning will recover the optimal value function. The complete proof of this claim has been provided in the paper. We validate these results in a tabular grid world setting, and this analysis motivates the design of our approach for learning behaviors from state-only experience. To this end, we propose latent action Q-learning, or LAC for short. Our proposed pipeline is as follows. We start with a data set of state, next state, and reward triples. Using the latent action learning process, each sample is assigned a latent action. Q-learning on the data set of quadruples produces a value function V of S. And finally, behaviors can be extracted from the value function through densified RL via online interaction with the environment or directly if low-level controllers are available. We describe our methodology for step one and step three of the approach in the next two slides. Given a data set of observation streams, we learn these latent actions through future prediction. We start by passing O sub t through an encoder to obtain a feature vector. This feature vector is then concatenated with different action embeddings corresponding to the different latent actions. This is then passed through a decoder, which produces various reconstructions for the next state. Finally, we compute the L2 loss between the reconstructions and the ground truth next state. Here are some sample loss values. At train time, we backpropagate only on the reconstruction with the lowest loss. At test time, we assign latent actions using argument of the loss over the latent actions, as shown on the slide here. Step 3 involves extracting behaviors from the value function through densified RL or directly if low-level controllers are available. In densified RL, we can use the learned value function to densify sparse reward functions, making previously intractable RL problems solvable. In more specific scenarios, it may be possible to employ hand-designed low-level controllers in conjunction with a model that can predict the next state S prime on executing any of the low-level controllers. In such a situation, behavior can directly be obtained by picking the low-level controller that conveys the agent to the state that has the highest value under the learned value function V of S. We test the effectiveness of our approach at discovering pure action groundings for five different environments. 2D Grid World, Atari Freeway, 2D Maze, 3D Visual Navigation, and Franca Kitchen. We evaluate our proposed approach by first evaluating the quality of the value functions learned through LAC before testing the utility of LAC learned value functions for acquiring goal driven behavior. To evaluate the quality of value functions learned through LAC, we measure the extent to which value functions learned with LAC agree with value functions learned with Q learning with ground truth action information. We measure the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient between the different value functions, which is reported here. We compare to four baseline methods. Single action corresponds to just the value of the policy that collected the data, and does poorly in these environments. Clustering does better, but struggles in challenging environments. Our method does even better, particularly in environments with continuous action spaces and high dimensional states. We also outperform the current state of the art, D3G, while also being more general. We combine sparse task reward with the learned value function as a potential function. The learning plots here show that lack learned value functions speed up learning in the different settings over learning simply with sparse rewards. We also visualize results for 3D navigation using value functions combined with low-level controllers on the right. Lack is able to navigate to the optimal goal, whereas policy evaluation navigates to the suboptimal goal. Finally, 
decoupling the learning of the value function and the policy also enables learning across embodiment, as described in the paper. In conclusion, we studied the problem of batch RL from undirected, state-only data. We first theoretically characterized the applicability of key learning in this setting. Based on this, we proposed LAC. LAC uses a latent action conditioned future prediction model to mine latent actions. Q learning with these mined actions learn good value functions and behaviors can be extracted from these learned value functions. Experimental results in five environments show promising results. Code, data, and models will be made available. Thank you. I would like to welcome you to the presentation about bridging the gap between events and frames through unsupervised domain adaptation. In our paper, we present an approach that can detect cars in an event stream recorded by an event camera without ever seeing a label in the event domain. Event cameras are bio-inspired vision sensors that have gained popularity in various applications ranging from automotive scene understanding to high-speed navigation. However, event camera research is mostly held back by the shortage of labeled datasets, which is a common problem for novel sensors. With our proposed method, we want to tackle this shortage by leveraging large-scale image datasets to train a network on labeled images and then transfer it to events. Previous approaches tackled this shortage by either using image sequences to generate synthetic events or by relying on specialized hardware to record events and images in a synchronized and paired fashion. Instead, our approach transfers from single images to unpaired events. Thus, compared to previous methods, our method can use all of the existing image datasets for the training of event-based networks. To achieve this task transfer from images to events, we use a separate encoder for images and events. The embedding space of the event encoder is split into shared and event features. The shared features should only contain information about the structure and content of the scene, which both event and frame camera can observe. Whereas the event features should contain information specific to the event camera. The shared features are then used to train the task network, visualized here in green. To facilitate transferring a task from images to events, we use an image to events translation based on a single image and the event specific features from a random and unpaired event sample. We validate our approach for the classification task on the NCALTEC 101 dataset and for the object detection task on MBSEC. For the classification task, we outperform existing methods applicable in the unsupervised domain adaptation setting by up to 4.1% accuracy. For the complex task of object detection, we even achieve a relative performance increase of 93% compared to existing methods. On this slide, you can see some qualitative detection results. We want to emphasize again that our detector never sees labels in the event domain and instead leverages labels from high quality image datasets. This also enables the transfer from image labels to events recorded during the night. Because of the high dynamic range of event cameras, our network detects cars in low light conditions where frame-based approaches fail. To summarize. With this work, we have proposed a new framework that leverages labeled images to train event-based neural networks. We show on two tasks applied to two datasets that our method outperforms existing unsupervised domain adaptation methods and even achieves higher performance than some supervised methods. In conclusion, our proposed framework unlocks the potential to use any frame-based dataset to train an event-based network. Please check out our code on GitHub. Hi, I am Zhang Liu from Stanford University. In this video, I present our work, Behavior in Habitat 2, Simulator Independent Logical Task Description for Benchmarking Embodied AI Agents. The success of applying robots in controlled environments, such as warehouses and factories, enlightens the promising future of developing agents providing assistance in uncontrolled environments, such as household tasks. Inspired by the catalyzing role played by the vast amount of emerging benchmarks in other AI domains, the community is looking for new benchmarks for embodied AI. Embodied AI tasks are defined using various different specifications. Geometric, experience, and natural language-based definitions are the most commonly adapted, but they either suffer from tedious hand-design process, 
provide poor generalization or are difficult to transfer to the real world. Language-based representations are easy to design and more interpretable to humans, but natural language-based descriptions are much less concise and challenges the agent with natural language understanding needs. We note that using logic language to define tasks provides more generalizability to different scenes, simulators, and the real world. To that end, we extend the use of logic language task definitions in behavior into Habitat 2 to demonstrate the ease of adapting activities defined in the logic space into different simulators. Behavior is a benchmark set of 100 household activities for evaluating embodied AI agents in simulation defined in the high-level logic space. Although behavior is simulator agnostic, so far it has only been integrated with iGibson 2. Habitat 2 is a popular high-performance simulator that shows a promising testbed for behavior. Currently, Habitat mainly uses geometry-based task definitions to specify the start and goal locations of task-relevant objects and lack abundance in long-horizon household tasks. On top of that, the replica cat dataset released with Habitat only provides limited scene layouts and articulated objects. To benefit from both worlds, we bring 45 out of the 100 behavior activities that involve only kinematic states into Habitat 2 to benefit from its fast simulation speed and equip Habitat 2 with a rich set of household tasks defined in the logic space that can be bonded with both iGibson and Habitat assets. Fully supporting behavior activities in a new simulator imposes five requirements. In this work, we extend the Habitat simulator to track additional object-centric information needed to evaluate activity progress with BDDL. We enable Habitat to use iGibson 2 assets and leverage the sample instances from iGibson 2. We implement the pipeline to evaluate kinematic state predicates with BDDL. Habitat 2 naturally supports requirement 2, but requirement 3 is the current limitation of our effort since we only support kinematic states. Habitat's replica cat dataset lacks abundance in object categories, articulated objects, and scene layouts, despite the richness in carefully designed room configurations. We add support of iGibson 2 scenes and assets to Habitat 2 to provide a far more diverse environment and object set, and in particular, more articulated objects that are essential in real household tasks. Behavior requires seven kinematic states, like next to and on top, and 14 non-kinematic states, like cooked or sliced. In this work, we focus on implementing kinematic states that are essential for many behavior activities. We provide a BDDL backend for Habitat 2 that supports predicate checking for the six listed predicates. This allows agents to perform full behavior tasks. As the agent interacts with the environment, the object-centric information, including contact and adjacency information, is updated in each simulation step to reflect changes in scene semantics. This effort enables a fair performance comparison of iGibson 2 and Habitat 2. We expand the benchmark setting from the Habitat 2 paper to include more clouded environments with more objects and choose scenes from both the iGibson 2 dataset and the replica cat dataset with comparable complexity. We evaluate the simulators on one process on a single GPU, 16 processes on one GPU, and 64 processes distributed across eight GPUs. Our evaluations show that Habitat 2 gives significantly higher speed compared to the iGibson 2 simulator with a maximum of 10.4 times speed up. However, as the number of objects increase, the performance benefit of Habitat 2 over iGibson 2 decreases to 1.5 times or less. In the next steps, we hope to add support of non-kinematic states in Habitat to support even more behavior tasks. Eric et al. trained agents on navigation tasks on 2.5 billion frames leveraging the speedup from DDPPL. To investigate whether more experience resulted from Habitat's fast simulation speed also brings an improvement to the agent performance on long horizon manipulation tasks, we plan to perform more experiments comparing the performance of agents trained in both iGibson and Habitat. Thank you. Learning to navigate in interactive environments with the transformer-based memory. In this work, we studied the problem of interactive visual navigation. As robots are more often deployed in unstructured environments such as homes and office, considering physical interaction part of the navigation strategy becomes not only avoidable but necessary. Our agent learn to change the environment to navigate more efficiently to their goals. In the task, the agent has to reach the goal location while the path to the location is blocked. 
We show the goal location in blue circle, the location of the agent in red circle. The obstacles are the shoes and toy, for example. In this example, the agent is to push the obstacles out of the way so that it is able to reach the goal location. The highlights of this work are as follows. Firstly, we formulate the interactive visual navigation as a partial observed marker of decision process. Secondly, we propose a transformer encoder to learn a brief state which captures the long spatial tempo dependencies of the aggregated observations in the memory. Moreover, we propose a surrogate objective to predict the next waypoint, which facilitates the representation learning and bootstraps the reinforcement learning. The memory is initialized as an empty set at the beginning of each episode. During the robot exploration period, we maintain the MT in fixed length by storing the embedding of the current observation. We modify the position of the layer normalization to reconstruct the attention block. The memory is initialized as an empty set at the beginning of each episode. Therefore, the embedding of the current observation can directly follow through the attention block without any transformation, which stabilizes the transformer-based reinforcement learning algorithm. The mask is a function calculated according to the dimension of the memory. The transformer encoder comprises a stack of attention blocks where the output of each attention block can be viewed as a query over the next attention block. The optimal shortest path between the agent and the goal is discretized into several waypoints. Intuitively, if the state representation is sufficient for the optimal navigation policy, it should preserve enough information for the prediction of the next waypoint. Accordingly, the prediction of the next waypoint can be regarded as the surrogate objective to optimize the state representation. As shown in this picture, the red point denotes the start point of the agent. The blue point denotes the end points of the goal location. The red circle denotes the waypoints. The red line denotes the shortest path to the goal location. The black arrow denotes the start direction of the agent. The blue arrow denotes the direction to the next waypoint. Accordingly, the loss function of the surrogate objective to predict the next optimal waypoint contains two components, the angle prediction of the waypoint and the distance prediction of the waypoint. During the training stage, the waypoints sampled from the shortest path can be calculated by A star algorithm on the global map information. Therefore, we can minimize the KL divergence between the first optimal waypoint given the state and the probability distribution of the output of the prediction network. The interactive Gibson environment with interactable objects from the Google Scanned Objects dataset. The results are shown in the table. Randomly sampling the policy from the action space is impossible to work. Notably, our method outperforms the baselines in SR, SPL, and INS, while the double E is slightly lower because of the increasing interaction. Particularly, the success rate increased by over 10% compared to the best of the baselines. The comparison with baselines justifies the effectiveness of our method. For the ablation study, the performance of hours without loss theta drops noticeably, which indicates that the angle prediction is important when the robots plan the route. The performance of hours without brief state encoder ablation decreases because the temporal information in the memory is essential for the robot to fully understand the environment and overcome the problem of partial observation. In conclusion, with a transformer encoder, the robot can capture the long spatial tempo information from the memory to decide whether to push the obstacles or not. The length of the memory is crucial as the longer memory contains more details 
while shorter memory can ensure the faster convergence of the transformer encoder. The proposed methods can also be generally applicable to point navigation, object navigation, or even vision language navigation. Thanks for your listening. If you have any questions about our method, don't hesitate to contact us by email.
Hello, hello. Cool. Do you think it's good? Uh, I think maybe talk a little more. Oh, I see. Hello? You like no? It seems hello. I think it's okay. Yeah.
Great, thank you. So I unmute myself maybe. Do you hear an echo or we're good? Okay. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to discuss two reasons. Just point it a little bit more here at your face. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's much better. Great. So, can we mute the, the laptop? I think the laptop is also like the, the volume motor. We'll stop it. Yes, yes. It comes from somewhere, right? Great, great, yes, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I want to discuss some recent works we have in my lab on embodied agents. Uh, the dream and uh, is very coming from the theme of the workshop is how do we build embodied artificial home assistants that go to uh, our home and help us clean up, communicate with us and so on. Uh, the question is what are the right proxy tasks towards getting there? Uh, two things that I will discuss in this talk are uh, the following. The first is the task of tidying up a novel scene. Uh, imagine you have a cleaning assistant, like a, whole, a human one, imagine like that we, uh, many times we, we do. And uh, when the, the, the cleaning assistant, uh, he or she comes to your home, you don't want to spend time and explain uh, to her or him where everything goes. You expect that the other person has some common sense of where to place things in your house when he's tidying up. So the question is, how do we go about doing the same thing with a robotic assistant? Uh, tidying up is a very um, broader task to scene rearrangement. Uh, potentially, you already all know, but instead of just, you know, having seen the same scene and then the same scene de re dearranged and you want to bring it back to its initial configuration, here I just throw you in a messy place, in a messy room, and uh, you are tasked to tidy it up. And um, the second work, which is again inspired by the theme of the workshop, is we really need uh, robots to be able to communicate with us, understand our language, and so on. So the question is, how can we push uh, language understanding and specifically grounding of referential expressions to visual cues? How well do we understand when a human tells us, you know, the, my dog under the bed and so on? How can we go and localize that? So these are the two things that I uh, want to discuss. So the first, uh, part, which is also closer uh, to, to the theme of the workshops about uh, tidying up. And this was work done by Gabe uh, Sarsh, a CMU PhD student. Uh, so the task is as follows. I throw you in the scene, and the scene is messy, and the remote control is on the floor, and then the robot needs to detect the objects, um, pick them up, figure out where to place them on its own from its common sense, and go ahead and manipulate it to the target location. And uh, this should happen from uh, its sensory input, directly from uh, onboard perception, okay? Uh, we'll assume uh, for the part of the talk that the ground truth depth is available and ground truth ego motion, and later we'll relax those assumptions, okay? Uh, the same task was recently proposed on the paper of Housekeep, the, the, the uh, tidying virtual household using common sense reasoning. And that paper, you know, proposed the task, showed the training data and so on, but assumed ground truth uh, perception of where the objects are and where the state is and so on. And here we're going to see how we can do the same things directly from uh, pixels. Okay. Uh, so first of all, how do we go about this task? What we did is we went to AI4, and uh, I think this is the most important part that we have these simulation environments that we can experiment with. Because if we didn't have access to them, then none of us would be here today to discuss uh, about um, embodiment. Uh, and then we started with AI4 rooms and started pushing the objects with random forces uh, around to make them messy. Now, we are investigating of how to do such a messiness in a more human, intelligent, and plausible way. For example, the remote control, usually you don't find it on the floor, you find it in the kitchen because you went to eat chips while you were, you know, watching TV and so on. So, you know, improving the training data is also part of, of, of the thing we're looking at. But 
so, so, so here's how things look like. So here's the robot and it moves around and it builds a map, um, just a standard geometric, um, geometrically um, aware stitching of, um, one sec. Yeah, so, so our uh, agent is called Tidy from Teachable Interactive Decluttering Embodied Explorer. And, and clearly the words have been chosen to make a Tidy acronym. But, but what it does is, uh, it's a very, very straightforward baseline for this task, which is the following. You have an agent, a robot moves around, build geometric semantic maps, uh, which means it uses the depth to compute occupancy of space. It runs an object detector and it has an object memory. And because from the depth from 2D box, it instantiates a 3D bounding box for the objects and with the labels, detects objects that are out of place, figures out where they should be placed and go ahead and executes the corresponding manipulation. So the first thing, which is also a, a follow up on uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, work of Divindra and uh, Saurabh and so on, is building the semantic map, okay? We're building the semantic map, which is standard uh, neural ASLAM uh, techniques. Now, once you spend some time exploring the environment, then what you do is you go ahead and uh, you find the out of place object. So you run your detector and then you, for some, objects for every object you detect you want to classify is this in the right place or is it out of place so how do we do this out of place detection uh we build them up we find them one for every bunny box we detect we feed it into a classifier this classifier takes into account both visual cues as well as contextual relationships of this object so how do we represent those contextual relationships well we <clears throat> in language actually so a big part of those home assistants is that uh, a human should come and tell you, do not put my remote control in the coffee table. I always want it next to the, you know, sandwich maker. So for the robot to be able to communicate this and adapt its common sense priors, those common sense need to be able to express also in such a, a symbolic language form. So here our out of place detector has two pathways, the visual pathway, what you see on the top, that is directly the features from the object detection bounding box, as well as a language embedding obtained from feeding, you know, the paragraph to a BERT model. And that paragraph is essentially um, obtained simply by running our uh, special relationship detector on our 3D object memory and figure out what is on top of the object, what is next to the object, in which room the object is, and so on. Okay. Uh, another very big uh, plus of having those language uh, classifiers is without seeing any visual environment, because I told you that, uh, you know, usually soaps are in the bathroom. You can learn each time you see a soap that is not in the bathroom in the kitchen, you know that it is out of place. So you don't need visual data to learn uh, those common sense priors if you have those language pathways. And, and the very simple task is, is this in place or not? So now the agent has found a, an object and that object is not in place because actually it's a sponge and it's on the table, it seems here. So then the next thing is to figure out where to place it. So how do we encode common sense placement locations? Um, well, we use uh, what you see here, uh, a graph, a memory graph. So that memory graph is comprised of two parts. Uh, the blue and the green. The blue part of the graph has been constructed from a lot of training houses. So here's the training rooms and we take, we take ground truth objects. Every object in each of those training rooms is a node on the graph. The edges represent special relationships, for example, on top of, aligned with, next to, and so on. So you have, uh, let's say, five different edge types. Uh, so just to be clear, an object the nodes are not object categories here. The nodes are object instances, okay? So the same category, we have multiple nodes because there are multiple plausible locations for an object. For example, books can be in bookcases or they can be stacked on the coffee table and so on and so forth, right? So, so this memory, this associative memory is trying to capture every plausible context, uh, assuming that the AI4 environments are actually uh, tied up, okay? It, which is the case. So we call this the memex from inspired by the 2009 paper from Alyosha Efros that 
argued that contextual relationships should not be built on the categorical level of object categories, for example, where our books are supposed to be or where cars are supposed to be, but rather should take into account visual features. So every node here is the language description, the, the category, as well as its visual descriptor. And how do we do inference in this memory? How do we do inference to figure out where to place the out-of-place object? Well, we have another graph, which is the current scene graph. And every node in the scene graph is objects detected in our present scene, okay, during our exploration phase. And then we have a special node, which has a special indicator as the out-of-place object. It's an object that we detect that is out of place. And this out of place is object node is linked to all the objects in the present scene and is linked only to the same object category nodes in the memex. And uh, again, we connect similar object categories from the scene graph to the memory graph to allow uh, things to propagate now and during uh, graph convolutions, all right? So this is a, you know, sparsely connected graph where which whose weights of the graph convolution network are trained end to end to predict plausible context for the out of place nodes. And the right way to represent context is in a non parametric way. However, this is the first implementation and the context here as classify, give me the category label of the receptacle you'd like to find this out of place node on. All right, the, the right thing to do is to index directly and attend in your memory and say, oh, I think this point should be placed similar to that point in your memory. But 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 here we just have a explain classifier. So so this memory indexing operation is trained end to end from predicting the receptacle to out of place, uh, from predicting the receptacle all the way to training the weights of that memory indexing operation. And uh, as I said, training data for to train this is from the scenes that we created by pushing objects around. Okay. So, so now, once you figure out that where you want to place the object, now you need to find that. For example, if it's a coffee table, you need to go find that coffee table and place the object where it's supposed to go. Now, there are two cases here. Either the coffee table has been already detected in the present scene and is part of your object memory, or it's not. If it's part of your object memory, you just navigate to it with your standard navigation routines, okay? <clears throat> and place it. If you haven't found the coffee table yet, then you have another network in which you feed, they take the current uh, 3D feature map of the scene, okay, that has also the objects detected in it, and as well as an embedding of the object category you're looking for, for example, a garbage or the coffee table, a garbage can or the coffee table, uh, and so on. And it spits out a heat map of where you think that object should show up, okay? So basically, this also encodes common sense. Given this scene that you see, this particular object category, where does it usually show up? And as you see here, there, there is red for where usually garbage cans can be found in the scene. And then you can do no maximum suppression and go to search to each one of those locations, okay? So common sense priors are encoded both on the weights and the memory, the, the structure, and the weights of the memex for plausible context inference, as well as in this um, network, right, that suggests locations for object categories. And uh, here is some visualizations from that network. And indeed, you see that it can totally uh, adapt to different uh, category labels and so on. These predictions vary dramatically with different uh, uh, labels. So, so, so this is how things look like. So here is a tidy that in the beginning, it just goes and detects objects and uh, explores the scene. And then it picks up objects that it thinks are out of place. And then it indexes in its memory, its associative memory to figure out where to place them. Oh, the map should go in the sink. And now it's trying to find the sink, which is actually the, the sink is found in your object memory. So you don't need to query your a search network or where to place it. And you go and put it back where it's supposed to go. Okay, a very straightforward pipeline. Uh, all right, and, and you continue. Then you find the next object that you think it's out of place. And uh, now again, you for this other object, you index into your memory, you find the right receptacle uh, where to place it. And the countertop, uh, well, the countertop is not in your, in your object memory, so you haven't found it yet. So you need to use your 
search network to suggest to you plausible locations, and then you sample for the uh, for the heat map, and then you go and find it and, and place the object, and you continue in this way. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Um, and, and here is now the uh, the evaluation part. So we had um, a lot of thought of how to evaluate this pipeline. And, and the reason is that there are multiple common sense placements for an object category. So considering as uh, the evaluation metric, the distance from where an object was placed in the simulator would be incorrect thing to do because there are multiple locations on the counter, for example, that the object can show up or they're either on the counter or on the coffee table and they're both plausible. So instead of having, uh, you know, uh, uh, we actually use human evaluators in Amazon Mechanical Turk. So what we did is uh, we went to AMT and we showed two scenes, our rearranged from tidy, all right? So our result versus a baseline. And we saw how many people would prefer our rearrangement versus the rearrangement of the baselines. So what are those baselines? Uh, well, the first one, uh, there is an Oracle baseline and this Oracle is the AI for placement. Uh, and the AI for placement is you take the initial uh, scene, okay? We, we would never be able to do better because we learn how to place objects. We learn how to tie up scenes by imitating AI for placements. Um, and indeed, only 33% of people prefer tidies, uh, tied ups over the initial AI for placement because the initial hormone is the ground truth placement. Now, random receptacle, the, the messy placement is uh, the original room after we do the uh, random forces where we misplace different objects. And indeed, 94% uh, of people like our rearrangement over the initial messy rearrangement. So this is a sanity check. A random receptacle is uh, essentially you just grab a random receptacle for the object and you place it there. And common memory is what if you just look at your training set and see this particular object category is placed over what other receptacle category and you take the mode. So we beat the baseline by almost five points, which is not that much, but it shows you how the visual features and the visual context do play a role on selecting where to place an object. Okay. So these are some uh, evaluations here of tidy. Now the same, uh, we evaluated our out of place detector and you can see here that combining a language and visual features together outperforms uh, visual features alone or contextual relationships alone. Okay, this is the Dieter OOP out of place is only using visual features and the bird out of place only uses the language description of the paragraph of the contextual relationship of the object. And uh, the visual search network helps you explore better, helps you do more targeted exploration than just uh, wandering around randomly in the scene, trying to find a particular acceptable category. And, and here uh, is what we did. We tried to repurpose tidy for the scene rearrangement task. Now repurposing tidy for the scene rearrangement established very much, basically all the interesting components of tidy go away, which means you don't need an associative memory anymore because the memory is given to you by uh, the walkthrough phase. So for those that don't know the scene rearrangement benchmark, um, let me describe it in two sentences. I give you a scene and you have a walkthrough phase where your robot goes around and observes the scene. Then that scene goes away. And then I give you a new scene where some of the objects have been removed or misplaced. And the robot needs to go around in the same scene, find those objects that have been misplaced and place them back to the original locations. Okay. So your common sense memory is essentially the memory from the first scene. The, the ob okay. So you, we are operating on a same identical scene. Uh, so we're detecting the objects, the, the robot detects the objects, matches them to the objects in the first scene, describes them based on their contextual relationships. And if those contextual descriptions are different, then this is indicated as an out-of-place object and goes and relocates them. So we have a 2% uh, success rate, which is not uh, a lot, okay? But it is more than the previous baseline, um, okay? And with noisy pose, and estimated depth, this success rate actually drops uh, even more, okay? Uh, so, so this was one of the, the first paper that was published on that benchmark. Now the numbers are different and I'm gonna show you in the next slide. So what I get from noisy pose and estimated depth is that metric approaches, 
approaches that build metric max potentially are not the right long-term solution for, for embodied task. And indeed, there are fantastic papers that use node-based uh, maps that do not require metric information throughout the whole house. Now, having said that Astro of Amazon does seem to build pretty excellent metric uh, maps. So, I, I mean, it's hard to, to know what eventually is going to happen. Um, yeah, so, so, so let me show here. These are the, the same numbers in the 2022 test set, which is slightly different from 2021. So here is again the 2%. Now this fixed trick is a more lenient metric that tells you, you don't need to have fixed all objects in this particular scene. If you have fixed, let's say 30%, then you'll have 30% success. And I'm gonna show you how you can win that um, benchmark. So here's how you can win. There is actually a bug, which is the following. Uh, once there is a receptacle that can open and close in the first scene, okay? For example, the fridge or the drawer, consider all objects that open and close, okay? Then in the second scene, if you go and try to open it, then this uh, receptacle doesn't actually open if it was closed in the first uh, scene. So if you try to open the drawer, but the drawer was closed in the first scene, then the drawer is not gonna open. So the winning strategy here is go and find all your receptacles that can close and open and go and open them. Because if they were closed, they will stay closed. And if they were open, they will open and you will win. And indeed, this is the best number in the benchmark, which uh, we figured it out after the competition ended, but this is not a research significant number. It's just something tiny that, uh, you know, the, the engineers will fix in the simulator, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Um, okay, so this is about tidying up. This um, uh, tied up assistant could not speak, could not communicate at all with humans. I would like to communicate with my embodied assistant, okay? Uh, so now we'll discuss a work about how we can, you know, have state-of-the-art uh, grounding on visual cues, referential expressions. Expressions of the following form. Bring me the clock on top of the shelf. Okay, so this clock is too high for the robot, depending on how high your robot is, but do you understand what I'm saying? So I should be able to refer to different objects and the robot should be able to understand what I am referring to, okay? So, so this is a work we did, we, uh, that, and we observed the following thing. M most approaches on this task, what they do is they run a detector like that. This detector has a very high vocabulary, has been trained from a lot of different categories and we have lower threshold. And then they cast such grounding problem as selecting one of those detections. So this detector doesn't know anything about language. It operates completely bottom up, okay? And it turns out that this detector fails. It actually doesn't find the clock, okay? So, so basically you're upper bounded by how well your detector is working. You're, as we call it also box bottlenecked. You're bottlenecked by your detector. So the same thing happens in point clouds, which are more relevant for our embodied agents. You tell me the bottle on top of the bathroom vanity, I run my 3D object detector, 3D objectors are not that good, and so the bottle is not there, okay? And so, so instead, what we designed is a bottom-up, top-down uh, um, transformer uh, detector, okay? We call it beauty detector from B-U-T-D detector, okay? Uh, that does the following thing. It looks at the point cloud or image and uh, encodes this into different patches or points, depending on if it's an image or a point cloud, but also it has access to a bunch of boxes produced by a detector, bottom up, a CNC guided detector, as well as in the language. Okay, so we also encode the language into different content contexts with some text encoder, pre trained language model. Okay, and then those three different streams cross it with one another. And then I use now these contextualized features to fit them into a decoder. And, and then I'm going to have an exactly a detector head, a head that is exactly similar to a detection transformer, which means I'll have my queries and some of those queries will decode bounding boxes and some of them will assign to nothing. And those that actually decode bounding boxes are going to go and match to the noun phrases of the language stream. And the noun phrases are obtained with a chunker. Okay, so they're outside of that model. Or you assume that you have a chunker that given your language phrase, detects all possible noun phrases. So, so what does this uh, do? 
Well, first of all, it attends to the bottom upstream. It does look at the saliency bonding boxes. So you don't need to learn detector from scratch, but instead of selecting from those boxes, it instead decodes boxes again, right? So it just contextualizes features to go back and detect boxes, even boxes that may not have been there in your object detection proposals. Another thing that we come up with is we can, instead of having two separate tasks of object detection and language grounding, we can think of object detection as grounding of single labels, for example, couch, person, chair. And this creates more training data for you instead of just training from uh, referential utterances. And you see that uh, this architecture outperforms the previous state of the art by a large margin and outperforms uh, an MD that equivalent of um, a model from a 2D uh, that I was actually uh, were very inspired by and were concurrently uh, figuring out how to do non-box bottleneck language grounding architectures. And it is right now the state of the art by a big margin with the previous approach on language grounding in 3D point clouds. Uh, so you see here the different metrics. Um, and, and that's it. I, I don't have more time to go into details. But it, it seems to me that this is a very important task for being able to communicate with an embodied agent to actually localize uh, the visual cues. This works both in point clouds and 2D images and gets state of the art or close to state of the art performance um, as well in uh, the 2D domain. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions in the next uh, three minutes that we have left. I have a quick question um, about uh, your, so we all have been working a lot in our uh, simulation environment. I wanted to hear your thoughts, what do you think is the way to get uh, these uh, timing of all this to do with the other world? Great. So uh, I don't have a very good uh, idea of this because our robots are still so behind, but my colleague Chris Atkinson had a fantastic idea. He said, put a camera on a human, and now you can test an algorithm in a real environment by putting, so you assume that the human is a robot, and the algorithm tells him exactly what to do, move straight, turn left, and so on. And you know, when it says pick up something, then we'll try to pick it up, okay? And uh, you can use the human hands, and you can assume you can have a manipulator later for this. But if you want a quick thing that you can put in your next CVPR paper, I think this is a fantastic idea. There is embodiment through a human, um, you know, mediator, let's say. Uh, now, having said that, I do see that the companies are very interested in this. There is already things on the market with very nice, interesting interfaces. Um, I do believe that, at least from my experience with the rearrangement challenge, which is such a simple task, is, um, uh, well, okay, you, there are two sides on this, uh, whether the perception and manipulation capabilities are good enough or not. Once the perception capabilities don't need to be able to handle all houses, while the humans are far away, the robot should be able to go there around and detect all possible instances, because anything that looks difficult from far away, if you go close and you find the right viewpoint, you will always be able to segment it and label it. Um, so, so I think... I think these are these are my thoughts that we can do something, but I, I do believe that uh, we need collaboration from companies to, to have uh, real agents that will really be able to put our architectures on them. I, I think till then the simulation environments uh, make sense. Uh, these are don't have manipulation. These manipulations abstracted, but there are other simulators that do have manipulation capabilities. There. As much as I want to ask you a question about gravity, I think we have the time, so I'll reserve it for the uh, for this.
All right. Can you guys hear me now? Hello? I was muted. Sorry. Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. I was uh, I wasn't allowed to unmute myself for a while. So let me uh, share my screen first. Is this okay? Fantastic. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, thanks for the invitation um, to all the um, organizers and uh, happy Father's Day for whoever is in the audience uh, and who is a father. Uh, I'm Fei Fei. I'm from Stanford. And uh, today uh, I want to share a little bit of uh, a very much uh, um, fresh out of the oven uh, work. Um, part of this talk is actually unpublished work under review on a new robotic learning benchmark for um, a thousand human activities. Let me just start by um, sharing a quote that I really like and also underscores why someone um, in the CVPR community as well as myself is so uh, intensely interested in robotic learning these days. It's from um, Peter Godfrey Smith, one of um, he wrote one of my favorite books these years. Uh, he says, the original and fundamental function of the nervous system is to link perception with action. And I think this underscores the critical uh, um, uh, linkage between seeing and doing things, which is uh, uh, a lot of that in machine intelligence is robotic learning. So that's what's been motivating um, my own work in uh, vision as well as robotic learning. And of course, connecting the world of perception and action, there's a lot to be done. And, and a lot of uh, speakers in this uh, panel, in this workshop, as well as uh, this conference are, are doing a lot of incredible work in robotic learning. And our lab has been working on, you know, representation of, of uh, um, uh, aspects or different tasks like uh, curiosity-based learning, uh, task-driven learning, and so on. But I have to say that uh, uh, more and more um, as we work in robotic learning, I personally feel um, there might be a key missing piece. And I hope for the rest of the talk to convince you that we're making some progress towards this key miss missing piece. Let's just uh, look at what is the current success of uh, robotics uh, as an industry. I think it's fair to say that most of the success is in highly structured setups for uh, industry robots. Um, but much of the work in um, today's robotic research is actually focusing on unstructured environment because that's what's exciting for us as machine learning and robotic learning people. And um, But many of the cu uh, current uh, seminal work in the past few years has mostly been focusing on skill level tasks and short horizon goals. And um, uh, while this is really an, an essential step towards the final dream, however you define it, um, it, is, it does have its limitations. Here's just a couple of uh, examples from my own lab. And you can see, uh, despite the fact that these papers are getting, uh, you know, oral presentations, getting to top tier conferences, I, I have to admit um, most of this work is done in small scale and anecdotal uh, demos. Um, the tasks are, are mostly picked by the authors of the papers. Uh, it, most robotic learning um, um, set up lack a standard measurement metric, um, and it's just highly individualized um, right now. And this is, uh, I observed that in my own work, as well as uh, frankly, a lot of even wonderful work in the, in, in, in the rest of the field. And of course, if we continue on this path, we will hit um, walls. You know, if you put a robot into 
a, an unstructured environment, even a simple task like placing a, a box on a shelf can become quite disastrous. And we are nowhere near that distant dream of just uh, enjoying um, robots doing work for us. So with this, um, with this in mind, um, you know, there's the dream, but there's the reality. We've been thinking a lot about what's the next, you know, big goal for robotic learning. And frankly, there has been a lot of inspiration from other related fields like NLP and computer vision, that big North Star goals have been um, useful in driving uh, successes and progress uh, in the field. So there has been actually good, uh, some initial work in robotic uh, learning benchmarks. Um, I'm not going to be able to um, you know, uh, uh, go in detail of all of these different work. Um, they are starting to advocate for diverse task set, realistic task set in uh, different uh, in realistic settings, going towards longer horizon tasks, and defining better metrics. But still, these efforts are still relatively small and uh, lack certain dimensions that's important. So honestly, here's what's going on. We see the big dream. We're part of this uh, you know, collective effort of making progress in, in robotic uh, uh, learning. We, we also see the opportunity of pushing ourselves as well as hopefully our colleagues towards um, a more profound and, uh, and uh, uh, bigger goal or, or, or a, a new North Star. And so where should we be going? Um, I'm just going to uh, cite someone that has been inspiring for a lot of our work. It's JJ Gibson's um, um, incredible insight of why ecological um, approach to perception is so important. And, and I'm expanding it here to robotic learning. Someone has once uh, summarized JJ Gibson's um, philosophy in perception is ask not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside of. And in the spirit of an embodied AI um, um, you know, research, it's not just your head, it's also your body. So really ask what is your body and head inside of. This is where we really want to push embodied AI uh, research. Well, what is the real world that we want our robot to be inside of? That is what JJ Gibson is asking us to think about. Um, let me just propose that human environments, like homes, houses, is one really good candidate. Um, it's a important environment, and it's a very, very uh, cluttered environment. And on top of that, there are a lot of tasks to be done in such environments. So in summary, um, you know, an, a human household environment is very challenging because it's ecologically um, complex, it's dynamic and uncertain, it has huge variability across any of these environments, uh, it's interactive and social. So uh, towards good embodied AI, we need to solve that problem of working with humans and working um, collaboratively for humans. And it's inevitably a, a multitask. It's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of tasks. This environment is frankly very, very daunting for today's uh, uh, robotic learning uh, embodied AI systems. We're nowhere near in operating a physical robot in this environment and do useful tasks. So, but that's where we want to gear our North Star towards. And here's just a teaser video to show you that we have uh, uh, built a uh, uh, benchmark called Behavior 1K for everyday household activities in virtual interactive and ecological environments. And it's, um, it's aimed towards uh, inviting research to, uh, to solve these truly human mattered uh, uh, long horizon tasks. What you're seeing in video is a um, literally a very, very new uh, rendering of what 
one of these environments look like and, and what our robot can do. Every We have a large amount of object ac assets that are highly interactive. I'll get into all the details, but this is the kind of rendering you're seeing um, in our simulation environment. So with that go in mind, we, we actually um, had from the get-go uh, design some features that truly matter to this robotic learning benchmark. Uh, large scale and diversity matters, uh, ecologicalness, realism, and uh, the, 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 the ability to support generalization really matters, complexity, um, in the in 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 the uh, order of however humans are able to uh, do um, matters, and of course uh, how we evaluate what metrics we should use matters. So these are the critical dimensions that uh, ha have been guiding us in designing this benchmark. I want to double click on these two critical dimensions. One is the large scale and di diverseness. The other one is the realism and. Con con complexity. So in a, in a nutshell, um, we have pushed the, the, the envelope of large scale and diversity to a thousand robotic task activities to, to benchmark. And they are, um, um, they are distributed across 50 large scale real world scene layouts of eight types of scene. And I'll go to the details later uh, using um, more than a thousand object categories, uh, thousands of object asset models, uh, and uh, and of course, because it's in simulation, you have infinite infinite way to um, um, instantiate the environment, for, uh, both in terms of lighting, texture, arrangements, and and so on. And on, on the on the ecological real, realism side, we really uh, put a lot of effort in, um, in uh, um, ensuring photorealism, kinematics and dynamics, um, uh, different object states, flexible materials, deformable bodies, fluids, um, you know, thermal effects, um, as well as the realism of distributions of objects and, and, and activities. So these are the dimensions that we spend a lot of time when we design behavior. So let's just start with one question. What tasks are we choosing to, to represent a thousand human activities? This is actually non-trivial. And this we try to get out of the 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 um the old way of doing things, which is a bunch of experimenters uh, deciding there is um, a handful or a couple, a couple of dozens of tasks. How do we uh, make it a principled approach? And our principle is not just about sampling. It's really about what is the bottom line and, and, and goal of robotics uh, uh, research. Uh, we, we're not ignoring a very important social dimension is are we doing research and work to replace humans? This, this kind of human-centered question is really important for, our, uh, for guiding the social and ethical um, considerations of our research. Um, it is a very, very valid question, even though there are much more nuanced studies in, in economics and, and, and labor market that, that paints a much more uh, complex picture than just this kind of news headline articles. In the meantime, uh, in my own research, actually in healthcare and others, it's really incredible to observe that the, the caretaker um, uh, market globally is, uh, is in shortage, both because of aging, the, the population is aging, as well as um, important aspect of unpaid labors for care caretaking predominantly fall on women and pe people of color and how we can how can we um, you know uh, uh, alleviate and, and help in these uh, contexts so there is an important question to be asked is can robots help and we ask that question we ask um, a large number of people we survey um, 
uh, uh, thousands, uh, uh, 15, almost 1,500 of them. What, where do they prefer help from robots? What we did is we uh, sampled uh, about 2,000 daily activities collected by US and Europe governments and, uh, and uh, uh, that, that tabulated or, or collected statistics of what people, humans uh, uh, do. Um, and, and we asked uh, our survey users, how much would you benefit if a robot did this for you? Um, we have some statistics of both demography and, 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 and other uh, information on the population we, we survey to ensure as much diversity as, um, as possible. Uh, long story short, the answer is really interesting. There is a diverse, um, a there is a wide distribution of the answer. And if you look at the, the, the plot on the left, um, um, there are tasks that people prefer doing themselves. For example, play squash, buy a ring, mix baby cereals. These are tasks that are, are you know, not only physical, it's emotionally important for people. But but predominantly, there are tasks that humans would love to get help, especially cleaning tasks, some cooking tasks, and so on. So what we did is we understood the distribution. Then we take the top 1,000 tasks that people have scored highly in terms of wanting robot or would benefit from robot assistance. And that's what behavior uh, 1K is uh, focusing on. So with these tasks selected, we have to uh, um, um, use a language, uh, a user-friendly language to define um, the logic of the task so that we can define the initial and goal conditions of any activity. And this is our work we call BDDL. And uh, it's based on a predicate lo uh, 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 logic. And we, we've published this part of the work in a preliminary work called Behavior 100 in, in Last Coral. And uh, with BDDL, the 1,000 selected tasks and together with human annotators, as well as uh, large language models like GPT-3 annotation, we are able to fully define um, the 1,000 tasks and uh, the initial goal condition and the logic of these tasks. So that's the, the setup of Behavior 1K. Now we're ready to create, um, now the next step is how do we, uh, how do we actually create it? What is what are the things and objects? So we uh, um, collected a data set of more than a thousand object categories and more than three thousand object asset three D object asset models, and uh, it's really important that there's a, a diverse set of properties uh, attached to these uh, objects. For example, in the meat uh, object has properties like cookable, sliceable, freezable, burnable, deformable. Um, the cooking temperatures can be defined and, and, and so on. Articulated objects are annotated to allow interactions such as join type, origin access limit, and so on. And this is again uh, done towards ensuring the ecologicalness of this uh, benchmark. Um, in terms of Seeing environment, we limit to indoor scenes. We have uh, scanned uh, or data from 50 real environments across eight types of scenes, houses, hotels, stores, restaurants, schools, gardens, oh, there's one outdoor, uh, halls and offices. And you're seeing examples here of how um, cluttered, realistic um, these scenes are. So now we have, I, I quickly I share with you the definitions of our activities, the goal of this benchmark, as well as all the assets. Now let's put them into um, an environment where we can um, benchmark robotic learning. And uh, there is no question you've heard from other speakers that the benefit of simulation environment is really important. Uh, they enable fast training and uh, um, make 
trans transfer learning possible for sim to real. They're safe for robots and uh, environments in development stage, and they can um, become critical uh, platform for a fair and reproducible benchmark for um, for for embodied AI. And there has been incredible progress in simulation environment. You're hearing some now in this, uh, in this uh, workshop and all of them have different strengths and, uh, and uh, limitations. Uh, what we are finding in our own work is as, our, as our, we put together this 1000 tasks uh, that are uh, trying to mimic the human activities and uh, in the ecological uh, setting, we require features of a simulation environment that uh, exceeds what the current simulators can offer, um, you, you know, especially towards flexible materials, fluid, uh, thermal effects, magnetic con um, connections, uh, continuous states like temperature, wetness, and, and com object uh, composition and decomposition, and so on. So all these capability um, is pushing us towards developing a new um, simulation environment. And this is in collaboration with NVIDIA's Omniverse. We call it Omni Gibson. It, it, it is built upon our lab's previous work in iGibson, but also uh, together with the, the Omniverse team. And uh, it is built on top of um, both the physics, um, physics engine, Physics 5 and Omniverse, providing uh, simulation of not only rigid bodies, but also all these um, deformable fluids, flexible materials. Uh, and it, it generates highly realistic ray traced and path traced virtual images. So um, um, we actually did a user study uh, to test the realism of our simulation environment compared to a few others. Uh, so Omni Gibson as perceptual realism compared to I Gibson um, AI to Thor, Habitat, and three, uh, DTW. And the, the score is, um, subjects are asked to score from one to five, where five is being the highest, most realistic. Omni Gibson's score is uh, by far larger than the other environments. And uh, here's just an example of one rendering of one office of almost 500 objects, three rooms. Uh, you can see the lighting and you can see the complexity of these, um, of these uh, environments. And last but not the least, uh, let's not lose sight of the goal, right? Uh, we put together behavior uh, and we know how, how challenging this is. Uh, you know, the punchline is there's no current system that can, can really do the 1,000 behavior tasks, not, not even in simulation, let alone in, in real, real world. But we want to start uh, evaluating on how the current embodied AI systems do and gain insight to make uh, progress. Uh, we, um, we started doing that even in the previous paper. Last year, we used uh, two uh, state-of-the-art um, algorithms to do our evaluation was the soft actor critic uh, uh, paper. The other one is PPO um, um, uh, algorithm. And uh, here's just some very simple, this is just to evaluate on, on grasping object in uh, behavior. This is actually not a full task uh, activity. It's just one short uh, uh, skill level task with uh, um, um, in this case, we're seeing the, the magic uh, simplified um, um, actuation. Uh, the other one is soaking towel. Uh, you're seeing that um, that there's some reasonable performance in this uh, state-of-the-art algorithm. Another one is uh, cleaning shelf, cooking meat to, to highlight the, the uh, continuous uh, change of states of object, and uh, slicing food to highlight the the uh, interactiveness of objects. But the bottom line here is not to show current systems do well. In fact, as soon as you relax that oversimplified magic action of grasping, um, the orange line shows you our system more or less fail. 
our current system more or less fail. And these are still just such a tiny subset of behavior. It's not even the full action. And we evaluated on object, uh, um, the, the, the generalization of training on, on different object poses and, and, and instance, the, again, the bottom line is that without a, a larger scale uh, training to generalize the system does very badly. Uh, let me just uh, move forward. And um, um, in this video, uh, we perform a set of experiments to, um, to see how existing vision-based robot is it happening. Uh, learning algorithm perform in behavior uh, behavior 1K, uh, what assumptions have to be made to um, improve their success. So you're about to see uh, a couple of results. Uh, one is that uh, we use three different algorithms, um, RL with end-to-end -end visual motor control, uh, which is RLVMC. It completely fails. This is the more, um, uncontrolled setup, unstructured setup. And then if we give it uh, some um, primitive uh, uh, skills um, to help uh, with the long horizon tasks, it performs better. And then if we add memory, um, to, it, it performs even better. So this is really highlighting there is a long way to go in, uh, in uh, um, really performing uh, unassistedly to our robots in these environments. We, last but not least, we also take it to real environment. We built a, a physical apartment in our, um, in our building and are taking our bimanual um, mobile manipulation robot, um, Tiago, to perform these tasks. Uh, this, is just a, uh, this is just a video showing you Tiago performing uh, one task activity in behavior 1K called collect trash. Uh, it's picking up a bottle, and then it's going to navigate towards the trash bin and uh, hopefully put the bottle in the trash bin. Um, I'm just going to fast forward this. Uh, our analysis show there's huge gap. First of all, the sim to real gap is, is a 40% gap. Uh, real world uh, with learned policy performs zero. Um, in simulation, it can perform about 40% success. And uh, with some assistance in real world, it gets to 22% uh, success. But the error analysis is very telling. Let me just say that if you look at the middle circle pie chart, um, and, and the second, uh, the, the right one, uh, perception is a, is a huge issue in real world. Uh, so is policy learning and, uh, and so on. So uh, which in simulation, you don't see the perception problem. Um, um, you don't see much of that. Okay, so if you're yeah. interested in behavior, here's the website, um, you can browse. And I wanna part way with one last quote, not from Gibson, but I can imagine he telling us, um, I think there's a clear vision towards where embodied AI is going, but let's not mistake it uh, for a short distance. But I think this is a very exciting vision. And thank you for listening. And thank you for all the students and collaborators working on behavior and all the uh, um, uh, funding sources. Thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have time for questions, so please uh, save them for the uh, speakers uh, panel. Next up, we have our pretend denial.
Yeah, I think I have to do a host record all that. Second. Yeah, it's not going to work. 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 Okay, now you can present. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Open sign. Muted. And then we'll go by this mic, not this mic. Uh, yeah, you can speak into it. It should all come out. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Can people hear me in Zoom land? Okay. Let's start. Okay. So I don't know if the sound is coming through and the video is going to be laggy, but uh, you can see uh, what our robot can do. And uh, after this talk in room 206, we'll have, have the robot and we have some planks. So it's not quite the Berkeley Marina, but you'll see it and you can touch it and feel it. Okay. It's supposed to be going downstairs, which it will. Okay. Uh, anyway, I think you're getting the flavor. Okay, let me. Okay, so this is a, sort of a loose mud pile. So all this is with the same policy. Yeah, I apologize. The effect is much greater. You can find this video. These videos are available on YouTube. I think that's where you get the best effect. Okay. So the same policy is being used always. Okay, I'm going to take off my mask because I think I'm far enough from everybody. Okay, and this robot can move really fast. So, and so far, by the way, everything you saw was with a blind robot. Now we have added vision and now it can uh, go through obstacles. So what you see in the bottom right is the, uh, the view, the view from the front camera and then the 
top what you see is the map being built incrementally and then a path is being planned and then the robot is going around in this space and later on i'll have a video of going up and down various kinds of stairs and rocks and so on and so forth okay and now how do we do it okay so i'm going to take you through the approach and uh, I'll, it's easiest to explain it in terms of four versions of the robot and uh, the first version uh, uh, okay so uh, this is the, the the earliest and main paper rapid motor adaptation for like a robot which was presented last year at rss 2021 so we start by training this robot in simulation and it is trained completely in simulation there is no subsequent training in the real world. So, you know, when people talk about sim to real, it's trained in simulation completely, put out in the world, it works, period. No training is necessary in the real world. And what enables us to achieve this? So, uh, okay, in terms of the training, uh, it starts out uh, on very interesting fractal kind of terrain, but we do not pre-program any gates. No gallop, walk, trot, nothing from imitation of humans or horses. It's learned completely by uh, reinforcement learning, where based on a suitable cost function, when the cost function is all the sensible things that you should move fast and you should uh, not use up too much energy and you should not have too big a force and so on. Okay. So how do we do this? Uh, so there's a physics simulator, obviously, that you need in which the robot is going to learn. And it's going to learn a base policy. Let me see if my mouse is doing anything sensitive. Yeah. So there's a base policy that you train with PPO. And uh, importantly, in this first stage of training, the, there is access to privileged information. So privileged information here is what would not be available necessarily at test time, but at training time, you know the mass of the robot, you know the center of mass, you know friction characteristics, terrain height, motor strength, etc. And of course you can vary them. So you vary them and then you have the terrain which is varied because of this fractal nature. So there are lots of ups and downs and so forth. So huge variation in training and the usual 1 billion trials and it works very well. Okay, where is the cleverness here? Now, uh, what we want is to have a policy which is adaptive, but not robust. Okay, this, if you forget everything else from this talk, remember the demos, and then the slogan, adaptive, not robust. What do I mean by that? Robustness is about doing the same thing in a whole variety of different situations and doing good enough. Adaptive is doing a different thing in different circumstances, and that is better. I will, I'll argue, and that's my belief. You want an adaptive system rather than a system which does the same thing in all situations, which means that you must know which situation you are in. Okay. How do you know which situation you are in? At training time, it's easy because you have all those privileged parameters. And in fact, all of them don't matter. They matter in some low dimensional version of it, which is captured by this environmental factor encoder, which is like some MLP, which brings it down to some eight dimensional or 12 dimensional space. And then that is one more argument into the policy. So the policy has uh, the past action and state and so forth, but it has the conditions, the physical conditions, the plant, the environment, that sort of thing, which is captured in the ZT. And with in different ZTs, the policy will recommend different actions. So that's the adaptive part. So in simulation, this works perfectly. These are the so-called extrinsics. Now, uh, we train it, done. Okay, reward function is sensible, it works. Okay, you shouldn't be surprised that it works. If it didn't work, what that means is that your student doesn't know reinforcement learning. Okay, if you try it and it doesn't work. 
okay. Now this is the challenging part. Okay. Now we wanted to make it in the real world. So what's going to happen? We don't know the CT. We don't know the extrinsics, and we have to adapt in the real world. So what will enable you to do this? How do we know what conditions we are in? When I'm walking on road versus walking on sand versus walking downhill, how do I know? Okay, perception can help, but proprioception also helps. When I walk in sand, I put my foot down and then I lift it up and I apply the same force that I did in my room and my foot doesn't lift up that much. The same actions in different conditions give rise to different consequences. So if I keep track of my history, right, my past, immediate past state and action history, I have in that the signature of what conditions I am in, right? I apply some force and it doesn't, if I start to slip, well, that means that the friction is, high, is, is lower than I expected and so on. The environment will be revealed to me by its reaction to the commands that I, 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 I make. Okay, so that's, that's basically, and we call this rapid motor adaptation. In some sense, this is actually, I think this is the central conceptual contribution of this work. And we have now used it in other settings, like for rotating objects in the hand, for quadcopters and a zillion things. This is like adaptive control. So adaptive control was a big idea like around 1960s and it was used for spacecraft and, air, and so forth because like an aircraft when it is full of fuel versus when it is up at near the end of its journey and it's got less fuel, the mass parameter has changed, right? And that has an effect on the dynamics and so on. And these were big questions studied with by classical control people. We have basically found the deep learning version of that. Okay, of adaptive control, and we call this rapid motor adaptation. Okay, so uh, how do we do this? So these extrinsics are known. So what we are going to do is basically build an estimator. Okay, the estimator is going to have access to, so that's shown here. So this adapt, so-called adaptation module, what that does is it has access to your immediate history. So I'm commanding some actions. They are having different consequences than what I had hoped for because the extrinsics have changed. Okay, so that's the adaptation module, which has got that past history and its job is to estimate this Z, this extrinsic parameter. And once I've estimated the extrinsic parameter, then I just plug it into the, my policy, which has was trained as simulation. Now, how do I train this adaptation module is the, is the challenge. But the beauty is that this can be trained. So, so this, the, this adaptation module will magically estimate at runtime, at test time, what those extrinsics are, but how will it do it, right? So now I've, I've just passed the buck to some other stage. How that will do it is that we can actually solve this as a supervised learning problem at training time. Why can we do that? Because at training time, you have kind of the ground truth CT right because it's it's coming from the that encoder so we first train the regular policy and then we do a little bit of work to train this adaptation module and for that this adaptation module has a target the target is the zt which is predicted by this this uh, this other environmental factor encoder so this is a supervised learning problem so this is actually quite lightweight and easy and fast and that's it okay rest is turning the crank okay so, uh, so this is what the thing will be at, uh, at test time. So at test time, you're going to have the base policy, which was trained at trained in simulation. This adaptation module, which was trained in a separate phase in simulation. And that will supply the Z sub T. And uh, that's an argument to the, and then, then we can deploy it. So in a sense, when it goes, when the, so my slogan here is we do not need to do sim to real because there is enough of a challenge doing real to real, right? For different real world conditions, you have different extrinsics and we need to deal with that and dealing with, and in fact, the beauty of simulation is that you can produce all of them and, and you, you are ready for the real world because in simulation, you will see far more variety than you, than you can easily produce in, because I have a billion trials. 
Okay, so this is one policy to walk them all. I mean, of course, Boston Dynamics is a famous company in this business and they've been at it for 30 years, but their engineers have devoted years to training, you know, policies based on particular gates and policies for, they have one policy for climbing stairs, maybe a separate policy for going downstairs. I don't know, I, I shouldn't say anything which will get me into trouble. Flat ground, this, that. We have one policy, one policy, okay? And we just train it and it trains in a couple of hours. Anybody can do it, you can do it. Download the code, see the robot, okay? Okay, and this robot is a cheap robot, by the way. This robot, I mean, uh, it's made by a company called Unitry. It's called the A1 robot. In fact, they sell it for $3,000. They charge us $10,000 because we need access to the controller. Okay, uh, Boston Dynamics is $200,000, right? So this robot you can all have. All of you should aim to have one of these robots in your home because it's, it's just 3,000 bucks, okay? Uh, and, and it works in all these conditions. Okay, uh, now let's show you some uh, results which get underneath the hood. Underneath the hood here means getting at that Z to Sati. So here is this carpet. This is in Ashish's home. This was, the pandemic was very useful because he was stuck at home. So he didn't have anything better to do than work on this. Okay, so this is, uh, okay. And now it's slippery, right? But it, he makes it additionally slippery by Okay, but wait, there is more. Okay, if you see the robot, he's put some plastic legs on the leg of the robot. So that is to make it extra, extra slippery. Okay, and then the robot is going to try to walk. Okay. It's supposed to walk. Okay, and it starts to slip. Okay, but then it recovers. That's the important point. It starts to slip because it's got an estimate of the extrinsics which are based on flat ground. It starts to slip, but the extrinsics, the Z sub T, are revealed by the reaction of the body in these for the same actions. So that estimator, that adaptation module will re quickly re-estimate the Z sub T, and then the, that will go in as an argument to the policy, and then the and then the actions will now be commanded, which will be different. And 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 that's the core idea. Adapt, don't robustify. Robustification will happen as a consequence of adaptation. Okay, and this these plots are mumbo jumbo, but basically those are two components of the Z sub T. And as the robot moves, what will happen is that you the you know you see those curves the red curve and the blue curve they basically are two components of this eight dimensional vector and those indicate the process of adaptation so the extensity is slipping the z sub t estimate changes and then the policy the policy is the same but it has this argument and so it changes the action okay this is uh this is a demo which is about you know the robot will walk and then we throw some weight on it and so on now this is something which classical control can do because they treat things as disturbances we don't treat this as disturbances we treat it as adaptation okay okay and again uh the z septi shows this okay and uh oh yeah these demos that if you don't do this Okay, then the robot collapses and dies. Okay, this is the one with. Them. Okay, uh, mattress. This is this is a challenging case, right? Because when you once your foot sinks in, you have to pull it out, and you need more force. So this is with adaptation. It works without adaptation. It doesn't work. And A one's built-in controller. So this is the controller which is shipped with the robot doesn't do it as well okay i mean this is what okay uh okay i think now it's more of the same uh, indoor results okay now planks 
Okay, now these are just, once you have the uh, various examples, you can turn the crank, okay. Uh, so same policy, okay, for everything. Okay, then we have numbers, and I think the numbers have some scientific merit. So there are, uh, uh, there is, uh, there are some alternatives you can consider. One is domain randomization. I mean, that's the leading game in town, and we do better than that. That's the robust one at the top. There's sys ID. Systems ID is like the classical control theory way, which is that there is a system which has 27 parameters, mass, this, that. Let's try to identify them. And that doesn't do as well. And why not? Because it's too much work. You are identifying more than you need to identify, and you're not able to identify that. You're seeking to solve a, there's a, I, uh, somewhere in my life, I learned this Vapnik principle. Never, when you are trying to solve a hard problem, never solve an intermediate problem, which is even harder. Okay? Sys ID is trying to solve an intermediate problem, which is even harder. Okay? And, and some of those parameters, in fact, come in combinations, such, which makes them very ambiguous to estimate. And we know this from physics and fluid mechanics. There are all these Reynolds number, Froude number, et cetera. And they occur in certain combinations. And the physical effect is for that dimensionless constant. So you can't even try to find that in a factorized way. When we find the Z sub T, we are finding these eight numbers rather than these uh, 37 ones. So you do a better job basically. And, uh, and of course the best you can do is with privileged information, which this, these are experiments and simulation, but that will do the best, but you come pretty close. 76.2 versus 73%. And these are experiments in the real world and okay, they do really good things. Okay. Uh, we can uh, apply it to by okay, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? Okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Okay, so it works for bipeds too. Okay, I, I'll, 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 okay, it works for bipeds. Okay, <laughs> okay uh, it works at, uh, at uh, different speeds, okay. Uh, and, and how do you do that? One parameter, right? You, when you train the policy, you give it an ideal speed, which it is trying to attain. You can give it uh, slower speeds, larger speeds and so forth. And that's what is done here. And just by setting in your simulator, when you're doing your running your RL algorithm, you, you, you give it different desired speeds and a walk emerges, a trot emerges, a gallop emerges. These different speeds, different speeds, you high speed, you do a bounce. Humans at slowest, we do this because it's of energy consumption. I mean, this was a theory in biomechanics. I mean, how did that show up? In your RL, there's a cost function, and that cost function has an energy term. So we didn't have to do anything clever. It just happened. You just run the damn thing and it works. Okay. Okay. And it's actually, there are, these are nature papers on uh, the energetics of locomotion in horses and our, our robot is actually like a sheep, even though it looks like a dog. Okay. And, uh, and, and we, of course we needed to run a different terrain, but we didn't have to do anything because RMA is running always. So, so you just, at RL time, you at your training time, you just have different speeds, which are uh, set as desired things. You get different gates, uh, and the policy will adapt to terrain automatically. Anyway, and uh, this is meant to impress you. So this is at uh, CMU, I think. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so velocity condition policy. So you you can uh, go at uh, yeah. So it, does just different things at different speeds. You can, okay, blah blah. Okay, now uh, uh, in the interest of time, so we it can uh, we need okay. This is a vision conference. We have vision people. We needed to give it. Uh, so far, everything was blind, and this was a revelation for me. Actually, actually, and but it's not a revelation once you all realize that we can walk well with the eyes closed. But there are certain times you don't want to walk with your eyes closed. What are those times? You don't want to avoid, you want to avoid colliding with obstacles. And when you want to go upstairs, you better have your vision. And basically we solve those problems too. Okay. So, so this is the problem of navigation. Now we have in this meeting, 
is now and we have tracked navigation. Navigation with locomotion. Okay, that's what we do. And uh, this is a paper which please go and see because uh, uh, Zipeng, Ashish, and Ananya would really appreciate that, right? So uh, uh, we have uh, a paper. Uh, uh, this is at CVP, in fact, this conference uh, on coupling vision and proprioception for the navigation of. Uh, so we take as a starting point the ability to walk. And now what you need is this takes as input this vector, which is what's the local direction you need to go and what local velocity and angular velocity, which you can derive from this local map, which is being built up as you go along. Okay. And uh, that's co the core of it, really. Uh, and there's a cost map, and then you use this cost matching method. And uh blah 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 okay go to, go to the paper for the details there and it was but i think you saw it even in the beginning okay okay uh there's some cleverness here which is trying to estimate the probability of a fall and then you you must decide what speed to go at you should go slower if you are in more difficult conditions and that can be estimated also in training because you can learn the probability of a fall so okay and so for example if you, you should use proprioception so in this example if the demo plays uh, you if you just use vision when you go against this transparent wall you won't know what to do but with proprioception you will sense it and you'll move around it okay and i want to move Okay, I'll skip all the stuff, it works. But I want to show you some impressive demo. So let's see if this works. Oh, no, no, okay. Okay, it's moving on my screen, so it will move there eventually. So this is the, okay, this is with a depth camera. No, no notice these stools. So the robot has to move across, making sure not to fall on any stool, okay? See that? Okay. It, okay. Now you should see it outside on some stairs and some grass. And I, I, I really apologize that you can't enjoy this because the video is so sort of laggy. But okay. So try to imagine a smooth version of. <laughs> So notice, by the way, that this is a pretty small robot. So these stairs as it is climbing are like 80% of its height. Whereas the usual demos that you see are spot, spot in a much bigger robot. And this is at night. I mean, this, this is a seat because it has a, a gym set. <laughs> it makes uh, the general public feel impressed. Okay, uh, these are stairs which some people who are from CMU should be able to recognize. Okay, and I have, okay, and I have my last slide coming up. Okay, okay, and uh, okay, this is a demo. Now, this is the last slide. Okay, this is a demo of a different system. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, this is a demo of the exactly the same idea, the same rapid motor adaptation principle but being used for a fine motor control task which is to rotate these objects okay and these objects are of differing weight and uh, and and different uh, uh, sorry uh, okay uh, i think i'm done anyway uh, but the main point was that it was twirling objects of different size and weight it needed to adapt and the adaptation was with the same idea of rapid motor adaptation. Again, completely trained in simulation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. And this, we brought the robot. Uh, Ashish has brought the robot. It's there in room 06. And uh, we've had some and some setup so you can. Thank you so much, Richard. Great talk.
So we don't have time for questions. Uh, feel free to put them put up for the council. Okay. Thank you so much. And we'll uh, have another conference. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're, uh, we're about to start the challenge discussions or uh, challenge results. Um, give everybody a second to sit down. So just as a uh, reminder about the uh, schedule, so we'll be doing challenge presentations for uh, approximately an hour. These are all about the uh, interaction uh, type of challenges, rearrangement, all that good stuff. Uh, then we'll have a panel at four for the organizers of these uh, these challenges, and then we will have a speaker panel among all the speakers at four thirty. Um, 
Okay, cool. So uh, the first thing we'll be talking about is the uh, the challenge which I and others at AI2 organized, um, the I4 rearrangement challenge um, held in 2022, just completed. Um, so our uh, I4 environment, which uh, the rearrangement task is within, was built prioritizing complex interactions uh, and phys uh, physics realism while abstracting away uh, some of the uh, more robotics -y details like grasping and whatnot. Um, it supports, or iThor supports, um, all sorts of realistic physics, um, object manipulations, state changes, so you can open and close objects, pour things, uh, fill, fill cups, do all that good stuff, um, and multi-agent interactions like they're shown here uh, on the right. Um, okay, so now we'll jump into the rearrangement challenge, which again is uh, held with inside this iThor environment. Um, so uh, in our visual room rearrangement task, there are two distinct phases, a walkthrough phase and an unshuffle phase. Um, during the walkthrough phase, the agent roams around the scene um, and views objects in their goal locations. Um, and then during the uh, unshuffle phase, we'll start by uh, temporarily removing the agent. Uh, we then change the state of between one and five objects um, and uh, you know, change it in position or rotation. Uh, the agent is then placed back in the starting position, um, and his goal is now to interact with the environment so as to undo the changes that were made. Uh, note that the top-down image here is just for uh, visualization purposes. In practices, practice, agents only see the first-person egocentric view. Um, for this challenge, we generated a data set of 10,000 rearrangements. There are 120 rooms, uh, 1,200 objects, instances, um, and tons of objects that can uh, move and move around the environment and open and do all that good stuff. Um, so we have two different challenge variants. Um, in our uh, two-phase variant, uh, this agent uh, first has to walk through the walkthrough stage uh, before going on to doing uh, the unshuffle stage. Um, and then we also have an easier one-phase variant where sort of both stages happen simultaneously. So the agent will run around both uh, scenes at the same time and see images that correspond to both the walkthrough phase and the unshuffle phase. And then when they take actions, they will all happen within the unshuffle phase. So if it picks up an object, it'll do so in the unshuffle phase and it wants to bring it back to how it was in the walkthrough phase. Um, awesome. Um, okay, so this rearrangement challenge, it's really easy to install. So we have this AI2 Thor environment, you can just pip install it. Um, we have extensive starter code and all sorts of pre-trained byte baselines. Um, and there's a persistent leaderboard. So uh, technically our uh, challenge is over, but you know, you can keep on posting on there till uh, the end of time and keep on comparing your models against the ones that are on there now. Um, okay, now moving on to our challenge winners. Um, we had a bunch of submissions this year um, and they all did uh, dramatically better than prior, prior years, which is pretty uh, surprising and uh, great to see. Um, so our one phase winner was uh, the Proctor uh, paper, which you probably heard about a little bit earlier. Um, so it has a, a 15 point gain uh, in the you know most important metric over last year's best, um, and a five point gain over the uh, the best from uh, the second best from this year, um, and then surprisingly, we also had a bunch of submissions to this two phase task. You actually heard Katarina talk about one of these earlier, um, but uh, yeah, they did dramatically better. So last or the the models from last year were getting you know basically zero percent success, um, and now they're up to sort of sixteen percent of this fixed strict metric. Um, and that's just a dramatic improvement. Um, and the, the, the winner, uh, which is shown here, it's sort of a simple approach for visual rearrangement um, using 3D mapping and semantic search, uh, got a seven point gain uh, over the second place winner uh, or second place uh, this year. Um, so now just moving on to the uh, challenge talk from the, the uh, one phase rearrangement. Uh, here we go. All right, so this is the winning submission for the one phase task and this work primarily is about Proctor and this work was also primarily led by Jordi who unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, but there, here's the high level overview. So we're going to train a very simple model, but we're going to pre train it with lots of data and this data is all generated from Proctor and the procedurally generated rooms. Um, so if we look more specifically at this simple model. We just have our unshuffle and our target images encoded with clip. We then feed it through a visual encoder and a GRU, and we produce our policy. And this is quite a simple model conceptually, and it's pretty easy to implement. And 
we actually train this just with behavior cloning at the start, then we anneal it with Dagger, and then we just train it with reinforcement learning at the end. But the real novelty of this work is just in the Procler environments. Um, so here we generate 10,000 environments for our paper, and these are just incredibly diverse, interactive, scalable, customizable, and they really encompass quite a wide variety of what you might see in the real world. And we could even tune these houses pretty much any way we want. So if we want more bedrooms or we want more uh, baseball bats and different types of rooms, we could easily do this procedurally. And here's what it looks like if we just zoom out of the rooms and do a nice flyby tour. So we just have this massive diversity of how large these houses could be, how many rooms can be in them, how the rooms connect, how objects are placed in the rooms, how materials appear, and just this wide, wide variety of how these houses and rooms that you train your agents in can appear. And if we look at how we actually place objects in these rooms, we have this massive Thor database, which encompasses thousands of assets, and we could place all of these assets sort of in a modular way, and each of these can be placed in an independent way. And specifically, if we pre-train on Procler and then fine-tune on Ithor. So for Procler, we only use a subset of 2,500 rooms, and these are only the one and two bedroom homes. We then fine-tune on the 80 rooms from Ithor um, and 50 episodes per each of those rooms. Um, and one of the interesting things is for Procler, we're actually missing quite a few object types that appear in these uh, Ithor targets. But we still do surprisingly well in a zero shot setting. Um, so this is zero shot where you're not even seeing many of the objects you're actually testing on. Um, and for actually training on Procler in novel environments that aren't seen during training, we actually achieve nearly as good of results as we do in those that are seen, which means this overfitting gap is more or less uh, eliminated in just the sort of in-domain houses. And then this pre-training paradigm of pre-training in these large Procler types of environments uh, has lots of promising results for fine tuning. And then we think scaling up even further is another avenue for improvement. And going beyond rearrangement, Procler gets state of the art in all tasks we've, we've attempted. Uh, so for object nav tasks, manipulator and rearrangement as well. Um, and then we're really excited about this. So uh, we have a cool demo and we have a paper that went on archive this week. Uh, we're happy for anyone to try it out and our code is going to be released soon. Thank you all. Cool. So uh, that was the uh, one phase variant winner. Uh, next on to the two phase variant winner. Oh, sorry. Doesn't seem to be playing sound. One second. Learning department at CMU. Oh, one second, sorry. Advised by Russ Sullivan. Yeah, this probably was a collaboration between our lab and the team at Amazon. Here we are.
is an especially hard extension of the rear engine ball because the goal state is not explicitly given to you. Rather, they must be inferred from the agent's experience during an exercise by the agent remembering the engine ball profile. We can focus on the two phase visual and rear engine model, where the agent observes an ego scene in its goal state during the initial walking phase, and the agent is then placed in a new scene. Where the uh, five objects are moved, the agent should modify the seat to match the goal state observed during the walking phase. The agent's goal during this secondary phase is to maximize its success rate. Defined as a success rate, the agent successfully rearranges every object in the scene to the desired post. Rearranging is a challenging task, and our key insight in solving it is to build voxel based maps for each phase of the environment to reason about what objects we need to rearrange. By finding those models in the maps, Firefly has three components. First, we build accurate fossil based maps of the environment. Then, we run a search based policy to efficiently find objects to populate the maps. And finally, we rearrange the scene by locating objects, moving them to the goal, and placing them accurate until the agent predicts that all objects have been rearranged. Building accurate semantic maps is crucial to our and this is challenging. It requires processing images of the scene from multiple perspectives. We approach this challenge by implementing the back to get the ego centered semantic segmentation variables with pre trained mask our scene, two set of voxels at each time step, capturing the state of the environment during the walkthrough and the initial operation. Building accurate maps requires finding objects in the scene that need to be rearranged, and we approach this challenge by training a semantic search policy pi that parameterizes the distribution and search locations of the scene. That are likely to contain objects that need to be rearranged. Once accurate maps are built, maps determine which objects to rearrange by identifying recent units in maps and iteratively rearranging those objects until no disagreement remains. And together, these components that sufficiently solve two phase rearranging problems, which we discussed next time. Maps significantly improves two phase rearrangement phase. Our method improves 31 times over the most recent baseline for two phase rearrangement that uses 10 to 10 URL. Called DRR plus MAC in the table, despite requiring only 2.7% of the many samples from the environment. MAC solves 47 out of 1,000 test set tasks, leading to a relative improvement of 1,175 percent over the use of base tests in the In addition, our semantic search policy accounts for 275 percent of the observed performance in the table. And our results confirm that many of these approaches, which include CSR and R can improve both performance and efficiency on visual rearrangement problems. Our results with mass improve even further for replacing our perception and search modules with experts. Compared to the recent baseline CSR and with an expert instance segmentation and expert search groups, our method improves by 1,742% success on the test set and rearranges nearly 60% of the modules correctly in the test set. These significant gains with expert perception and search. Show that building accurate semantic maps is important for visual rearrangement problems. We presented MAS, a solution for visual rearrangement problems using pre mapping and semantic search. MAS is trained offline and used to plan and voxel based semantic maps to rearrange objects. Our results show that MAS is efficient, improving by 1,175% on prior and over 31 times over the leading head to head RL based. The success of mass and rearrangement challenge suggests a few metrics for things to work First, we observe that mass significantly benefits from extra perception and search models. Improving map fidelity with better models is therefore an important way to further improve the efficiency of mass. Similarly, our mapping approach relies on accurate pixel depth, back to depth significance for the map, generalizing our mapping settings with points of depth modulation and input visualization, and importantly, for mass to be applied in the real world. And finally, combining the advantages of our approach with the advantages of reinforcement learning, we up with policy and spatial awareness and the ability to reason about three markets. My name is Brandon Trudeau. It's been a pleasure to present to you. And for more information, read our project website or get in touch. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks to. Uh... <laughs> Let's just do it again. It's okay. Um, so, thanks to all uh, everyone who participated in the Reandrew Engine Challenge. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, can't wait for next year. Cool. So next up is the joint uh, 
this presentation from um, from uh, the Alfred and Teach challenges. So, <laughs> which of you is starting first? Second, perfect. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good to go. Yeah. Hello, people who are hanging out with us at three something in the afternoon. Um, we appreciate your presence. Um, so we're going to talk about the Alfred and Teach challenges um, really quickly and to give you a little bit of a sense of um, what these are about and a little bit of how they differ from what we've been mostly talking about in this workshop today. So first, what is sort of the, the point here? Um, focus on language. Um, and this is going to be a substantially more um, abstract representation to be working from than what almost everyone else has talked about, right? So um, it's not to say that the other challenges aren't very difficult, but you have much more precise notions of what your goal states are and things like this than when you're talking about them um, in language. So to give you a sense of that, here we have an example from the data set where you have some high level instructions or goals that you're seeing at the top here, like put a heated slice or potato on the, on the counter. Uh, and then that has to get manifest as these actions around Thor. This is a slightly older version of Thor than uh, some of the fancy stuff we've seen. But you still have things like state changes. You still have all of these um, articulated objects and receptacles and so forth. And so then the goal is that you have to actually turn this abstract instruction into a sequence of low level um, actions. And so I want to sort of um, maybe make an analogy here to something from like, for instance, program induction that gives an that sort of gives you a sense of what is actually entailed in that task, right? So we have a bunch of different things that the agent is going to have to be able to do. Um, so these are kind of like the the, the sort of general high level goals. Um, these tasks include pick and place. Um, double place, so basically some notion of memory, making sure the agent doesn't end up spiraling by basically picking up and placing the same object multiple times, um, stacking of objects inside of receptacles, uh, and examining all of these things. We have manipulation of objects, but we don't have things like state changes. Uh, so then we can juxtapose those with heating, cooling, or cleaning. And in all of these cases, um, it's not necessarily the case that visually there's something distinct, but instead you have to understand or remember that you have performed some action previously um, in order to make sure that you're actually completing the task. So these are the, these are the kind of things that we're going to have those high level descriptions of. And uh, the way that we're going to sort of make this challenge particularly difficult as compared to things like what we've seen in room to room and other kinds of language tasks that are focused on navigation is the fact that they are, these objects are articulated, that they can be manipulated and moved and have these state changes. And so we're going to give two examples um, of that here. Oops, weird transitions. So if I have something like place a hot bread slice on the counter, um, that means that I have to have the appropriate tool, in this case a knife, I have to find the thing that I'm going to be applying it to, in this case the loaf of bread, and then when I perform that action, I'm going to end up with these slices. This is a prerequisite towards that goal, but it's not explicitly stated. And so this is what I'm meaning about, like sort of what is the implicit program that has to get executed. The other really important thing is that if you've been following the room to room, room across room style literature, you know that one of the problems that keeps on emerging is search behaviors. Um, and the search behavior, you need the ability to backtrack. In fact, Groove this morning was talking specifically about being able to model how humans do that kinds of backtracking. You can't backtrack on slicing the bread, or at least I'm not aware of how to unslice bread. Um, and so we have this thing where the second that you introduce just a small amount of realism, a bunch of the kinds of advances that we're seeing uh, in other spaces like navigation start to no longer apply. Uh, so then there's this question of like, well, how should we be building agents, for example, that know when it's safe to perform an immutable um, action that can't be undone? And then in this case, if it's going to be heated, then that also means uh, using the microwave, placing it inside. And this is, as I was alluding to earlier, uh, looks the same. So visually not going to be distinct, but you have some notion that you have to remember you did that. So the worst case scenario would be that you have a sort of Markovian model that makes the mistake of sort of continually putting it back into the microwave or something like this, because that's what the scene would seem to imply. So 
if we think about this from like a program induction standpoint for a second, if I had some sort of high level goal like this heated apple slice on the large table, then when we hear that as humans, we immediately are able to sort of deduce that there's a couple of predicates that would need to get executed. And so we have things like maybe we have to create a slice, maybe we have to heat it and so forth. And that this is actually a recursive definition where things like creating a slice as we were just discussing would require that I have an appropriate tool, I'm able to locate these and so forth. And so question one, and this goes back a little bit to Katharina's comment about like common sense and knowledge of the world. What is all that information that is implicit in a single lexical item? So if I have a single word in this procedure, what is all of that sort of uh, information that I need? And then how do I ground that into a specific context? So if I was to ask you, given that you've just spun around in a single circle and you had some high level thing like this, you could actually probably come up with a pretty reasonable kind of open loop kind of plan um, that would get you reasonably close. Um, and so you have the ability to go from that really high level abstract action all the way down to the sort of basic motor control. And what we've been mostly discussing are agents that are sort of focusing kind of on that, that the lower level and the, these challenges are trying to kind of push us up that um, usability and also abstraction stack. It turns out that this task has been quite difficult and it's not necessarily clear why. Is it the fact that we need all of this extra information? Is it the fact that these, tra these uh, trajectories are substantially longer than we're seeing in other tasks? Is it the fact that we have this sort of detection issues? Or is it simply the fact that even if these things are individually not that hard, when you try to learn them all as a single joint model, uh, stuff starts to fall apart. So a transition. So looking back over the couple of methods that have been done on Alfred, we have seen like a general upward trajectory. Somebody in the Slack a second ago asked like, have we gotten any good insights over the last two years? And the answer is definitely yes. So people started actually detecting objects, obviously if detect objects to do a better job. Attending to our language instructions one by one instead of treating them as a blob. Using panoramic images, again, taking uh, inspiration from the VLM literature, turns out to work better here too. Um, but the most recent advances have come from semantic mapping, actually building maps of the environment. So again, similar to the rearrangement challenge, I think a lot of these methods are sort of um, making advances on a lot of the benchmarks at the same time. So we had two methods come out roughly at the same time for mapping last year. So this is for the roughly the 2020 challenge. I think they might have missed the actual deadline. Um, one from Jonathan's lab uh, with Tiffany and one from uh, now at NVIDIA, Valtz Blukas. And for both of these, uh, they've sort of combined planning and mapping, where if we know that our overall goal is putting our heated apple on the counter, we can deduce that we have some certain steps that need to take, like finding an apple, uh, picking the apple up, moving the apple over the counter. And we can take individual RGB observations and project them into a map. So that can be 2D or 3D. Here's an example of a 2D map, I think, from Yonatan's prior work on film. Um, for mapping out the space, and then we have an explicit space over which we can go find places where apples probably live, find them, do our test. Uh, I don't remember what the contrast for this one is. Sorry, I made these slides last night. <laughs> here, here, here. If you click play, I think. Oh, wait, there it goes. a video. Well, it's in theory a video, which is not playing, so that's okay. Where's this device? Oh, there we go. Okay. Nope, nope. Okay, never mind. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it does a bunch of things. And I think the key thing is oh, now I have to bring this back. Um, the key um, maybe focus here being the fact that once you have maps, then you can have semantic maps, um, which allow you to do things like search um, and grounding of those individual concepts so you can navigate between. So, what we're seeing in that video was basically the progressive uh, construction of those maps online with their semantic alignment so that you can then actually execute it. So this is just a single example of, of doing that. And here's sort of a, um, a, an attention map of where you should look for a faucet. So a faucet could occur both in this case in the sink or it could happen on uh, like a bathtub. Sorry. Which brings us to the challenge winners for this year. So last year we saw a bunch of approaches using mapping. And this year we see two very divergent applications of those maps that result in almost identical performance, which is kind of cool. Um, so this year we had one submission, which just directly building on those mapping based approaches we just saw, add substantial sort of hand coded recovery policies with a lot of human annotation that I'll go through briefly. 
And another throws away the map entirely and says, okay, we don't actually need to build 2D or 3D maps. We can actually just encode the semantics of things like this object is on top of another object. Um, this object is openable or not openable and basically reconstruct the metadata of the simulator itself and then plan over it. Um, which in some sense provides like the upper bound of how far you can get with just PDDL to try to mimic the actual Alfred challenge itself, which is a fun approach. So our second place um, paper, which I won't go through a whole video for, basically adds a bunch of hand-coded recovery policies for stuff like when I run into a wall, I should not continue to run into the wall. If I try to open a cabinet and it doesn't open, I should take a step back and try again. Um, and they do this by asking a person to say whether or not the recovery action was successful or not. So they build in a notion of like the pragmatics of the recovery. So if I open a cabinet, it tries to open, closes again. There's a couple of things that might have gone wrong. Maybe the agent is too close. Maybe the cabinet actually can't open. Maybe there's another cabinet already open that needs to be closed before this one can be open. And so when we try to execute the recovery behavior, we can have a person say like, oh, okay, I think this will or will not work. And it turns out that extra annotation goes a long way in improving performance. And our challenge winner, again, by contrast, throws away the explicit mapping entirely and just says, what if we actually tried to memorize the actual metadata of the simulator by our visual observations? So encoding things like objects, relationships to one another in a spatial semantic graph, and then writing basically hand-coded planners for here's how you stack uh, a fork into a cup and put the cup into a countertop. Now I can do all of the stacking tasks as long as I've discovered the graph over which I'm executing. Um, and it turns out this works really well. Um, almost as well, or a little bit better than the recovery policies. So this is about 5% better, or 0.5% better than second place. Both of them place around 36%, which is a huge improvement, over twice as good as last year's mapping-based approaches, which we're getting about 16 at the time of the deadline. Um, and then if we go all the way back to 2020, with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models being the, the top tier, we were at less than 5%. Of course, when we released Alfred, our big joke was that our initial performance was 2%, I think, on the unseen set. We were barely getting anything right at all. This is crazy good progress, um, which makes me worried because when something is getting uh, better and better, that means that the models will someday solve it and I have to do something much harder. So what made Alfred too easy? Alfred was too easy because we don't have to ask any questions about what's gonna be done. We basically get a trajectory from a planner that says, here's how you execute cooking an apple. You first you slice it, then you pick up the slice, you put the slice in the microwave, or, right. Um, and at no point does the agent have to ask where the apple is. It implicitly is told in the instructions where to find the apple, uh, where to find the knife to slice the apple. It's given all of the information it needs. And so if we reframe this as a dialogue problem where our agent has to actually elicit this information, when to ask a question, what question to ask, and maybe even model how we would answer that question if we had our full information about the simulator, we can introduce a much harder uh, task. So in Alfred, we addressed only how to perform the answer to questions. And in our next challenge, Teach, we're hoping to also address how to ask those questions and how to generate answers for them. So in Teach, we got human-human demonstrations of one person knowing what task needs to be done. Uh, for example, putting all the forks in a sink and one person actually being able to execute in the simulator. They can only communicate via language. I won't go through the full interface, but basically this is a huge, terrible mechanical Turk task um, where you have to get people who are really good at using AI2 Thor to play with each other for 10 to 15 minutes at a time to generate the games. And you get some cool stuff. So in Alfred, all of our demonstrations are programmatic. Um, which means they're very formulaic, they follow sort of the same steps over and over, and it also means you can write a PDDL planner that solves them, right, as we've just seen. Uh, humans have ingenuity, and they can do cool stuff that the system wouldn't necessarily think to do. So here's an example where um, I'm going to have the, the dialogue sort of flow on the right-hand side of this panel, and our actions will tick up over time. So the first thing that happens is our driver asks, what should I do? And the driver is the person actually moving around in the simulator. Commander says, please boil a potato. Driver says, OK, and starts along the task of boiling the potato. They find the potato by themselves without being told to do so or where it is. They take a cup out of a pot because they know that they need the pot to be full of water so they can boil the potato. They turn the sink off. This is all without additional instructions. The pot won't fit in the sink. They try again. It's actually too big to fit in the space. And they ask if there's another pot. And the commander comes up with a solution. 
you could try filling the cup with water and emptying it into the pot instead. So this kind of like problem solving never shows up in Alfred. One, the simulator couldn't support pouring yet. But two, we don't have this like extra interaction of having a person solve the problem. So they fill the cup pot with water and they're able to boil the potato and the whole thing is over. And we can do this for like really long um, dialogues. So I don't know if we'll play this one all the way through because it's a minute and a half long and I don't want to keep you all longer than you're already here, but this is making breakfast. So we've got to have two people work together to make some coffee. They've got to slice up some potatoes, uh, cook the potatoes, slice up tomatoes and lettuce, put them on a plate, plate our whole little breakfast potatoes and tomato combo together with the coffee on the table. Um, and so this thing runs for like hundreds and hundreds of time steps. So Alfred was already really long, teaches even longer. Um, and modeling this thing is, infeasibly hard, potentially. But that's what we thought when we introduced Alfred too. We were getting 2% success. And you'll be happy to know that unlike our 2% success rate in our initial Alfred release, when we try to model both the person actually moving the agent around, accomplishing tasks, and the person providing instructions for those tasks, we are currently able to achieve, it's not zero. Anthony, what is it? It's not, it's like, it's one above zero. 0 0.016 is our initial entry to our to our two agent leaderboard. And that means that in one task, the agents did one thing correctly, which I'm happy to show you now. Um, so this is taking an off the shelf Alfred model, the episodic transformer, um, which was reasonably state of the art last summer before all the mapping modules happened, training it on the teach data and then providing a rule based commander that just says the next thing that needs to happen. So we're not actually generating language in any clever way. We're just saying, what's the current sub goal that needs to happen next? Spit that out as an instruction and attempt to execute the instruction based on the data. So in this example, our task is to prepare breakfast. Commander says that, and then just starts repeating the sub goal, which is make some copy uh, and put it in a clean mug. And so our trained agent is able to eventually find a coffee cup and it will take the coffee cup to a coffee maker, which mercifully is already turned on. And so when it puts the coffee cup inside, it manages to make the coffee. There it is, 0.016%. And so I welcome people to think about ways to apply our recent mapping approaches in Alfred that are getting really like impressive grounding results to teach where we no longer have super formulaic programmatic demonstrations, but actual demonstrations, a lot of human ingenuity and problem solving has to go into these. Um, these are both available here. I think Jonathan and I both have students who are involved in the challenges around if you want to ask them more concrete coding questions. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. And then we'll save all your questions for the uh, Q&A session at four. Uh, we had one sort of last minute entry um, from Habitat, which we will present now. Uh, hi, I'm Santosh, uh, and I'm here to talk about the Habitat Challenge 2022. Uh, and just to give some context, uh, we were supposed to uh, conclude the challenge at this workshop, but then uh, we got delayed, and so it's being extended a little bit. So I'm just trying to provide some context for the challenge. Uh, and so in this challenge, uh, okay, so we have two parts of the talk. One is the challenge itself, and then the data set that we are using for the challenge, which is a new data set called Lesson 3D Semantic. Uh, so the object map challenge itself, uh, here's the context. So you have an agent that's in a, a previously unseen and unexplored environment, and it's given a goals like fun So The agent then needs to navigate to this object using RGB, depth, and the GPS and compass sensors, and stop within one meter of the object to successfully complete the task. And so the performance for this task is again based on this uh, success rated by party uh, metric where we measure uh, the efficiency of the path in uh, in comparison to the shortest path to the goal. 
So we compare the path length taken by the agent and we come uh, with the shortest path and see how close they are and the metric is based on that. And so uh, the, the new part about this is the HMPD semantic data set. And so we are just introducing this recently. So this is the largest ever data set of uh, uh, semantic annotations for indoor scenes. It consists of uh, 120 uh, scenes with dense 3D annotations as you can see here. And uh, uh, and yeah, like uh, so the way we obtained this was uh, we had annotators go to the actual 3D scene and paint the model in 3D to obtain these dense, uh, dense annotations. And so overall, as you can expect, it took 12,000 hours uh, and more of human effort to achieve this. And um, and yeah, so uh, the, the underlying scenes are based on uh, like a previously published data set called Habitat Matterport 3D, uh, which are shown to have high quality uh, visuals, high quality uh, reconstructions and so on. And so uh, here are some examples of the scenes. And so uh, clearly like uh, we have the, uh, the mesh on the left, which is given as input to the annotator. And on the right, you can see the result of the annotations. And you can clearly see that they're densely annotated and uh, uh, like every every pixel in the mesh has been annotated with a specific object category. And here's another example. And so this is clearly very rich data. And uh, uh, when we uh, visualize uh, render the semantic images and the RGB images, uh, uh, you know, in the perspective view, again you can see that the annotations are super rich, and the object boundaries are also pretty crisp because the annotations are performed in 3D. And so we hope that this will be a valuable resource for the community. Uh, and as such, the object distribution is uh, pretty diverse. And uh, uh, you can see the, the long tail of the object distribution, which is useful to have. And finally, yeah, we have the object nav challenge now introduced in this HM3D semantic data set. So we have 80 train, 20 val, and 20 test scenes. And uh, we introduce only six gold categories this time, bed, chat, plant, sofa, toilet, and green monitor. And uh, here are uh, the statistics of the validation episodes. And clearly, you can see there's a distribution over the difficulty levels in terms of the distance between the starting position and the goal position, as well as the distribution over the different goal categories. Uh, and uh, this challenge is announced on March 18th. It's still ongoing. And we've uh, already received 600 plus submissions from over 20 teams. And the new challenge deadline has been extended to August 31st. So we're looking forward to more participation. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Great. So uh, we're, we're ending a little bit early uh, with the this uh, initial part of the challenge discussion. So I think we'll take maybe a what, seven minute break and then come back uh, at 3.50 to, to start up on the, uh, the Q&A. Thank you. Actually, let's do four. Uh, we'll just take a little bit longer so that anybody who's planning to come and wants to see it from the start can see it from the start. So, four o'clock. Good night. Thanks.
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you do. You're so quiet. Are you kidding me? So can I just like steal one of these? Yeah, they were brought out this morning. And like no one has <laughs> dope. Well, we need everyone has to have proximity to a mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like intense proximity to a mic. Oh, <laughs> we didn't have COVID before now. <laughs> well, that's how I felt about the lunchroom. I actually left. I went in there to get the box lunches. Mm, and I was like, there's like literally thousands of people in here all at the same time. It was just like one person. Bad idea. I feel about every player. And right, I'm happy to start hosting the interaction panel for the Embodied AI workshop. And first, let's go one by one through each of our panelists. Introduce yourself to which data set do you work on, what tasks do you like, and where you're from. It's a good idea. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Luca Weiss. Uh, I'm from the Allen Institute of AI, um, and uh, we are working on the AI2 rearrangement challenge. Uh, which is all about uh, moving around objects and uh, understanding scenes. Hello, I'm Yonatan from uh, CMU. And does this, the data set that we like and the one that we work on have to be the same? <laughs> um, all right, fine. I work, uh, Alfred is, is my, uh, is my ta task of choice for the moment. I'm Jesse. I'm at the University of Southern California. Um, my task of choice currently is the teach data set. I'm Andrew, I'm from Georgia Tech, and uh, task of choice is Habitat 2.0. I'm from Judy Austin, and my task of choice is Object Now on Habitat. Awesome. So one of the big questions we usually get is that simple real can more or less work for some navigation tasks, but it's much harder for these real world interaction tasks where you sort of have to model these fine grained interactions. Do we have to sort of simulate this so the fine green interaction in simulators to actually generalize to the real world, or can we do some shorter cut instead of sort of modeling the entire real world, which we're actually sort of training agents in these simulators to generalize to the real world? What are your thoughts on that? And maybe I'll start with Luca. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I guess I'm, I'm biased. So obviously uh, we at AI2 have chosen to go down the route of not modeling every uh, little physical interaction that's out there. Um, I think the idea there is, I guess, twofold. One, um, for grasping these types of robotic -y, uh, problems, there are uh, a lot of people working on them that are very good at robotics, and there are a lot of great solutions that exist already. So um, if you sort of extract, abstract away that component um, and learn the sort of higher level planning, um, the hope is that you can then rely uh, on those lower level uh, sort of robotics people to solve the grasping problem for you. Um, yeah, I, I guess I said there was two, but let's, let's start with one. And, uh, <laughs> go back to it. Um, I agree, but I think it's important to strike a balance of something that's still physically realistic. So for instance, like the robot probably should still have to move its arm in a position that's suitable to actually grasp the object so that there can be some pipeline where if you want to plug in some grasping module or something like that, then it is possible. And I think all the simulators are moving in like the right direction towards uh, that way of doing things where you actually have to move an arm. There's actually physics. You can bump into things uh, and you need to position the grasp uh, to be just right. But I think there can be some level of abstraction still. I'll twist the question and say that you can 
probably never simulate humans. And so uh, there's a limit to any simulator period ever that's going to actually interact with us in the world and stuff like this. And so then there's really this question um, and extending this sort of simulation gap question to, to that as well. Um, so what are you actually able to get out of that? And then at what point you just actually have to have you know, the other intelligent agents around that it's going to be interfacing with. I guess just, just adding on to that, at some point, like you said, we're not going to be able to simulate everything. And so we're going to have to learn things in the real world. So it's about getting agents into positions in which they can succeed when they're actually in the real world. Um, and uh, I guess the hope is that we just abstract just enough to get to that point. All right, let's make this into a fight. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so, no, so, so I think, I guess maybe one way to view this question then would be, um, or, or if I'm going to try to put increasingly language hat on here is, um, when we say that we need it to be close enough, but the vast majority of things, like the way that things are situated in the world are basically just social constructs, then you are never, like for instance, like we talked about, you know, making coffee or setting the table. These are nice, cute examples, but there's a literally infinite set of these things. And so when we say that we need them to be able to generalize, do we mean it like, oh, well, if a system can, can, um, can learn N procedures, we assume it can learn 2N or 100N? Is that kind of the, the thought process? Uh, so I guess I would try to bring it to the, like the developmental literature type of idea. So that there are some like base uh, core physical reasoning principles that you know humans use to understand the world, and they are able to do like leverage those in a very very flexible way. And so if we were able to replicate that kind of understanding, then you could sort of scaffold your understanding of all these constructs on top of that. Um, so I guess that's sort of a non answer, but uh, it is also sort of an answer. <laughs> I mean, we don't actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is very sort of related to the last question, but one curious question that people have been asking is, what are your pipe dreams for simulators, say, in the next 10 years that you think can actually be achievable, but sort of aren't there yet? What do you hope to see if you're sort of asking everyone who's developing these simulators? Go for it. Yeah. Um, well, I think one obvious thing that generally benefits everybody is just faster simulation speeds, higher fidelity rendering. Uh, it just makes it everybody, things easier for everybody to, to iterate. Um, I think another thing personally for me is with uh, kind of the goals that we ask of agents. So for instance, you know, right now it might be, I think uh, it was touched on earlier, where there's a lot of these goals are very specific. It's telling the agent exactly what to do, but in real home situations, there's a lot of ambiguity in the types of goals we want to assign. The goal space seems to be a lot larger, whether it's from language or something like that. So I think having these rich and flexible goals would also be good. I really want super tight API integration to a physical robot. Like what I actually want is not a simulator, right? What I really want is to basically have a magic wand that lets me buy 100,000 robots and put them in a bunch of people's houses and have them interact with them. And since I can't do that, um, if my simulator has at least really tight integration, then things that I learn there um, allow me to sort of do a, an easier transfer if I'm able to get my hands on 10 or 100 of these types of, these types of things. So I think that's, that's like, now I understand the problem is we don't have a standardized robot platform that we're all just agreed on, right? Like I am, I'm aware of that, but, but I think that's sort of roughly um, that goal because then for me, any linguistic construct is going to, in some way, have to map down to either a specific or a sequence of those API calls. And so the extent to which those uh, are shared or transfer means that I can then take real world interactions or simulated interactions and share them. So uh, of course, really like all the answers so far. Uh, I think I'll, I'll answer a slightly different question. Um, so I think one of the things we're really missing is a lot of standardized tooling. So we have, we have some sort of everybody open source of the code. It's all in slightly different formats, like different libraries. And there's probably some argument to be made that new tasks that come out, we don't know if they're hard because it's very difficult to apply all of the existing techniques that are out there on them. Um, and so we don't even, or I would probably say that we don't even know exactly what we need in the simulator because we don't know what is solved in the simulators that we have. Um, so we, we need to have some sort of unified way of, or at least a slightly better way of sharing uh, all the code and the ideas and the trained models that we have. Yeah, I think you could also, sorry, what are you doing? Are you leaning in? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, go, 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 go. Uh, this is completely unrelated. No, it's okay. Yeah, so one thing that I've been uh, 
talking about a lot is uh, we do want robots to stay in a house for a really long time but right now they stay only for 500 steps a thousand steps and that is something i really want to see in the next five years that you can actually simulate a robot living in a house for two years with humans in some form and then trying to see what problems arise out of that and whether the solutions we're developing right now actually apply to those scenarios because i think at that point we already have a good map of the environment we already know where most of the objects are and so what solutions we are developing actually will be useful at that point so i think that'd be cool yeah i just want to chime in and build on that i think anybody who's worked with basically any physical platform will know uh, one of the big things that's missing in any simulator that has a robot body is the cord um, or the battery life, right? So if we're gonna think about having robots exist for a long time, I think two things that are missing from these simulators are, uh, especially the photorealistic simulators, articulated objects, like things that actually move besides the mesh plus photorealism doesn't exist. You have to pick one or the other. Um, and the robot body is one unit, where in reality, after you bump into a thing a couple of times, like the chassis starts getting shakier, like you actually lose some control, your dead reckoning is worse. And being able to model that in the simulator to prepare for it would be really cool. My sort of vaguely related comment here, and which is also related to yours, is that like, um, like we don't have standardization even within the simulator about things like how, like the heights of these agents. And like, I'm not saying that we should standardize that necessarily, but that means that we should lean into it. And so if we're going to start to create things where we're like, hey, well, is this going to work? Well, and maybe that means that the next data set that we release or something like this really needs to have agents with it, you know, where heights are within some range, arms are within some distance, whatever it might be. And that your models have to be able to sort of adapt to that. So I think one of the components is that you have to be able to handle that. Otherwise, like we have this problem where even if you have seen someone transfer something, for example, onto a physical robot, but then you go and buy the exact same hardware and the exact same 360 camera and wherever else you have to like measure to the quarter inch, like where you're gonna <laughs> hang it. Like it, that's like sort of not an ideal situation for us to be in. I guess building on that with an anecdote. So when we did this proctor project and transfer to Habitat, uh, our findings were zero shot numbers were very, very low and we were trying to understand why that was the case. And one of the things there was just that the camera was at a wrong angle. And it's like, it is, uh, it is very surprising what these little changes um, can, uh, can, can do. So it'd be nice to have standardization. It would also be nice to have models that didn't care about something that they can immediately change if they wanted to. <laughs> yeah. So one of the other questions that came up from the Alfred and Teach uh, talks that we saw just a little while earlier is, do you expect the gains from mapping to go away when you scale the diversity of environments and sort of scale up the models largely? Or when you scale up, do you sort of expect these mapping approaches to also sort of similarly scale um, as they currently are? I don't actually like maps. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that they're useful, but I think that I think that it's what we actually want are sort of like um, hierarchical abstractions of space. And so this is this this notion that basically I do want my agent to know that an end table is probably in a bedroom and that a bedroom is probably connected to a hallway or something like this. But I don't necessarily want to always be trying to turn that into uh, sort of X, Y coordinates. It feels like the wrong level at which to, uh, you know, to be reasoning about things. I understand that I do that in my own paper, but like, if, <laughs> but that's like sort of not ideally where I, where I want to be. It's like, I want the agent to be at that other level. And I think related to that is that I really wish there was a way to supervise at a semantic level. So I really wish there was a way to basically say like, Hey, you did like the completely wrong thing, but you were trying to do the right thing. And that's like, that's good. Um, and we don't have that. And so instead what we're doing is sort of supervising on either uh, success or like distance to goal or things like this, which is like, I understand that it's a proxy, but it, it's, uh, it's sort of frustrating. I don't know how you feel. Teach boy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I like maps. <laughs> a map is great. A map turns a problem that's arbitrarily complicated into an O of one, right? You learned on the same little patch and now you've got the same little patches and put it at test time. Um, but I agree that uh, level of abstraction should probably be higher, especially because as somebody who cares about language, I don't talk about things in the X, Y coordinate space, right? Like we are generally talking at a level of abstraction that maps don't represent. Um, and so aligning those a little bit better makes sense to me. 
which gets into a whole other topic that I have been trying to get some of these students to care about in visio linguistic mapping of trying to get uh, some language informed maps uh, as a method. It's actually kind of related to a question that I can't remember came up at some point this morning about like, it, it was, uh, someone was asked about like, are we going to get to a point where, um, what was it like navigating to the airport or something like this came up, right? And it's like, what I want is to think like, okay, well, I know that that means getting to either A, a bus stop, B, a shuttle, C, uh, you know, somewhere I could call, like, that's the level at which I want my maps. I want them at these sort of uh, slightly higher semantic programmatic levels and then how they get implemented from there I'm, I'm less uh, you know yeah so I both like and dislike maps uh, so uh, I guess the, the, I totally agree with everything that the, you know in the sense that humans obviously don't have like xy coordinates in their brains I, I assume um, at least not to the fidelity of a, uh, a map um, but at the same time I, I want our agents to be able to be better than humans in a lot of ways. I mean, certainly GPS or like the navigation through Google Maps is way better than I am, and I would like to keep it that way. So it's a little bit uh, not either or. I think it's sort of an and. Um, we should have agents that can complain at a higher global level and uh, with sort of uh, like more semantic, less concrete abstractions, and ones that are actually planning with X Y coordinates and hopefully can do it at the same time or drug querying or something like this. I wrote a lot of maps and I love them, but uh, <laughs> I, I do think that end-to-end uh, uh, -end methods, they are very powerful and they're easy to work with. Maps are not easy to work with, which is what I don't like about them. Uh, if I have to uh, train a map-based model or if I need to just implement a heuristic on a map-based model, I have to worry about so many different edge cases that might be causing my success rate to go down by 10 thousand for no reason. And, uh, so yeah, I do think a mix of map-based and end-to-end -end methods are necessary, but uh, we need to get end-to-end -end people to care about maps to make map building faster. So uh, I really hope that it happens. Soon. I guess my, I guess part of my issue. Sorry, this is like a support group for maps now. Um, <laughs> I think, I think part of my issue with maps is that basically, so I understand this argument, like our agents should just be better than humans, and humans are like a proof of concept, but not the end goal here. But on the other hand, there's kind of this weird explosion in terms of space and computation. So like, do I really want my system to have like every single time it learns anything, have like this arbitrarily detailed spatial you know, map of, you know, like I've been to New Orleans a dozen times. I don't remember where anything is until I'm here. And then I'm sort of like, oh yeah, that place I, I think was like generally in that direction. And then like, I start to kind of reconstruct a map on the fly. I'm able to find the same bars that I've been to before. Um, and then I'm going to forget it. Like, you know, and, and like, I think that's sort of more what I mean. I sort of want this notion that like, you have just enough information that you're able to then instantiate it once you're positioned, but then you also aren't literally storing like, oh yeah, yeah, there's a bump in the curve here. There, you know, like, or whatever it might be. I mean, that's my concern, yeah. I, I think generally the, like if you look at stuff like savants and whatnot, they, if you have the perfect recall, you generally have a imperfect ability to reason over that recall in like a meaningful way. And so I totally, I mean, I, I think if you are just memorizing all your maps and suddenly thinking about the more like higher level understanding of what those maps mean, it's gonna be more difficult. So from that perspective, I can like see from it. <laughs> this is more of a broader question, but we're looking for sort of inspired by the rearrangement results. So in Proctor, you have these incredibly diverse scenes and data, uh, and overfitting really isn't an issue anymore. So do you think this task can be sort of solved by some big model that just creates for sort of a long time? And more generally, do you think we're just sort of in like this waiting period where we're just waiting for more and more data to come up and sort of computers get faster and faster, and we're just waiting uh, and in a waiting game for sort of everything else to catch up and, and we'll be finally caught up? Take it before I critique, uh, before I critique Proctor, can I, can I critique it? Um, yes, I think that you can probably memorize a American Western home standard architecture from within the last 30 to 40 years of um, uh, sort of paradigms. Uh, that is not the conditions that the vast majority of the humans on this planet live in. And unless you're gonna plan to instrument every single design that has ever been or will ever be, um, I don't think that's like, I, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't 
use those those things. I think that they're they're encoding very useful semantic priors. But I think that like if I was on a campsite and someone said like, oh yeah, I left it on my end table joking, but it was really literally just a log that was next to a pillow, I would still understand them. And so like I think there's kind of this, I, I just want to caution against maybe overfitting to the type of house that you know this you know subset of people in this country live in um, versus like what it means to be in a house. Yeah. I mean, now that you attack process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so I think the beauty of like procedural generation is to like yeah. begin to nitty gritty as uh, you can condition it on like the, the facts on the ground, right? So um, you, you don't need to go to every single possible house in the world. You just need to get a, a good diverse sample and then you can generate and perhaps over generate to over represent types of houses that you wouldn't uh, normally see in America, in a, a country that is generally pretty wealthy. Um, so so long as we are aware of the biases, uh, I think there are clear ways in which we can attempt to mitigate them. Um, I do agree probably that, uh, you know, just, I would be very surprised if scaling up for embodied AI was sufficient. Uh, I would like to see some more uh, inductive biases being built into models that actually uh, make them, you know, reason about the world, at least somewhat more similarly to the way that humans do. Um, and outside of kind of the practical work, uh, work and just kind of generally what Habitat 2.0 has been pushing, uh, I think we have definitely been going for more of this like end to end approach. and. Just what we've seen even kind of on the you know previous tasks we've worked on and the tasks we're pushing on in the future uh it does kind of seem like to a degree these end-to-end -end approaches as we scale simulators to be orders of magnitude faster as we bring in more data that these algorithms or i mean this, these methods can scale but i don't think it's necessarily a waiting game because you know all that takes a lot of hard work from the simulators to the data sets and to the algorithms that scale uh but yeah for like i guess the habitat 2.0 team uh we are kind of pursuing that end to end, pushing that direction. Definitely. I, I do think the end to end like direction is very uh, alluring. It is something that we can like get our hands on immediately. I, I do think there's this weird disconnect also in like what people really expect from robots versus what the embodied AI community has been able to give so far, in the sense that we're very happy if we can get 95% accuracy. That's like solved for us. Um, but if you have a robot that's failing 20 times out of, or one time out of 20, that's completely undeployable. Um, so th there's a sort of tension between our end-to-end -end systems going to get us like 99% of the way there, um, and is that even meaningful if we actually need it 99.9999? Um, so maybe you know safety and reliability or something that pure end-to-end -end systems are not going to be enough for. This is inspired a little bit by uh, just oh yeah. <laughs> so I was going to ask a different question, uh, if that's okay. So since we have uh, language people on the panel, um, wanted to ask uh, about a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half, or uh, so it's a instant virtual data foundation model instead of which kind of a of course, these are not the master language model is not the foundation of uh, the castle is there. So if I think about what is, there's an argument being made that the foundation of thought and the foundation of intelligence is that we can move and see and perceive and react to the um, And that's presumably why we're here in the room. It's like the model of hypothesis and so on. That doesn't leave much room for language, or at least doesn't, doesn't say much, doesn't put language as a necessary problem. Yet when I look at results that, that, that are being reported, it's clear that scaling language models is producing interesting behavior. So help, help me reconcile uh, what we are aiming for and what we are actually seeing. What is the foundation of intelligent behavior? <laughs> no. I appreciate small topics and questions that are easy to answer. Um, so, okay, so two, two or three quick things. Um, one is no, language is not necessary for intelligence. Um, two, language is necessary for human intelligence. Uh, and uh, I'm going to distinguish those, and we, which we can go into more in a second. Um, and uh, three, yes, large language model scaling is incredibly impressive, 
particularly when what I, the way I characterize it, when you have a oracle encoder decoder, when in a when a fluent adult speaker produces the text and a fluent adult speaker interprets the text. But the second that you, which is part of the reason I think that we're interested in this space in particular, is that the second that I remove one of those assumptions, whether it's that I put a child on the receiving end or a robot on the receiving end, I have basically nothing um, from that system that I can use because those symbolic, you know, prim you know primitives that is pushing around are are, are meaningless. Um, now, I don't. I'm not going to like. Is it the case there, there's this art? You know, there's this argument if I seen enough text will i eventually have seen patterns that are similar in such ways that they uh, would encode other you know uh, similar sort of properties that i would have seen if i had enough physical exposure to the world or something like this um i'm at this point not convinced that that's true um but if i'm going to play devil's advocate to myself um the scale of these models be they large are still orders of magnitude smaller than our brains so like Fair enough, but if I'm going to now argue back against myself, against having <laughs> argued against myself, um, these large scale models are also training, like the most recent ones are training on roughly 1 trillion tokens of text for, for, for context that's roughly the same amount of text as every single tweet for an entire year over the entire world, which is just more text than you will ever see it's three orders of magnitude larger than the entirety of English Wikipedia. Um, and yet you are a fluent speaker who's able to produce arbitrarily new new constructions and so it does so so i'm not necessarily going to comment on whether or not it's impossible to get to intelligence that way but it is sure as hell super inefficient um and so I, i'm like very hesitant to move that way and i think that what everyone in this room is bringing to the table is this other uh intelligence hopefully that is based off of um sort of all of the semantics of the world, which therefore allows for fast mapping. Arguing in favor of language, this is a windy answer, um, but I'll stop with this, is that, and this goes back to the setting the table example from earlier, there is the reason that we need to distinguish between intelligence generally and human intelligence is that the vast majority of what we do is a social construct and is not something that is just naturally emergent. And so therefore um, most concepts are not things that I would expect you to just sort of be able to observe, right? Setting of a table is a silly sort of thing that we have dictated and like where your fork is supposed to be or other things like this. It's not the, that's, that's not even um, universally true of, you know, our cultures. That's like a specific whatever. And in this city, if I showed up at a table and there was a bowl and a hammer, um, that would be setting the table because that's how um, some of my Creole dishes are gonna be served. Um, so like, so I think that, it, you, there's, this, there's this large semantic space, which is sort of only interpretable or encoded in language, but I also do not think that it is emergent solely from language. So I am basically going to argue against myself and for myself. <laughs> Amen. Yes. <laughs> Jesse, do you have a more intelligent and actually, you know, succinct answer? I have a shorter one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to Drew's point and to simplify, I think everything Jonathan said, I think we'd prob we would probably be in agreement that the foundation of intelligence is interacting with the world and the foundation of human intelligence is interacting with each other. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, big bucks. There we go. <laughs> but that's because if, if it takes a trillion tokens to get to yeah. intelligent you know, language understanding, yeah i mean i don't expect to do this in our lifetimes if that helps um i think i think there's a bunch of issues here right so like one of my main frustrations with the scaling approach if we compare it to us is like part of what we're all doing is this weird tabula rasa rediscovery of everything evolution provided us right and evolution did not connect our like you know what you know broca and wernicke you know parts of our brain to our visual cortex directly and yet we take a transformer with a bunch of patches and tokens and just let them completely willy-nilly interact with each other so we're just definitely not 
taking the most efficient path here. And so my ideal situation would be that we would have these intended systems that could interact without your correct having tens of trillions or whatever the equivalent visual tokens and observations and interactions would be. But that might mean that we really should be trying to re, re you know, rediscover all of evolution with every model we train. Yeah. Uh, so for interacting panel, <laughs> thank you all. And we're going to move on to our uh, speaker panel. Excuse me. Excuse me, one minute to come up with mean questions for Drew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, try to get, uh, we can have the uh, speakers uh, come on up. Uh, we'll be starting the speaker panel after our usual audio visual uh, exception. Yeah, so we're going to uh, wait just a minute or two for uh, to to join us, and then we'll uh, get started on our speaker panel. In the meantime, I want to thank everyone for coming and thank all of our attendees, uh, uh, our speakers, to thank our challenge uh, organizers and the challenge uh, participants. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, workshop. I was really excited to see how many people were uh, attending the poster session, which I didn't completely get to see because people kept coming up and talking to me as I tried to get close to the posters, but that's, I could figure that was a win uh, because uh, I think the entire point of that is to establish a collaboration. Um, and uh, much like uh, uh, Thor and uh, the Second Avengers movie, I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. And I know everyone knows our panelists, but I think the question that was uh, asked uh, earlier was um, uh, for our challenge participants was a good one. So I was wondering if uh, all of our uh, panelists could introduce themselves, where they're from, and what their favorite uh, data set or problem is. And maybe we can start with uh, our uh, our uh, remote people first. Uh, so, uh, I'll take it. Actually, I didn't hear the question very clearly. Um, I don't know about Carolina. It's not, I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Okay, let can you see if you can hear this. Uh, I was asking everyone to uh, introduce themselves and say what, uh, where they're from and what their favorite data set uh, to work on is. Uh, where are they? F uh, you mean my name? Yes, yes, we're, we're just reintroducing everyone in case someone. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Fei Fei. <laughs> uh, the favorite data is working on embodied AI. Is that the question? Yeah. Well, I guess I'm biased. I presented behavior, so I have to stand by behaviors. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be my pick. Okay. Carolina? Oh. Yeah, it was not letting me on mute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Carolina Parada. I'm one of the leads at Google Robotics. Um, I would say my favorite problem is, is social interaction, so social navigation. I don't think we have a good data set yet for that. Yeah, so social navigation. All right. Um, my name is Drew Butler. Uh, I'm at Penguin Georgia Tech. I'm 
interested in intelligence and other parameters, so whatever it is. I'm Ruzba Motagi. Uh, I'm from Al Institute for AI, or AI2 for short. Uh, yeah, my favorite data set is obviously AI2 Tor, and then <laughs> Proactor specifically. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Katena Fragiadaki from uh, CMU. Um, I work on perception uh, and action. And regarding the data set, uh, um, I also like AI4, but if you ask me if I like more you know, interaction with the user and dialogue versus just do plain things and find objects. And I, I would go with the plain, simple things first. We're introducing each other and saying which are our favorite data sets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Jitendra Malik. What's my favorite data set? I, I believe that uh, uh, there's this line from George Box about statistics, which is all data sets, all all, all, uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So all data sets are wrong, all simulators are wrong, but some data sets are useful, some simulators are useful. And uh, if I needed to do some promotion, I will do promotion for Ego4D, <laughs> which has uh, come out uh, at this conference. It's, uh, it's like the mother of all data sets. It has 3,600 hours of video collected by 967 people in 14 different countries. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I saw a number of questions that uh, might start to fire, but I'm going to go with one I think might be a little bit more responsible asking about the future of embeddings. Uh, if you take my first slides, that there's a notion of um, the functions to tell us which action to do in a situation. Probabilistic models might give us a distribution over that. Uh, uh, embeddings enable us to have like some kind of latent variable and then groundings, such as the new state can paper, like combining uh, these probabilities from more than one model. But a lot of people in their presentations talk about whacking off the end of the model and then reusing it somewhere else. And this seems to be something I've seen in an in increasing amount. And in the one sense, these come out of the architectures we have, but I'm wondering if we're moving towards being able to combine them into uh, you know, larger, newer ideas. What are the thoughts on the future of use of, them, of developing and using embeddings? I think our field is behind. I think uh, our 2D computer vision colleagues and our NLP colleagues are ahead of us on this and they're showing us what can be done. Uh, there are common base architectures that can be trained, and those representations and embeddings are commonly generalized to a whole bunch of downstream models. Um, it's, there is no compelling argument or evidence that says that shouldn't work for it. Um, and so it is uh, worth pursuing. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, uh, philosophically, I, I totally agree with this idea that you have something pre-trained, a kind of backbone which embodies the distilled wisdom of huge, huge data. And uh, I mean, that, uh, that, that has been used in computer vision and in language. I mean, actually in computer vision, it was earlier than others. I mean, I think we, in the RCNN work, we, we trained on ImageNet and then as a pre-training layer. And then after that, we used, uh, we tried to solve uh, uh, Pascal. So, so these ideas have been in computer vision longer than in language, I would argue. I think that uh, uh, I think that in the space of actions, it has not yet uh, been shown effectively. I think that what's a common back backbone for doing a lot of actions? I don't think we have that. I think that in the action space, it still seems like you're better off doing every task separately. I don't think it will last forever. I uh, but uh, as of yet, we do 
we are starting to have backbones for the other categories, but less so for land. Now it may turn out that action may not uh, may not need as much uh, it, it, because I, the thing with action is that it's so it, it's very embodied. So the skills that I have at the finest level, they are specific to my body, and the robot's body is different, and so on. So there is this fundamental challenge of transfer at the skill level that it is very body dependent, and I don't think there is any magic way out of that. But when we consider higher level actions, uh, procedures, plans, uh, sequencing of various tasks, that part should be very transferable and it should be the same for humans and machines. Um, agreed. I just want to add that uh, embedding of, of uh, like Jatendra said, embedding of information is not, not new anymore. Even the very body of the embodied AI itself is embeddable. We, we recently had a piece of work called Metamorph, where the morphological um, form factor of embodied AI agents itself can be um, that's an interesting um, space to explore, especially we're in the artificial world of machine intelligence. We don't have to really um, you know, follow exactly animal evolution. So, so just from, you know, sensory data to language data to action data to, to the morphological nature of embodied AI, there are ex uh, opportunities to, to do this. Yeah, I just wanted to echo on the side of like, there are a lot of things that we could, we could um, basically leverage from pre-trained models. Uh, like a lot of the semantic representations, a lot of the things that are not specific to one particular embodiment. And when we talk about embodied AI, there is, uh, it is more than just the action itself, right? It's understanding what is being asked to do, understanding your environment well enough, and then taking action. So I think there's a lot of components that can, that can leverage offline data sets or offline models. And we should do that whenever we can. Um, <clears throat> and I think this was repeat, this was mentioned earlier as well. Okay, can I add something? Go for it. Uh, yeah, we have had some some partial. We have had some some partial success uh, using pre-training. Uh, this new proctor that that we train on like ten thousand scenes, it uh, helped us to generalize to, for example, to environments that are like totally different in terms of appearance distribution and and so on. So that's that's useful, but. Uh, but I think for actions themselves, we might not need pre-training. For example, avoiding obstacles, but uh, probably you don't need to see like 10,000 examples to learn avoiding obstacles. But in combination with perception, that, that adds to the complexity. For, for those types of things, I think we need some, uh, some, some, some form of pre-training. Pre-training will be, will be very helpful for us. Uh, but uh, uh, the other point is that uh, these embeddings are, uh, Kind of a small, for example, you have like 500 dimensional embedding that might not be sufficient to capture like all temporal information, capture the map of the environment, capture the uh, localization of the robot and so on. So probably we need some, some more sophisticated uh, architecture or representation for, for embodied tasks. Yeah, and, and just, just I think your question is how can pre-training play in the embodied setup, right? Uh, correct. Well, yeah, so one conjecture here is uh, something that uh, we've seen working a lot on the visual motor, visual language model is the prompting, where you don't just take X and spit out Y, but you have examples of X and Y that you condition your information to spit out the right thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, in the visual motor set is like re replay, replay memory that you're about to do something and you bring up something that you've done before. So it might be that uh, general embodied manipulation, navigation, and so on will also take this path this is just I, I think that's an excellent point, excellent point and thank you for saying that because as i was formulating that question i left that piece out and that's that we've really seen that a lot i, I personally subscribe to the uh embedding hypothesis that it's rather than whether it's embodiment or language but it's that it's developing an embedding which allows you to communicate uh, execute and, and formulate um actions is, is the answer but that's the, the era of symbols is over, the era of vectors is here. Yes. 
So back in the 1970s, uh, this famous Turing Award winners, Newell and Simon, in their Turing Award lecture, they had this thing called the symbol system hypothesis for AI, that all of AI can be captured with symbolic activity. So they just got it wrong. And Chris, Chris Weissmith, who works in the, the Ningo and other large model brain models, has shown that they can implement Axstar and similar symbolic systems in a, a neural thing. And there's strong reasons to believe that those distributional approaches are, are better. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask, uh, as a social robotics researcher, uh, we saw a lot of improvements in the scope of simulations, the interactivity of being able to set things on fire, uh, you know, to pour liquids uh, and so on. Um, but we heard several people say you can't simulate humans. And that, that was not something that was generally a focus of the stuff that, that I was I would see. Um, but if you go over to the gaming AI uh, conference, you know, the GDC, there's hundreds of people trying to create these crowd simulations. It's done in movies as well. So are we taking the easy road out on trying to improve our simulators in the ways that are easy to improve? Should we be focusing really hard on trying to develop better people models? Um, what are your all's thoughts? Should I take it? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's uh... We, we, we can't rely on the game people because uh, what's needed for an effective and compelling game is, is one level. And I think we are talking about a different level of realism. I think the challenge is that to do this well, you, uh, we need to, we, we, we should not just synthesize reality. We should virtualize reality. We should capture the real world and put it into our computer which means that we need to have really effective techniques for capturing human behavior, which starts by, you know, uh, capturing human behavior in the wild. I mean, uh, you know, 3D reconstructions of multiple people interacting in daily life. And that technology is getting better every year. And uh, I think that at some point we will use that and people will can start, are doing work with that even now. So I think it'll get there, but it's not there yet. And it is, it is easier, it is much harder to simulate humans than to simulate physics because physics, everything which we have in our computer programs is known to, was known by the time of Maxwell. There's nothing novel there, it's 150 year old physics. And whereas uh, talking about humans means dealing with social stuff, psychology and so on. Physics is really the easy problems. I always have this line, God must have been a physicist because she gave them all the easy problems. It's your question was about uh, human robot interaction. And I think we should be open to the possibility that it is just not the right time to work on HRI, that uh, that problem is at least 30 years away. Um, and that anything that we do right now is uh, not meaningful progress. Because if you actually look at I have colleagues in my department who do HRI. And if you look at day-to-day -day life of what an HRI researcher is like, large parts of it is getting the damn robot to do something interesting so that the human can actually interact with it. And a large part of that is, you know, having the human play the bandage role of what the robot should have been doing in the first place. And there's an argument to be made that I don't want to help robots. I want robots to help me. Um, and if the hurdles right now are we don't have good autonomous systems and there will be problems in the future when these autonomous systems are, are good enough that there's actually a partnership uh, and that time is not now, we should be open to that possibility. I do not know enough about it. Uh, I'm not actively in that area to say that, that is the case, but we should at least be open that we shouldn't worry about that problem for now. Carolina, or they say? Go ahead, Carolina, if you want to go first. Yeah, I was, I thought you were going to start. Um, I mean, I think that, whoa, sorry, I just turned on something. Um, <clears throat> I think that, in, yeah, today we're not anywhere close to having accurate human simulation so that we could do um, 
yeah, social interactions in, in, in SIM. So um, at the moment, our, our approach is can we try to scale up doing uh, things in, in real directly, which of course is, is never going to be as efficient as having um, hundreds of thousands of examples running in simulation in parallel. But um, that is one thing that we have decided to do. I don't, I, I totally agree with the earlier comment that we need to capture the reality rather than trying to generate human um, behaviors uh, as the game industry does. And there is some work starting to happen on like real to sim, right? I don't think it's focused on human social interactions. It's focused on just capturing environments. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I get a sense that people are just not that interested in bringing the, uh, this, the social interactions into simulation or they find that it's so difficult that they rather solve the other problem first. Um, so that is, that is what I, and that's, that actually reflects what we are doing too, because we think it's so difficult that so we're trying to address it in real first. Maybe there's folks in this, in this, in this uh, workshop that are actually focused on this, apologies, but I don't know. I think we will all benefit from it. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I agree, and I think we should have a little more humility in thinking about the problem of simulating human. It, it is a question of the future, not that we should have worked on it, but we should recognize how we're really probably have taken half a step towards a long, long journey. Um, you know, a lot of simulation today we can do is really based on statistics of the physical world and the simple part of it, the texture, the objects, and, and some mechanistic understanding of human movements, but very still even there is not uh, fully understood. And by the time we're thinking about social interactive, we don't have any causal model of how humans uh, uh, mind and behavior work uh, uh, in full. And this question cannot even be left fully to be answered by uh, um, just the AI community. I think engaging in the psychology, cognitive science, so social science community is also important. So just recognizing how um, rich and complex um, the this this problem is is actually really important and recognizing I for one do not believe statistical models can capture all of this. I think we have to get into causal models um, which is nowhere near to be found yet. I, I agree with Drew that it's uh, it's still early to to work on on this problem. Uh, because uh, right now we are working with like totally static environments and limited set of objects. And uh, the simple task of navigation, our success rate is about like 50%, 60%. So imagine now going, uh, doing like a slightly more complex task, like uh, interacting with people, like bringing something to them or getting, uh, getting something from them. And, 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 and these, these, these types of things, I think we are, we are still very far, far from that, but but it doesn't mean that we should not, we should stop working on this problem. So yeah, the, there there's still a lot of things uh, we can do, but we are still struggling with the basics. So we need to first fix fix. Uh, I mean, solve solve these like simple problems before advancing to the next level and, and solve uh, people interaction or simulating humans and, and these types of things. Uh, so maybe two points uh, that have not been stated, uh, just to to say the. So the NRI, which is the National uh, Robotics Initiative for Collaborative Robotics, uh, shut down uh, and was replaced for another National Robotics Initiative on Foundational Robotics Research, which suggests that you know we really need to make more progress on developing better robots. So that's one side of the story. The other side, what I see is that Alexa and the assistants on the phone and so on are extremely useful to people. So to some extent, I want to say that manipulation has been overrated. Uh, there can be an assistant that doesn't have hands that can listen and see and still help and may engage users and keep them company and help them in their tasks. And, and this has happened with, uh, you know, with the mobile phones and Alexa and so on. Fantastic. Another uh, question that had come up during these uh, discussions is the role of uh, Max. 
and uh, there was a, a debate at the previous uh, um, uh, challenge panel on the, you know using maps or not. And I've, I've heard some people say, well, you don't need maps at all. You need to do visual appearance uh, and just rely on that. Um, but then long horizon problems seem to be challenging in that framework. Conversely, as a roboticist, generally we don't want to deploy robots in buildings unless we can map them just as a safety precaution, but they get stale extraordinarily quickly, um, depending on how robust your mapping is. And so for roboticists, the problem is, well, yes, I can give you a path that can get you to the other side of the building. I just can't guarantee that it's valid. So maps, uh, needed, not needed, fight. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think I think map is is not needed. So the the reason for that is we need to uh, we should represent the environment in in, uh, in forms of continuous vectors and basically the parameters of the neural neural network should represent the map. We should not because there are a lot of issues in building the map. So like what what should be the the uh, the basic building blocks of the map. Do you, do you want to start from objects? Do you want to start from like key points or what, what, what's the right level of representation for a map? But if we uh, uh, use the parameters of the neural network to represent the map, I think that's, uh, that would be more, uh, uh, more powerful compared to like hand design choices and, and, and uh, these, these types of things. So I believe um, map is not, is not really needed in the in the sense of um, like creating um, I mean stitching like different parts of the environment together. So if we have like powerful neural networks that that represent um, the the map of the environment, I think that that's uh, that's more more desirable. So I have a paper appearing at this conference for is mapping necessary for realistic point of navigation. And the answer to that is no, it's not necessary for that task. Um, but I think it's even in that message, it's important to step back and look. Um, animals navigate very well. And at this point of time, there is well understood Nobel Prize winning work that says one of the mechanisms that animals use is mapping, that the hippocampus is involved in creation of what is known as cognitive maps, where animals can you know bees for example can be communicate to each other a uh, direction and a distance with the vagal dance and they're able to uh, find their path uh, blind bull rats are able to navigate and take shortcuts um, nature has stumbled on mapping as a device uh, usually that's a good hint to you know a lot of time has passed and a lot of optimization has gone along the way and so that should at least give us pause uh, it doesn't mean that it needs to be built in, designed for every, every task, but it does mean that it's playing an interesting role. Um, but I would emphasize mapping is an emergent phenomenon. Uh, mapping emerges in neural representations. It is organisms wanting to survive with build maps. Um, and so maybe that's what we're after. Build massive scale simulations and maps will emerge. And I think this is an instance of a larger debate. Today it's maps, tomorrow it's going to be some planner, day after tomorrow it's going to be some semantic mapper. I, I, there's no point having those discussions. The only point is put it up to test. Empiricism will tell us if it emerges, it was necessary. If it doesn't emerge, it didn't need it. Yeah, I, I actually agree with uh, in large measure with Dhruv's uh, answer. Let me add a couple of things. So uh, let's start by looking at the biology. And uh, I mean, there are organisms which make use of spatial representations. The word map is overloaded. It's a suitcase word. I mean, it can be interpreted in many different ways. There is one notion of map, which I think the robotics people glommed on to in 2000 or whatever, which is the SRAM notion of map, which I think is neither necessary nor sufficient. Uh, that exact geometric map of the environment is neither necessary nor sufficient. And uh, okay, I think what we know from sort of the, the biology part of it is that 
maps are very approximate. They're more topological in nature. They're not detailed exact metric uh, uh, kind of things. And we use more than maps. So we use landmarks. I mean, we meaning various species use landmarks, including humans. So there'll be a visual landmark and there are studies from like people like Tinbergen and others, which show the importance of both landmarks and maps. We don't need to argue about, is it one or the other? Both are used that I think both should be used in our system. I think what I, I because there is a one definition of map, which I like, which is some kind of memory based on your past experience, which has a spatial organization. I mean, this is a very fuzzy, goosey woozy kind of definition, but that's the definition of map that I regard as, as a good one. The, the, the roboticists basically, okay, we, we did structure for motion, the robotics people renamed it SRAM, and then they made a religion out of it. <laughs> and, and it's time to sort of, uh, you know, get out of that local minimum. And I think in the last four years in our community, we have sort of shown how effective navigation can be without building detailed metric maps. So don't make that as like necessary and sufficient. Yeah, I guess the question was maps or no maps. And then we, we started talking about different representations of maps. I, I think that we don't have to, um, I think that basically as we operate, we build uh, semantic representations of, yeah, based on our experience and then we should leverage it. So if you have some high level understanding of the space, you should leverage it. You should not make it so that if you don't have it, you can't function, which is what happens today, right? If you're in the map category, you build your map and if you are delocalized, everything breaks. And so I think the way we need to do is um, if we have some representation of the environment, we leverage it and then we keep updating it so it's fluid. Um, and we, that helps us navigate more efficiently and basically do things in that environment more efficiently. So I would say yes to maps, and uh, but not have it be something static that is, is constraining what you can and cannot do. Instead, it's something fluid that you keep updating. And how you represent it, I think it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. I think as an engineering question, I agree with all of you. Be you know, just be opportun opportunistic and see how uh, you know in different situations and how it works and what's the best representation. As a science question, I highly recommend Barbara Sversky's book, Mind in Motion. And uh, there's a lot of profound discussions of spatial cognitive maps, reference systems, and all that. And I think it's worth connecting that to, um, again, the, the, the very question of intelligence itself. Yeah, I mean, I would do plus one to Barbara's book. And she very clearly talks about the fact that it is not explicit, the geometric structure. It's, it is, uh, there are various ways in which it differs from that geometric slam ideal. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't have anything to add. I think the yeah, trend that covered it all. And uh, hey, hey, I, yeah, we, we do have special representations. They don't need to be metric, uh, right? Uh, now, I think maybe the controversy starts from there are already very useful robots out there like Roomba that map the environment and that is okay. And uh, I think being opportunistic, the same way that I think the, the answer to your question is this boring question of we need both. Uh, the same way the brain has a lot of different coordinate systems. We do have an ecocentric coordinate system. We do have an anthropocentric with different representation with different coordinate systems. The same way potentially we need to, to go here, right? I, I personally want my robot to drive out, look at the wall now. I was told it to go find the conference room. I wanted to go look at the wall now, drive to the conference room, and come back to me with the slam map that was running in the background. But it shouldn't have started with the slam map. Um, so we're about at halfway point. I want to stop and see if there are any questions for the audience. I don't have access to the, um, the questions for the Slack, but if people would step up to the mic or step up on behalf of someone that's speaking on the Slack. Could you speak up just a little bit? Uh, just mention the previous debate. Uh, 
we didn't say that uh, robotic uh, robotics maps are uh, uh, a useful basic tool to have and you should build on top of that instead of completely rejecting it because it does do something useful which you know maybe takes hundreds of millions of steps to learn and simulate so why do we throw it away why don't we just build on top of it instead of you know, just rejecting it I think that's a true question. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have a rebellious streak to me, and I like saying, burn it all down and let's start from the scratch. Uh, but more scientifically, I think we have lessons to be learned from our colleagues in NLP and even to the computer vision. Uh, there was an understanding that you know parsing is a useful primitive. We should just have that as a first step before we do any higher order semantic understanding of language. There was an understanding that finding edges and contours is a useful primitive and we should just do that. And it turned out those assumptions were wrong. Uh, that just, you know, rebuilding that pipeline from scratch ended up working well. I'm not saying that we know for a fact that that's going to happen here, but it is what you can only create a new infrastructure or a new approach when you start from scratch and see where it leads you. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. I have to run. I have some commencement stuff with PhD students. So uh, sorry about that. Thank you for the invitation. Does anyone else want to comment on this question before we take another? Yeah, I So just like syntax, you know, mapping does exist uh, in biological systems. Um, and it, I'll, I'll make a reference to an argument of convergent evolution. So it turns out flight has evolved four times in four completely different lines of organisms, birds, mammals, bats, uh, you know, dinosaurs, pterodactyls, and, and insects. And their common ancestor did not fly. And when that happens, it sort of gives you insight into the evolutionary niche of that, of that system. And it gives you an insight into the laws of physics that it must be optimizing. I think similarly, there are laws of intelligence. Uh, and if we start from rerunning evolution in simulation, and we see that mapping emerges, syntax emerges in different systems, I think that gives us an insight into what must an intelligent system possess in order to do something interesting? And that's an interesting scientific question. I think when you want to make convert this into an engineering enterprise, you want to ship certain products, no, then it you know you take whatever you understand about that problem and engineer the heck out of it. And then you know, in Paris, does it work? Whatever works goes. So then it ties back to the pre-training discussion. Does this mean that at a certain point I just have a vector that has rediscovered the concept of mapping and I should be able to port that around? Yeah, uh, a vector, uh, a, a, a neural module, uh, a, a distributed mush of neurons within a larger module. Like, you know, there we, we look at, like, my understanding of neuroscience is that we have a certain degree of neuroplasticity. Parts of your brain get damaged and other parts get you do have the ability to reuse them for, for an existing piece of competition that wasn't happening. Maybe that's that's the answer. Maybe that's that's the emergent process that I'm talking about. 
I mean, I mean, I would say that the neuroscience evidence should always be taken with a pinch of salt or maybe a gallon of salt. So, I, I mean, like you said, syntax, we know syntax is true. Well, let's question that. I mean, all these, the, the studies which we have, okay, so there are studies based on deficits, there are studies based on fMRI, there are studies based on psycholinguistics. These essentially correspond to certain experimental findings, which in themselves are correct. But the assertion that there is a syntax box, okay, that is a theoretical uh, construct, okay, and that is a theoretical construct which may one day go the way of uh, Ptolemaic epicycles, okay. Yes, Chomsky liked it and he pushed it on zillions of people and the, uh, the linguistics community is, uh, has given it due credence. But I'm prepared to say that as we understand it better, the notion of syntax will move away quite a bit from the Chomsky inversion a la 1960. I think uh, the word map again is a suitcase word. I personally am totally fine with maps and I believe that there'll be some version of that. But exactly what is it? So there is a version of, uh, you know, like cognitive maps a la Tolman in 1948. There is SLAM. Okay, there is the maps studied by Barbara Tversky. There is the maps found in, in ants. These are not all exactly the same. Okay. And I, I think uh, we, can, if we can use the English term, but use it in a flexible way. So I, in that sense, I'm pro mapping. But I want to be... I don't, I can be pro mapping without a commitment to, to the, the whole package that like, that, that uh, you know, it's a precise geometrical structure. It doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, you know, like I want semantics in there. I want to know, I mean, clearly, I, I mean, at least my speculation is that when humans represent a, a space, they represent like the, the, the correlated nature of certain objects being present in certain places, like kitchens have knives and cutting boards and such and, and so on. So it's a, it's, that should also be part of the map. Now in the classic notion that semantics isn't there, it's about geometry and it's about triangles and, okay. Well, traditional computer graphics is about geometry and triangles and we have neural uh, radiant nerve, yeah. you know? That are replacing it. Well, could we have a neural mapping field that spits out the uh, the you know the graphic that you want when you want to display it? But it actually has five hundred other channels of semantics in there that are much more useful for other tasks. So I, I think this is unless anyone else wanted to weigh in, I wanted to switch gears off of this wonderful mapping discussion to talk about scaling and sample efficiency. And if we're cool with that, uh, we've had several uh, talks uh, today talking about much, much larger data sets. Uh, we have um, Jitendra and Dhruv talking about you know billions of samples creating very reliable systems. I've built a system internal to Google that's very similar to what, what Dhruv is doing. It's like, yeah, that works. Um, but I also know an uh, imitation learning researcher on our team did a much smaller model with tens to hundreds of thousands of frames for certain tasks that was highly effective. And I just saw a stack of NPCs for one of the same tasks do it in on the order of not tens of thousands, but just thousands of frames. And there were a few talks that we saw today on some of the challenges and otherwise with had built various algorithmic approaches as opposed to giant end to end deep learning maps. So, what are the roles of these algorithmic priors, um, whether it's very, very strong in the terms of algorithms or it's in terms of these structured ones on being able to kind of obviate the need for you know, these enormous data sets and models? If, if any. <laughs> Okay. I'll repeat the line from Jitendra's talk. Uh, when you're faced with a hard problem, you do not seek to make it harder or you do not seek to solve an intermediate problem. I think uh, concerns of efficiency, concerns of safety, concerns of uh, operating around humans, these are just not the right concerns as a first step. As a first step, just getting something interesting to happen, getting intelligent behavior to emerge. And one of the 
one of the things that I talked about in my talk was something that is known as the Roger Pariser phenomena, right? Like you first break past the four minute mile and then it becomes obvious to everybody, oh, that's doable. And now there's a whole bunch of other problems that gets ex get exposed. Once you can do something extremely inefficiently, very quickly, people figure out where the inefficiencies are and then you can do the same thing efficiently. You can you know, bring down sample complexity but putting from the get go concerns about sample efficiency, I think are misguided. We don't, we shouldn't care. We should care about where performance lands as long as it's the, the only quantity that we have in real is, is bulk block time because we just have our lives and then it's done. Uh, so that's the quantity. Samples are not a real quantity. If, it, if you can generate those samples in simulation, then so be it. Uh, if it takes billions, trillions, so be it. Anyone? I, I, I'm always ready to point, but I'll shut up until someone else speaks. <laughs> I mean, I was just going to say, yeah, he, he mentioned at the end um, that you have the limit of your of your lifetime i think it just comes down to like not all of this not all of what you're learning is represented in the data uh in the same way so you could learn a whole lot from from just text around natural language and around semantic representations from natural language and you might not have a physical robot executing the actions that are being expressed in that text so i think Part of what I believe is that it, when you use, when you leverage this other source of data that are not necessarily robot data, very large scale, you're just augmenting your, you're just augmenting your data set up along many different axes. Like, and you just, and you should leverage that because you have intelligence there. Even if it's not a robot executing those actions, you have intelligence that you can leverage there. Um, same, you could imagine learning a whole lot from YouTube videos that are being executed by humans. It's just a different embodiment, but you should be able to learn a whole lot from those YouTube videos. So um, that's my thinking. I don't, I'm not thinking about how to create intermediate representations to solve a problem. I'm just thinking, how can I expand my data set so that I'm not constrained physically to, um, to a specific uh, embodiment that is capturing the all of the intelligence that I'm trying to learn, if that makes sense. Okay. See, simple systems have simple laws, right? F equals MA works if you're talking about particles moving in vacuum. Complex systems don't have simple laws. How do we track? How do we analyze them? How do we make them tractable? We have a dilemma. So there are two ways out. One is approximation and the second is simulation. So when you consider, say, a 19th century physicist like Lord Raleigh or Chandrasekhar in the mid 1950s, when they had complex physical systems like stars and things like this, they were very clever about trying to make approximations because these differential equations, you had to try to figure out what to throw out. And in a certain regime, you could create an analytic solution. So that's what the physicists, clever physicists of 1900 and 1950 did. Okay, the clever engineers, they modeled them as linear systems, so you could apply control theory. Okay, and so on. Now, okay, that or the clever statisticians, they would model things as Gaussians and then they do some large end going to infinity results. All this is what we had to do in the era before computers. What do computers give us the ability to? We can take those simple laws and simulate complex systems with those simple laws. Now you don't have to make approximations. The expense you have to pay is billions of simulation rounds. And this applies to understanding a complex physical system. If you're building a hydrogen bomb, you're not going to write simple three line differential equations. You've got to simulate the hell out of it. Okay, if you're going to build a walking robot, you're going to simulate the hell out of it. You're not going to write down uh, differential equations which work at the at a control law which works in five lines. It's obvious we have to go. We are we are dealing with complex systems, 
simulation is better than approximation. And the simulation time is something we should always strive to reduce. I think that that's a valid research area in itself. But at the end of the case, uh, at the end of the day, what I care about is does the damn thing work? If the damn thing doesn't work, then if you have a very clever theorem behind it, I don't give a damn. Uh, just to make sure, by algorithmic uh, considerations, I, I would take your question as, do we need to invest on generating more data or building different models? Is, is this... Uh... Well, there's, you, can, you can generate more data to feed into a richer deep learning model, but some of the things that were presented today didn't necessarily fall into that. They're like, well, let's sample this area or build a, a, a semantic mapping algorithm. It's not that there weren't deep learning there, but it's just... There was additional structure. I see. Them. I see. Okay. okay. I see. So, so, so here's what I think, um, which is again the conjecture. Uh, uh, the, the models that we have nowadays, they are not good given. We came up with them. Convolutions are not good given. The Lacun came up with them. Before that, we had MLPs. And imagine us sitting holding the MLP and saying, oh, I'll throw lots of data and things are going to emerge. Nothing will emerge from the MLP. Right. So in the same way, nothing will emerge from MLP. Now more things emerge with CNNs, more things emerge with transformers. Unfortunately, those jumps are very rare because very few people can really innovate on architectures and find the right inductive bias as opposed to imposing their own. Okay, I'm going to build a semantic map here. Do you see what I mean? Which are the obvious geometric? But I do believe that that there's going to be such a jump, and it's going to be an architecture that you would not need to give it gazillion ways of slightly augmented versions. To just go down the corridor and turn left on the painting and go between the piano and the uh, and the sofa or something, uh, but it, it's just that we don't see it now because it doesn't exist yet. Okay. I think efficiency is is important because uh, uh, because for example, for a new task, we cannot really wait like two three weeks to uh, to to learn like something very simple. So I think we we need to work on that, but. But I agree. So we, um, I agree with others that uh, first we need to show that the, the thing works, and then we can work on on the efficiency. For example, back in 2012, that that deep, I think it took about like a minute to do uh, some like image classification, but now it's like it's quite fast. Like it's uh, in a fraction of second we can we can do image classification. I think the same same story here. So yeah, we can. Um, uh, yeah, but first we need to show that uh, that uh, things work, models work, and um, and then we can we can uh, work on on the efficiency. But at the same time, yeah, uh, this is I think this is an important problem that so, uh, we we should not like spend. For example, I know like how to carry a chair to learning like how to carry I don't know a table. I should not spend two weeks to to learn that. So that should be like very that should be done that should be learned very quickly. So. Uh, so, so I think efficiency matters uh, in that respect. So were there any more audience questions? We have got time for one more. Um, I was wondering what's your opinion on the role of simulation and real world data to solve the body that I, I guess one thing that came up is there are a lot of subtleties in the real world that might be very difficult to model simulation. For example, wearing a pair of objects of robots and so on. So where do you, like how far do you think simulation can bring us and where do we need real world data? Um, Jeremy? I couldn't hear the world the question. I, I, question I can is, uh, what's the role of real world world data versus simulated data in embodied data? Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, I think that as long as we have a, a a large centurial gap, I think it is important to be able to do some some online adaptation in the real world. It doesn't mean you have to do the entire training in the real world directly. Um, we should never simulation as much as we can, but I, I, at least everything we've seen is that you you should still do some, be able to do some adaptation in the real world. What, what was the, the nuance in that question besides that? It was something else? It was, it was just you know the role of simulation versus real and oh, yeah. yeah yeah that's what I think. okay I, I think um so yeah I, I think for point goal simulation works really well for social navigation I love real world data 
What about the rest of you guys? So I think the, the pragmatic answer is both, right? Like when, whenever you want to, we have data available that if you want to uh, see progress in, on real robots uh, using the strengths of uh, the two, because the strengths are complementary, uh, real world data is going to be as high fidelity, as close to uh, reality as you can. The simulated data will be typically faster generated. But I think uh, the more sort of philosophical one, I wondered if what we want, if what we care about is a scientific question of what is the nature of embodied intelligence, but it's not clear to me what robots bring to the table or what hardware brings to the table. If what you want to know is, is mapping an emergent phenomena, is it necessary for embodied navigation? Then I don't know what legged robots with draining batteries bring to the table. I can study that in simulation and I can, you know, give answers to that question. There, there's a there's a science fiction writer I like, uh, Ted Chiang, and he has, a, he has a story on the life cycle of uh, virtual objects where he's imagining a future where humans spend time in this virtual reality space where uh, these, these agents just sort of grow up. You, you go and teach them in virtual reality. Uh, and when you leave the space, that simulator just keeps running. And so when you come back, they're smarter because they've just had more time uh, than you. If what we care about is intelligence, it's it's not clear to me why. What's the dissatisfaction? Virtual reality is a reward in itself. Uh, I don't think the physical world is more special. Uh, I think we can we can learn about intelligence in those ways. Oh, sorry. Quick, quick, quick back. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Let's let's let the, the speakers and then we can do this. Okay, maybe, maybe I should say a couple of obvious things. So seeing Jitendra's robot walk in those super diverse situations showed that simulation really, really helped in extremely unpredictable ways, I would say, right? Because the simulation terrain really looks extremely different than the real world. We didn't even try to imitate the real world at that uh, stage for this particular project. And now when I was listening to the 1000 behavior data set, and then we task that people need help with, for example, cleaning after a party, because I know about that. I'm like, how we're going to simulate now the, the cake that is on the sofa and then they need to scrub the bathroom floor again. So, so these are very difficult. But at the same time, I thought by the time we're going to have robots to, to scrub the bathroom, that, that's also is pretty far away. So maybe it's OK, uh, right? Just seeing around, um, you know, understanding the space, understanding objects, being able to communicate and so on can, can happen now or it. I think since we are agreeing too much, I'll try to argue with, uh, through. <laughs> so this is uh, too too classic. We need to fight. I mean, so I try to. <laughs> so I, I I agree that uh, virtual worlds are perfectly fine to study. So I I'll grant that. I mean, I mean, chess is a virtual world, right? And we all enjoy that, right? So it's perfectly fine. But I would argue that there is a privileged position to this physical world we live in. Because after all, this is where real human beings live. I mean, they breathe, they eat, they live, they have sex, they produce children, they entertain themselves, they are born, they die, you know. There is something to be said for this world, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and there. <laughs> Yeah, so what I was thinking now is the video games. Uh, most people, more and more time they spend uh, in video game realities. But but yes, I completely I completely agree that there is a value in both. Yes, I don't have anything but. Yeah, can get everywhere. Yeah, I think I think um, yeah. For, first of all, it's uh, given the current algorithms. I mean, the, the current state of the machine learning, we cannot really train uh, in in reality because it takes, for example, years to, to learn like how to move this object from point A to point B. So it's better, better to do that in simulation. Now, maybe, I don't know, in 10 years, we have some like fast algorithms that, can, uh, that you can train your robots in, in the real world, but at, at the moment, it's, it's not possible. So it's better to, to basically take the advantage of simulation to, to, train, your, to train your models faster. And, and uh, the other issue is that if, if something doesn't work, in simulation, I think there is no hope that it works in reality. So I think it might be better that um, that we solve the problem in simulation first, 
see that uh, um, make sure that like that that's that's a possibility and then we can we can transfer we can transfer to the real world uh, but uh, we need to make sure that uh, we need to make uh, our assumptions are not very different from from reality so that if we make some some assumptions that that does uh, that don't exist in reality then we have to like um, start start from scratch and build like new models for uh, for reality so i think it's better uh, now that we are working in simulation, we should have like some some good assumptions that later we don't have to like destroy all all those models and and recreate like models for for the real world. As, as much as I would love the rebuttal from the audience, I think we're at time. So I was hoping that we could just have one final statement just on the future of embodied AI or where you want to see it to go from each of our panelists. Maybe starting with Carolina, she's remote. Just future of embodied AI in one sentence. You might be muted. Oh, you're talking to me. I was talking to myself, actually. I thought that was a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, th definitely the, the part that, that excites me the most is the interaction piece. So I would say, yeah, any kind of, um, I, I think in order for robots to be useful, they just need to be able to interact with the real world, not just get around it. Um, and I mean, interact with physical things. So there's a lot of work in that direction. Um, and also interact with with other humans that are that are dynamic and that are changing and, and they need to understand what's going on in their environment in order to act accordingly. So that's what I'm most excited about, the interaction piece. Um, I think on the horizon of uh, next, Two to three years, uh, I think I expect the embodied AI community will take the lessons of the NLP and the QDCB communities more seriously. That seems like the scaling hypothesis is true, and we will just build up bigger scale models uh, and probably lead to more interesting emergent behavior. On a longer term horizon, anybody's guess, uh, it's, it's too hard to know. Yeah, I think in, in the in the short term, yeah, the the scale the scale is important. But I think at, at some point we will hit the wall, and then we will start working on like uh, low shot and by the AI learning like from few examples and and so on. Uh, yeah, I also think the future looks uh, great, mostly because uh, the you know the research environment is diverse. I don't think people are working on the same thing. I think people are working both in simulation large scale real world, small scale, and so on. I think there's a lot of diversity. So only good things. I don't think there's something that we should be doing that we're not doing right now. So I, I, I sort of break the, the, let's say, robotics problems into three sort of buckets. One bucket being locomotion and navigation, which I think we are pretty close to solving. There is the next bucket, which is manipulation which I think we should make pretty substantial progress in the next couple of years. I think it will also require advances in like tactile sensing and so on. And then there is the next bucket, which is uh, social, which is humans and machines. And that, that will take some time because humans are complex. Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, on that note, uh, I, I think uh, we have had a, a great uh, workshop. I, I think for uh, the future of embodied AI, I would love to see more events like this where people get together to discuss interesting data sets, challenges, and research, and controversial ideas, uh, or sometimes not controversial, uh, exciting uh, new ideas uh, on getting uh, vision, the real world, and simulation to interact with each other in ways that make things happen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.
No, 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 but that definitely not in celebration. For the for the native system. Yeah. Will you guys be able to join us for the dinner tonight? No, unfortunately I have to skip. Okay. Yeah, I have another commitment. I also go to the women's now and the next <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Cool. Yeah. I just have a yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah, Thank you guys. We really appreciated your all your contributions. It was really it was really fun. Thank you for